Yeah, we are live. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Dinesh Chaudhary, and um, we welcome you all from the 24th Annual Conference of Delhi Neurological Association, DNA Con 2022, along with the 19th Delhi Neuro Nurses Association, DNA, DNNA. Uh, today, we've got a whole day charted out with a lot of exciting sessions coming ahead. Uh, without wasting much of time, I, with warm welcomes, I'd like to invite the welcome addresses from our reputed faculty and organizing secretaries, Dr. P. N. Ranjan, sir, Dr. Sudhir Tyagi, Dr. S. S. Chabra, Dr. Vinit Suri, and Dr. Anshu Rohatki. So I'll uh, hand over the proceedings to Dr. P. N. Ranjan. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. It's a matter of great honor and satisfaction for the Department of Neurosciences in the Prestapolo Hospitals that we are hosting the 21st Annual Conference of the Delhi Neurological Association and the 20th Conference of the Delhi Neuro Association. We are really pleased. I can assure you that the organizing committee, with the help of the executive committee of the Delhi Neurological Association, we have made a tremendous program for you for these two days. It's going to be a great academic feast. And I would personally request all members of the DNA and all those who are registered, please take benefit of this. I will now hand over the mic to Dr. Satnam Singh and Dr. Anshul Rodki. Dr. Satnam Singh is the president of the Delhi, Neuro uh, Delhi Neurological Association, and Anshul is the honorary secretary. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this 4th, 24th annual conference of Delhi Association, 10th annual conference of Delhi Neuro Nurses Association. Uh, in fact, we had planned to have a physical meeting this year, and uh, the organizing committee had made all the arrangements for the same. But at the last moment, with the rise in corona cases in last month, we had to change our program and uh, switch over to uh, this virtual meeting. We the effort of Dr. P. N. Ranjan and his team for making last minute changes all the demands of the executive committee of the uh, session. Uh, the scientific committee has made an excellent program, academic program, and I'm sure we will all go home and rest with the scientific piece of this program. So I request you to attend all the session and interact with the speakers to learn from them and encourage them. Thank you so much. Dr. Anshu, please. Thank you, Dr. Satnam. Uh, good morning and I welcome you all to this edition of uh, an annual meeting of Delhi Neurological Association and Delhi Neuro Nurses uh, Association. And we are going to have an academic feast today. And uh, first of all, it's a very auspicious day today being Basant Pachmi. No better day to have an academic feast than uh, 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 So I think uh, it's, a, it's an excellent program. And uh, we all will really enjoy and we would really appreciate it. Everybody would join and interact with each other. And uh, unfortunately, in this COVID times, we are not having a physical meet, but a virtual meet. But this will give us ample time and adequate time to interact with our colleagues and have an a good experience over the next two days. Uh, and uh, so I invite you all to join us today. And uh, with that message, I would request Dr. Ranjan and his team to take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Satnam. Thank you, Ranjan, for the good words. And uh, I am sure that we are going to have a great feast. Now, I hand over the mic to Dr. Dinesh, who is the coordinator for the session.
thank you all so um, our first session is a common session we'll be doing it in hall a and it's a free uh, free paper presentation for this session um, i would like to request the chairpersons and uh, i'll request dr r m dhamija sir dr sudhir tyagi sir uh, dr k k jindal could in join us today and uh, since um, he is not there i'll request dr anshu rodki sir to uh, help us chair this session and um, i'll start with the pro proceedings i'll request dr r m dhamija sir to please unmute himself and uh, to start the session sir and uh, now that we also good have morning. yes <clears throat> good morning i am dr dhamija can you hear me Yes, sir. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. I welcome you all to the morning session. We are the opening batsmen for this session, and the program has been charted in a very, very beautiful way. And I'm sure that everybody is going to enjoy it. And as requested by the, you know. organizing committee that we should all attend maximum as far as possible and we have still you know time for the session that is our session starts at 8 o'clock i don't know should we start dr anshu i uh, think sir we can we can wait for some time uh, yes we we uh, got like uh, around yeah. Eight four minutes. five minutes. And yeah, uh, I think let's be on time. Let's start on time and finish on time. Yes, yes. Neither yes. before I, nor later. I, I totally agree with Dr. Sattam, and I. It was a very nicely done. Good sir. Happy to see you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. And. Uh, uh now that we have enough time at hand i'll i'll request the technical team to pick, uh, please put up the uh, introduction slides for our repeated uh, chairpersons and i'll uh, introduce uh, each yes yes okay. i'll switch yes. off for a minute and then log in again okay thank you so uh i'll request uh, dr r m dhamija sir we all know uh, he is the emeritus consultant neurologist at the bimhans um, maharaj agas in hospital new delhi and he has been the uh, cornerstone for the neurological developments in dna he has been uh, associated with lot of orations he has lot of publications he has been the uh, he has delivered presidential orations in the past and um, he has uh, orations at epicon dna con then uh, imsa con and we all know what a reputed figure he is so we are really delighted uh, samija sir to have you with us uh, for this session so uh, can i have the next slide yes uh, unfortunately uh, dr jindal couldn't join us so the next slide please Uh, Yogesh or Shobit, if someone can put up the next slide. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Sudhir Tagi will be joining us soon, um, and we all know he is uh, one of the um, leading neurosurgeon at the Nirpal Sapolo Hospital, and he has area of expertise in the stereotactic neurosurgery and the spine surgeries. He has got multiple international and national publications, so I welcome him. He'll be joining soon. next slide okay oh uh, that's it sir uh, there is a speaker okay so um because we still have around 5 minutes to go we'll wait for the next speaker to log in meanwhile uh, dr sham sundar i can see you have already logged in maybe you can just check in uh, if your audio and the video is all fine Uh, good morning everybody i think you can hear me yeah we yes, can yes. good so uh, we'll be starting in another 4 5 minutes 
because we should stick to the time. And um, I'll request uh, the chairpersons and uh, the speakers, whoever uh, are listening in all across all the halls, because uh, it's been virtually coordinated, we will have to stick to the timelines. And uh, for the first session, we have got the three paper presentations in which the uh, time to deliver the talk is eight minutes. And the discussion would be for two minutes at the end of it. And um, in that, we had around six, three papers earlier. But due to some health issues, Dr. Josna couldn't join us. So instead of six, we'll be having uh, only five three paper presentations. So even if there's a delay of two or three minutes, that uh, we will be able to get through that. And um, we have also uh, Dr. Satnam Chabra sir with us. So I'll also request uh, Chabra sir to uh, please share this session for us. Sir. <clears throat> So the time is almost the start time, 8 a.m. for the next session. Now, um, we have uh, the speaker and the chairpersons with us. I'll request uh, Dhamija sir to please uh, uh, carry forward the program. And we'll start with our first lecture for which Dr. Shams on this uh, introductory slide would be projected on the screen, sir. Uh, welcome to the meeting. I. I'm very glad that we have the people around with us. And now the, the first session is practically a neurosurgical and I'm very glad that Dr. Chavada has joined me because, and Dr. Sudhir Syagi, I have not able to see yet. We have now five papers because one paper has been dropped by Dr. Josna. And practically we have one hour and I request all the speakers to restrict to the time so that we can maintain and give the hall back to the you know, organizer in time. So we have about 10 minutes each plus one, two minute discussion. And we start the session with the first speaker, Dr. Sham Sundar. He is speaking on a retrospective analysis of conus and Phylum terminal ependymoma operated over last five years period. Very nice topic and a very good study it appears. <clears throat> and let us hear and welcome Dr. Sham Sundar. Dr. Sham Sundar, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. P. N. Ranjan and Dr. Sudhir Tyagi for letting me present my paper. Uh, I would be talking about 
conus and phylum terminal ependymomas. If you can see my slides, sir. You'll have to share sure. your screen. Dr. Sham, you'll have to uh, share screen using the share screen button. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You'll have to also put it in a slideshow mode. That way it's better visible. Yeah. So Good. spinal cord ependymomas. They account for the roughly three to six percent of all central nervous tumors, and they are the most common intramedullary spinal neoplasm that account for roughly about sixty percent of glial spinal cord tumors. Now, these lesions tend to manifest in a young adults, usually around forty years of age, and more common in females. More common in males. Sorry. They most commonly occur in the cervical region and may extend up to thoracic region. And the uh, incidence of, of, of these tumors in the conus region is roughly 6.5%. And the most common variety is the mixopapillary ependymomas. Now we had 28 patients of which 16 were males and 12 were females. And most commonly they presented with lower limb radiculopathy foot weakness, difficulty in walking, and only five patients presented with neurological symptoms. One patient presented with extensive tumor bleed and extensive cord edema. McCormick grading was done in all these patients and most of the patients were either in grade three and grade four. Now, the basic surgery involves identification of phylum because most of these tumors are encapsulated tumors. Now the phylum is usually identified by a squiggly vessel on the surface of the phylum. <clears throat> and if the color of the phylum is different from the nerve roots, you can also identify ligamentous strands that are going through these uh, phylum. And sometimes we use intraoperative electrical stimulation if we are not sure which is the phylum. And usually recording is done from the anal sphincter. Now, if you look at the <clears throat> uh, microscopic anatomy of these tumors, they arise from the phylum and normally you will have a cyst on the surface, on the superior surface of the tumor. And sometimes lipomas are also associated below the tumors. Now, most of these tumors, as we will know, are well circumscribed tumors and uh, encapsulated this, so they can be removed in total. Considering the blood supply in this region, you can see as described in this paper, there is an arterial basket in the region of the conus medullaris, which is nothing but connection between the anterior and the posterior spinal artery. And normally multiple perforating arteries arise from these arterial basket and supply the conus. Now, intraoperative recording is very useful and we use them when we are trying to dissect the tumor of the conus, because and usually the recordings are done from the anal sphincter. Usually the recordings, what we get, if you stimulate in a low current, normally we don't get any um, uh, contractions from the anal sphincter. But sometimes bilateral contractions are visible from the L5-S1 region, usually the gluteus, from the, uh, from the phylum. Now, this is our first case, which is an encapsulated tumor pushing the conus. Now, this tumor tends to push the conus. There is a, you can identify a form of hemosiderin ring on the top, and they are usually intense contrast enhancing tumors. Now, if you see this video, you can see that the phylum, the color of the phylum is different from the nerve roots. 
and usually after separating the roots the tumor seems to be well circumscribed encapsulated and normally we don't need to go into the tumor to remove it you can just remove it from the sites after dissecting the nerve roots this is the first time of tumors we encounter this is the post op picture of the same patient where the tumor is removed completely uh, completely the histopathology was grade 1 mixopapillary ependymoma the next type of tumor is the tumor which involve the conus and extend into the conus normally sometimes the, these tumors present with bleeds as you can see there is a cyst on the top and there is extensive edema and bleed that has occurred going up to the dorsal region of the tumor now this patient presented with paraplegia and bladder bowel involvement now in such cases you need to dissect the tumor go to the lower pole and try to identify the distal phylum here the um, neurophysiological monitoring is very important if you can appreciate we have identified the distal column distal phylum and cutting it and then dissecting the tumor of the nerve roots there is extensive bleed into the thickal sac careful separation from the roots and lifting the tumor off normally the dissection starts from the lower pole now the challenge is to identify the upper level of the tumor if you want to remove it completely now normally arachnoid is our friend here and if you can see the arachnoid comes and you cannot dissect the arachnoid after a certain level and probably this is the level where the tumor is rest all is the conus so after identifying that the tumor is cut and removed and this portion is not the tumor but is the conus so we have to be very careful not to cut that the hemostasis is achieved and the dural closure is done the glue is applied this is the post op mri of this patient as you can see the conus is well preserved and the tumor is removed completely this patient recovered in 3 months time the third type of tumor is also encapsulated but is away from the conus it is just attached to the phylum terminal and these tumors are easy to remove as you can see this is the post op mri of this patient in which the tumor is removed completely so the basic task is to identify the tumor and to dissect it off from the lower pole this is again the fourth patient the fifth type of patients are unencapsulated tumors now these are slightly aggressive tumors which are grade 2 tumors now in this case it is extending from the d12 to the l5 the whole of the thickal sac is filled with tumor now it is difficult to dissect and you can damage the nerve roots as you can see the roots are there inside the tumor here only decompression is done and a expansive neuroplasty is done post op radiation if it is grade 2 you can wait and watch for some time and probably advise radiation also in these patients so the results were that the gross total resection was achieved in 25 patient and sub total resection in 3 patients the long term outcome depends upon the total amount of resection that you have achieved and the presence of tumor capsule radiotherapy in such cases are controversial and maybe if it is an incomplete resection you can advise them thank you thank you sir for your patient care
Thank you so much for uh, finishing in time. Any any question from the audience? No, sir. Yes, Dr. Shams, no. it's a very large experience. How many cases recurred in your experience? There is just a five-year uh, study period. Till now, nothing has recurred. We haven't removed in five patients, but recurrence we haven't seen. Uh, I have followed this patient for three years now, and uh, we haven't seen any recurrence. But what we have not totally removed, we have advised them radiation also. And probably they have taken radiation and it has not increased in size. So these tumors tend to be docile and if you have removed them completely, probably you can avoid recurrence. But recurrence is still known after complete resection also. Good. And roughly 10% in literature tends to recur even after complete resection. Thank you, thank you. Very good experience, thank you so much. Very nice, you, very sir. nice. So, uh, maybe invite uh, Dr. The next speaker, Dr. Uzma Begum. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Uzma Begum. I will be presenting on efficacy of internasal dexmatomidine as an adjuvant during transnasal transphenoidal pituitary tumor resection surgeries, a prospective randomized double blinded placebo-controlled study. Transnasal transphenoidal approach is preferred approach for resection of majority of pituitary tumors. It is minimally invasive, but does create specific challenges for the neurosurgeons as well as neuroanesthetists. It is, uh, firstly, uh, the nasal passages are very narrow and their mucosa is highly vascularized. And even a small amount of bleeding can impair the operating field conditions. Hence, uh, topical administration of adrenaline with lignocaine is necessary to decongest the nasal mucosa, which uh, uh, increases the operating space of nasal corridor and creates an oligomic surgical field. However, systemic absorption of the locally administered adrenaline can cause significant hypertension, dysrhythmia, and even myocardial infarction, especially in patients with Cushing's disease or acromegaly, who have an increased sensitivity to catecholamines. It is because of these risks, adrenaline is usually not administered during TNTs in patients with coronary artery disease or patients with severe hypertension. So operating condition in these patients often tend to be suboptimal. Secondly, the technique per se intensely stimulating and is uh, associated with a risk of severe cardiovascular responses. Since mucosa of nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses and nasopharynx is innervated by sympathetic fibers, Hence, insertion of nasal spaculum and uh, mucosal stimulation during nasal and sphenoid phase evoke a very strong sympathetic response with a, uh, with a rise in heart rate and BP. The increase in surgical site bleeding due to these hypertensive responses compromises the operating conditions and often necessitates prompt administration of anti anesthetics or antihypertensive agents to attenuate these potent hemodynamic responses. Dexmatrimidine may be a useful adjunct in these situations. It is a highly selective alpha-2 adenoreceptor agonist, which reduces the central release of norepinephrine to produce a do dose-dependent sedation, hypnosis, and analgesia, along with modest reduction in BP and heart rate. When administered internasally, dexmid is rapidly absorbed through nasal mucosa and under undergoes direct systemic absorption. Internasally administered dexmid is purported to cause local and peripheral vasoconstriction, possibly by activation of the uh, postsynaptic alpha-2 adenoreceptor on vascular smooth muscle cells. This may uh, provide a beneficial uh, mucosal, uh, nasal mucosal decongestion effect, which may uh, help to increase the working space for the neurosurgeons and also reduce surgical site bleeding during these surgeries. Internasal uh, dexmid has uh, shown good results as an adjunct during endoscopic nasal sinus surgeries. However, to our knowledge, uh, there are no clinical studies which have objectively evaluated its adjunctive efficacy during microscopic TNTS procedures. Hence, in this prospective randomized placebo-controlled study, we sought to determine if uh, an adjuvant internasally administered dexmid could provide twin that is local and systemic benefits during microscopic TNTS surgeries. Our primary objective was to evaluate the local adjuvant effect of internasal dexmid on surgical field conditions 
our secondary objectives were to assess the systemic adjuvant effect of internasal dexamethasone on hypertensive surge episodes, esmolol requirement for management of hypertensive surges, propofol requirement, and post-operative re recovery characteristics. Study was approved by Institutional Ethics Committee. Our sample size was 20. All ESA physical status were in two patients between 18 to 65 years of age were included. These patients were excluded from our study. Anesthetic technique included propofol infusion, which was stated to by spectral index value of 40 to 60, along with fentanyl, atracurium, and controlled mechanical ventilation. Patients were positioned supine with 15 to 30 degree head up and a head tilt towards the surgeon's side. Standard criteria and technique were used for reversal, tracheal extubation, and post-operative management. Now, the study intervention. First is the nasal pack placement. Patients participating in this study were randomly divided in two groups of 10 each on the basis of computer-generated random table. Each patient received two nasal packs after induction of NSCC and patient positioning. <clears throat> in dexmetomidin group, patients received dexmetosoaked nasal pack with dose of 2 max per kg diluted in normal saline. In control group, patient received a normal saline soaked nasal pack in similar manner. After 15 minutes, the pack was removed and the standard lignocaine EDR nasal pack was placed for 15 minutes. Second intervention, uh, the hypertensive surge management. Hypertens hypertensive surge was defined as a sudden and no, uh, more than 20% rise in BP and heart rate from the baseline values. Hypertensive responses were managed with injection esmolol in boluses after ensuring adequate depth of anesthesia and muscle relaxation. Now coming to observations and data collection. First is surgical field condition. It was assessed first by morphometric analysis and second by surgical field quality. Morphometric analysis includes two parameters, middle turbinate thickness and minimal negotiable window. That is widest width of nasal cavity between middle aspect of middle turbinate and nasal septum. Surgical field quality was assessed by former's criteria by surgeons at the end of the surgery. Lower scores show good surgical field quality and higher scores show worse surgical field quality. These are the pictures taken at the time of study. Figure 1 showing different sizes of pituitary curates, tip sizes from 1 to 7 millimeters. Figure 2 showing a uh, vernier caliper measuring the outer tip of uh, pituitary curate. Figure 3 is uh, the endoscopic view of nasal cavity showing middle turbinate and space. This is the middle turbinate and space between middle turbinate and nasal septum. These are the other parameters which are collected. Statistical analysis was done by SPSS software version 21.0. P-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Results, both groups were comparable for demographic characteristic and tumor morphology. Effect of internasal dexmid on the middle turbinate thickness. After nasal pack one, and two, it was observed that reduction in the middle turbine thickness was uh, more in group D as compared to group C, and p-value was found significant. As we can see in this uh, graph given below, uh, the, there is decrease in middle turbine thickness after nasal pack one and after nasal pack two. Effect of internasal dexmid on the mi uh, minimal negotiable window, a similar response was seen. The minimal negotiable window increased in group D as compared to group C, and the p-value was found statistically significant. We uh, were shown in figures uh, given below after nasal pack one and after nasal pack two. As we can see in this graph, the effect of internasal dexmid in the surgical field quality, which was measured by uh, from a scale score, were found to be better in uh, group D as compared to group C. However, the difference was not uh, statistically significant. Uh, this uh, graph showing the uh, proportion of patients with the hypertensive surges uh, was lower in group D as compared to group C, and the di uh, difference was found statistically significant. Also, the requirement of esmolol to suppress the hypertensive surge uh, was lower in group D as compared to group C, and the difference was found statistically significant. No significant difference was found between both groups for interoperative profile requirement and post-operative recovery characteristics. Now discussion, in this prospective randomized double blind placebo control study, we evaluated local and systemic adjuvant defect of internasal dexmid in patients undergoing microscopy TNDS procedures. 
This is the first study to evaluate the local and systemic adjuvant effect of intranasal taximate during macroscopy TNT surgeries. Also, this is the first study to use morphometric criteria to objectively assess the decongestant effect of a drug. Adjunctive use of intranasal DEX provides multiple benefits during macroscopy TNT surgery. Locally, it enhances the nasal mucosal decongestant effect of ADR plus lignocaine. Uh, Systemically, it helps to blunt the anoxious pressure responses and reduces the requirement of resmolol to blunt pressure responses and provides a more stable interoperative hemodynamics. Internasal dexmet can be considered in situations where area is contraindicated, in patient, especially in patients with coronary artery disease or severe hypertension. Now I can conclude by saying that adjunctive internasal dexmetomidin significantly improves the surgical field visibility and also reduces the rescue antihypertensive drug requirement in patients undergoing macroscopic TNS procedure for pituitary tumor resection. Thank you. Thank you, doctor for your nice presentation. Any questions? Uh, well, I have one small question. So what is your conclusion? Is it better than adrenaline or uh, you have not compared with adrenaline? Uh, no, sir. Uh, it is not better than adrenaline, but uh, uh, definitely it is alternative to uh, this standard alignocaine uh, for the vasoconstriction and providing a hemodynamic uh, stability. It is not as good an alpha agonist no. as adrenaline is. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we can go to the next speaker, Dr. Gavija, please invite. Uh, no, I request the next speaker, Dr. Sham, to speak on the subject. Is he there? Organizers? Yes. Yeah. The uh, next speaker is there. Yes, sir. Can I can I request Dr. Sham Bodhiliwala from GB Panth Hospital, New Delhi? If he is around, can he just confirm us? Yes, sir. The Dr. Sham is here. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Please Good morning. start Good. your subject. Yes, sir. Interoperative nuisance in combined pterygoid and metal fossa approach. Sir, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. We, can. we can see your screen. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to speak about nuances in the combined pre sigmoid and subtemporal approach. So this pre-sigmoid transpitrous, posterior transpitrous approach is offers below third cranial now and also the tumors that are situated anterolateral to the upper brain stem. So this is the indication of the pre-sigmoid approach that we do. Tumors situated anterolateral to the upper brain stem extending to the middle fossa, mainly trigeminal schwannoma, Petroclival meningioma, CP angle epidermoid, CP angle schwannoma, and brainstem masses. These are a few examples. So, we generally operate pre sigmoid approach in two positions, supine and lateral. If we are combining pre sigmoid approach with the temp subtemporal approach or middle fossa approach, then we generally prefer supine position. And if we are combining it with the retro sigmoid, approach, then we prefer lateral position. So this is the incision, standard retromastoid incision that curves around over two centimeters above the pinna <clears throat> and then down up to the upper margin of zygoma. So uh, this approach is mainly in four steps. First is mastoidectomy. Second is craniotomy and uh, subtemporal craniotomy and drilling of the residual bone. And then cutting of the sinusoidal angle and then standard approach to tumor. So this is the illustration view the photo after bony work. So we can see here this is a sigmoid sinus here and this part mastoidectomy has been done and we can see here straight forward here this is the sigmoid sinus. And this is temporal region. Mustardectomy was done here. And this is pre-sigmoid space. 
this is sinodural angle so i'm going to show one video of how we cut sinodural angle so first we take incision here in subtemporal region and then we take incision here in a pre sigmoid region you can't see your video okay can we see now no no uh, i think you put it on uh, yeah okay. uh no issues slide show first we first we open dura over here in a temporal region then right. we open dura in a pre sigmoid region and then we coagulate the sinodural angle and then cut it sharply so this middle fossa this combines the middle fossa and pre sigmoid is the posterior fossa and when you cut the sinodural angle this both the fossa combines so this is few cases one case is 20 years old male with right trigeminal schwannoma we first uh, operated through retromastoid standard retromastoid uh, approach but uh, in a post op scan there was a significant residual tumor this is post op scan with significant residual tumor so we took a retromastoid pre pre sigmoid approach combining with the subtemporal approach and we were able to remove the whole tumor this is another case too 8 years old girl with a brain stem mass which was uh, lying anterior lateral and anterior to the brain stem we did the same approach and we remove remove the most of the tumor just leaving the small tumor near the brain stem so in our experience we have operated total 7 cases there was no mortality but one case initially was procedure was abandoned due to insignificant pre sigmoid working corridor we didn't find a significant space to work and uh, one case have a significant complication that was csf otoria and that otoria we tried to prevent it with csf diversion procedures like lumbar drain shunt procedures we did duroplasty twice and finally we made caldi sec into the external ear and then it stopped so difficulty in this approach is to it's a very very narrow corridor to operate and you need to have knowledge about the mastoidectomy initially we also operated this with the uh, in a with the ent team but now we are able to do it mastoidectomy on our own so mainly complications are all complications of mastoidectomy like injury to semicircular canals and facial canal and the csf flick because very small corridor to operate so it is not easy to close the dura tightly so on a discussion part there are mainly disadvantages of the retro sigmoid approach that becomes advantages of the pre sigmoid approach uh pre sigmoid approach in retro sigmoid approach it's a difficult to access a uh, tumor directly sometimes which are the tumors which are lying anterior lateral and uh, anterior to the brain stem you will get the neurovascular bundle intervening in between and uh, sometimes the dural at tumors attachment is on the dura petrous dura so at that time the vascularity may be comes from the uh, petrous dura in particularly in the petroclaval meningioma so in such kind of tumor pre sigmoid approach directly approaches towards the dura and the tumor where in a retro sigmoid approach we have to first encounter the neurovascular bundle and we decompress the tumor uh, meanwhile the vascularity is, is not compromised of the tumor and bleeding occurs so these all disadvantages of the retro mastoid it becomes advantages of pre sigmoid that you access directly to the petroclaval region decompression of the tumor occurs before any the if you encounter any cranial nerves and using the pre sigmoid approach we directly resect the dura attachment first so the tumor vascularity compromises and uh, bleeding chances of bleeding decreases and it also gives the advantage of direct visualization of the tumor brain stem interface so in conclusion uh, uh, pre sigmoid approach is uh, sometimes a better approach where the tumor lies enter or lateral to the upper brain stem or anterior to brain stem or going opposite side of the brain stem but the problem with the uh, pre sigmoid approach you should be thorough with the trotman triangle anatomy 
and dura should be closed tightly using glue or uh, artificial dural patch to prevent the csf leak thank you very much thank you dr sham nice presentation my question is that is simple mastectomy enough to have enough access because in pre surgery normally you have to remove a lot of vitreous bone to really have a good access so uh, what uh, uh, we have we remove generally i'll show picture again if possible we generally remove the mastoid bone uh, standard mastoidectomy and after that this is the part that we remove the mastoid standard mastoidectomy right and here we have removed drilled more bone over the sinus and this is yeah. uh, a temporal mastoidectomy the standard mastoidectomy is this much only Hmm. Ah, no. Oh, that's okay. Beyond mustard, actually. Yeah, may I come? Okay. Pardon. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Anita, you were saying something. We can't hear you. You are you are muted, Doctor Anita. You are muted. Okay. Now it's it's audible. Yeah, yeah, you are audible so, now. Yeah. Actually, this approach is mainly uh, used when you are going to cut the pre uh, SPC, so petrosal sinus. Yeah, and of course. Cutting, uh, cutting of petrosal sinus is required when the tumor is in the both the compartment, medial and posterior fossa. Right. right. So, in that case, you have to combine it with the, either the subtemporal approach or the uh, retrosigmoid approach. The pre-sigmoid approach is combined with that. Right, right. That condition you have to do this. And that is okay, but normally this is more like transpetrosal approach. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but then you have to. Exactly. You don't have to. Don't you have to remove a lot of more bone even? You have to go. It is. It is. Com combination is required, and whole lot of bone removal is required when it is multi compartment tumor. Otherwise, you can get away by doing just the pre sigmoid. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of the meningiomas to the brain parenchyma based on the size of the lesion and accordingly the outcome of the such patients. As we so, all Ajit, please put it on a slightly low mode that will make it more uh, visible for us. Okay, is it now right? Okay. Management has evolved, as we are quite aware, over a few decades. This has become basically possible with increase, ever increasing knowledge of meningiomas, their biological behavior, availability of radiological tools, and newer techniques and experience. The current study, I'll be restricting myself to the adhesiveness of these lesions and the relation of the size of the tumors, how they accordingly behave during the surgery, which can um, enable us to decide beforehand how to excise the tumor, how to approach the tumor, and eventually give us a better outcome. This study involves 68 consecutive patients of intracranial meningiomas, which we operated over the last five years, including one year of follow-up. The, all the patients which eventually turned out to be histologically diagnosed with meningiomas were included in the study, and the ones which were lost to follow-up and turned out to be a different lesion were excluded. We used standard Pearson chi-square test for statistical analysis with a pre-value of 0 0.05 less than 0 0.05 taken significant and less than 0 0.01 taken statistically highly significant. The approach was dependent, conventional approaches were taken for all the surgeries depending upon the location. The location was also part of the study, which I'm not discussing this time. Uh, doctor, sorry to interrupt. Your presentation is uh, not in slideshow mode. Requesting you put the slides in slideshow mode. I am, I am, your, your slides are not visible, Dr. Vazif. Right, share. I've already shared. Here I'm able to see. You can see, but they are not in slideshow, yeah. No. Is it now in slideshow? We can see, but they are not moving. Are you moving the slides or not? They are moving on in my laptop. No, no, you have to you have to put it on the slideshow mode, not on the uh, this mode, and then it will work better. Yeah, I already put him, them on slideshow mode on. Hmm. Uh, so so if it's not working, uh, you can just uh, uh, click on the uh, slide so that it will be projected. Just click on the slides, uh, doctor. Now it is in slide number one. If you want to go to slide number two, just click on slide number two. Yes, like that. Yeah. Okay. I'll move it like this. Yeah, now we can do. Okay. Yeah, you continue, please, like this only. Yeah. Uh, and move it with you. Okay. Good. Uh, now it's moving like this? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we can see. Oh, it's okay. The evaluation of these patients was done basically on Karnofsky scale. We did a pre-operative assessment as well as post-operative at six months and at one year. The results were analyzed, basically evaluating how the radiological features aided in our uh, eventual outcome of the patient based, based on the features we could find on MR. And accordingly, how pre-operative seeing the MR, we could approach the tumor. And was it corroborating with the findings of the MRI, the ease of access was it corroborating with that? On the basis of this adhesiveness, we divided the tumor into four categories. The ones which are without any adhesion, there was complete uh, arachnoid pain available and could be removed in total. There were nine patients out of 68. Others were with, with adherent to the arachnoid, but stripped, still it can be stripped, could be stripped off easily. There were 21 such patients. The others were strongly adherent to the arachnoid at some beaches at some places. I can take you to the next slide here. The, in the, it did not depend on our location, basically. It depended on the so, size of the tumors. The smaller tumors, we could move easily at any other location, even at the planum level. The more adherent lesions anywhere could be removed with slight difficulty, but in complete total without any breach. The ones with more stronger attachment like this, the olfactory glue lesions, we found that the larger tumors, the, there was a breach in the arachnoid and the brain surface got exposed in such areas. Though we were able to remove the tumors, the other tumors, the mainly the tumors more than six centimeters, we found that it had invaded the brain. 
there was complete breach of the we could not find any plane whatsoever in most of the place in such tunnels just just as this of the outcome which i earlier mentioned we evaluate the patients pre op on karofsky grade none of the patients were completely independent in a 100 category and post op year one year we found as compared to the pre op the independent were just 12 patients and post op at one year we can find the independent patients were 48 patients we took significant quite significant thus coming to the results in part of the relation to the adhesion the tumors with no adhesion the good and fair outcome for only 100% of patients had good outcome good and fair outcome the ones with more adhesion the outcome was towards the poorer side as a grade one adhesion the uh, outcome was limited to 70% only good outcome and strong adhesion it was restricted to again 66% and the highly adherent point just 50% had a good outcome and there was a direct correlation with the morbidity also Does this next slide is gives a direct a bit correlation between the size which we could make out the lesser smaller size that there was majority of patients who had either no adhesion or weak adhesion which we found intraoperatively. Thus we could make up from the MRI beforehand the how the tumors are going to behave intraoperatively. And the medium size tumors there was strong adhesion in majority, whereas the larger size. Majority of patients had yes. It we can say that it common sense knowledge says that the larger tumors there will be more compression, more herniation, more mass. It is bound to cause such things. But this is what a rational and scientific explanation for the same. No doubt the MR aided us and gave us more parameters also. We could beforehand the larger tumor had edema, more edema, which was extensively growing into the white matter. on which basis we divided the tumor again into three categories i'm not going in this slide on those details again on the basis of mass effect of the tumor larger tumors gave more mass effect and we were divided able to divide the tumors again into three categories being the mild edema with mild sulcus effacement and moderate causing buckling and the severe causing even herniation to the adjacent parenchyma the correlation was also found with tumor consistency on which basis again we divided the tumors into three categories and we in the largest study we have seen the correlation of the consistency as well as the vascularity which was reflected by the imaging uh, parameters seen in the mr whether they were hypo intense iso intense or hyper intense the signal probability with vascularity as well come to just the histopathological what we found in this tumor majority of them 60 patient out of 68 were grade 1 meningiomas but that did not explain the outcome the grade 1 did not explain the outcome of the patients the only thing which explained was the extent of excision the grade 0 excision was achieved in 12 patients the and the outcome in 100% of these patients was very good and it was all these patients which were least adherent that is without adhesion they were be able to be removed and a grade zero excision just to conclude i would like to say that most of the tumors in our study had a direct relation of the size to the adhesiveness and the larger tumors were very much adherent to the surrounding brain and even causing the places and the in such a way we could not achieve a grade zero excision which was statistically highly significant the mr was the available tool for us for pre operative evaluation of these parameters and it played a pivotal role in the planning of better for will give a better outcome thus it may be concluded from the study that this adhesiveness has a directly proportional to size and is inversely proportional to outcome thank you Thank you, Doctor Vazi, for the excellent talk of a very large series. Thank you, sir. And uh, I request any questions from the audience or any my co-chair person. Still, we have time. So you are not audible, Satam sir. I think you are muted. Yeah. So, what is your further plan of action in such patient where where you find lot of adhesiveness? So, how do you manage after surgery? We need not manage. So, we are managing the same line. 
only thing is approach being aware, aware beforehand that these how these tumors are going to behave post operatively we tend to be aggressive trying to remove uh, at least achieving a grade 2 or grade 1 excision but in such patients it may be wise to remain for even a grade 3 going to depth we cause more damage in the more and causing uh, major neuro deficits the, the outcome is poorer we need not stick and the other what uh, but take home message from this study we have seen that till now we were saying the smaller tumor can be managed they are very small tumors 2.5 cm let them go to gamma knife and let no let's observe i think from this study it is quite clear we have had lesions one lesion has been some 2.9 cm also we have operated but and there was a very good plane and we could remove very easily as if it was nothing it was a different structure totally different structure and no deficit. I think from this study, the most important message is that we should take away the tumors in their infancy rather than waiting them to cause neuro deficit and let them wait and follow for six months. It does not hold anything waiting six months. Thank, thank you, Dr. Vajit. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Vajit, this is Dr. Sudhir Tyagi. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, I think the tumor excision all depends. Uh, location of the tumor is really very important. You cannot always achieve the Simpson grade one kind of excision every time. And it all depends where the tumor is exactly located, especially in the skull base meningiomas. Absolutely. It really need to be considered. No, I agree, completely agree. I never said grade zero at a plane of sphenoidal area. Grade zero is basically convexity only. Grade one, I said in other locations. Agreed, but this discussion was basically how we can address the tumors. Even if a convexity, I have shown a convexity meningioma, it was highly, very strongly adherent. And we removed the tumor in total. Grade zero, we have achieved, grade one, we have achieved in that. But the patient landed up with hemiparesis because it had breached the parenchyma. And we thought just removing. That is the aim of the study was only that to that, not grade zero excision. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Vazid, for the excellent talk. And we we are running now short of time. We'll move to the next topic. And I request Dr. Alvi Saluja to come. Dr. Alvi. Uh, yes, sir. I'll just start uh, yes, sharing my screen. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, at the outset, I would uh, first like to thank the organizing committee uh, for giving me the opportunity to present our paper uh, entitled Serum, uh, Serum S100B and NSE levels correlate with infarct size and bladder bowel involvement among acute ischemic stroke patients. So uh, stroke is the second leading cause of mortality worldwide and uh, low and middle income countries bear 85% of the global stroke burden. Uh, however, because uh, the MRI is, uh, although uh, diffusion weighted MRI is sensitive and specific with a, a sensitivity of around 88 to 100% and specificity of 95 to 100% in the acute phase of the ischemic stroke. However, it is limited by its cost and availability overall in lower and middle income countries like ours. Diffusion weighted negative strokes uh, can occur up to 7% of the cases and thus DWI negative strokes may be missed. Hence, uh, uh, there has been interest in the presence of certain biomarkers such as S100B, NSC, IL-6. Uh, matrix metalloprotein is 9, asymmetric dimethyl arginine and glial fibrillar acid proteins, which are specific for the neurons and oligodendroglial cells. And routinely, they are not uh, present in, uh, in much quantity in the blood. But however, only a handful of studies from India, only two studies from India have occurred pre previously and either studied NSE or uh, S100B, but neither, no, not both. And only one of these studies had assessed for infarct size correlation with these biomarkers. So, and there have been no Indian studies regarding NSC or S100B with stroke risk factors in clinical presentations. Uh, thus, our aim was to evaluate the role of NSC and S100B in acute ischemic stroke and investigate their correlation with infarct size, stroke risk factors, and clinical presentations. Uh, this was a hospital-based observational case cross-sectional study with uh, 60 stroke patients, more, more than 18 years of age and acute ischemic stroke, presenting within 48 hours uh, to the emergency and radiologically confirmed on a CT scan. Patients with intracranial bleed, traumatic brain injury, TIAs, neuroinflammatory disease, prior neuro neurodegenerative disorders, and uh, those refusing to participate were excluded. 
uh, we did general physical examination, systemic and neurological examination for all using a structured performer and a uh, fasting venous blood sample was collected within 24 hours prior, uh, after the presentation to the hospital from all acute ischemic stroke patients. So uh, the assays were uh, that after separating the plasma and storing at minus 80 degrees, a monoclonal two site sandwich immunometric acid kits of NSC and S100B were used in the uh, serum of the patients and cutoff values considered were 0.625 for NSC and 0 .50 50 picogram per ml for S100B. So uh, radiological measurement of infarct volume was done uh, on NCCT heads within for, and which was done within 48 hours of patient presentation. The infarct volume was calculated according to the ABC by two formula, ABC A being the largest diameter, B being diameter perpendicular to the largest diameter and C being uh, thickness of uh, each slice multiplied by the number of films in which the stroke was visible. In fact, volume was further subdivided, subgrouped as low, moderate and large, low being 0 to 10 ml, moderate 10.1 to 75 and large being more than 75. So uh, one important uh, aspect is that the radiologist was unaware of serum NSC and S100B values and the biochemical, uh, those who were doing the biochemical analysis were uh, not aware of the infarct size. Uh, statistical analysis was uh, 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 done uh, by SPSS uh, 21.0. Mean and standard deviations were used along with range for continuous data. Categorical data was represented in percentages and proportion. We used the Kolmogorov, Smirnov and Shapiro will test for normality of the data. ANOVA test was used for uh, association between mean serum S100B levels and NSE levels in low, moderate and large infarct groups. For correlation between NSE and S100 with infarct size and infarct volume, we use the Pearson correlation coefficient. In addition, we use the man whitney U test for association between various clinical presentations, either uh, present or absent with and infarct size with NSE and S100B values. A p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. So as we can see, the mean age was 68, uh, uh, around 68 in our patients. Uh, majority were females, around 51.7%. Uh, we want to emphasize that the infarct mean infarct volume was 67.92. Uh, mean S100B was around 387 and serum annulase was 21.22. So as we can see, the uh, we got a, le uh, a linear correlation with S100B and NSC uh, with basis of infarct size. This is a scatter diagram showing the same and with a highly significant p-value of uh, Zero point less than 0 0.0001 with S100B and uh, around 0 0.047 with NSE. So we, as we can see, larger the infarct, the more S100B and NSE was uh, uh, detectable in the serum of the patient. We also, the secondary objective of our study was to uh, analyze any association between NSE and S100B with the stroke presentations. Hence, we, the only clinical presentation which we found showed a significantly higher level of NSE and S100B was bladder bubble involvement, which in which NSE and S100B were highly significant. So uh, coming on to the discussion, mean S100B and NSE levels uh, uh, were found to have a significant positive correlation with infarct size. In a meta-analysis of 13 studies, uh, which were all from the uh, high income countries in the Western literature, NSE levels were significantly elevated among Asian and Caucasian strokes. However, S100B were only elevated among Asian strokes. Moreover, I would like to emphasize there were multiple studies, uh, the heterogeneity in this meta-analysis was large and there have been multiple studies in high income countries with conflicting results and racial and ethnic diversity as well in stroke patients. Only two prior Indian studies, as I had mentioned earlier, have uh, uh, found positive correlation with S100B or NSE. However, clinical presentations were not studied in those studies. Bladder bubble involvement correlated with increased levels in our study, which may be due to uh, a prior study has shown that uh, larger hemispheric strokes are more uh, are more likely to uh, cause incontinence and hence this may be a reason that larger infarcts causing greater neuronal or glial loss would lead to greater release of these markers, thus being detectable in the serum. Absolute number of stroke cases, however, were very small in our study, only nine. Hence, larger studies including uh, which uh, with larger studies with either follow-up or a control group uh, with uh, specific stroke presentations would be areas of future research. Limitations, uh, this was a small sample size of 60 only. It was a cross-sectional study. There were no controls and we did not long, uh, follow up the patients long-term. Correlation of biomarkers with long-term functional outcomes like morbidity and mortality and the neuroanatomical region of the stroke were not studied. Hence, uh, to conclude, s and b and NSE levels showed a significant positive correlation with infarct size in the non acute ischemic stroke patients. And NSE and s and b were higher among acute ischemic stroke patients, particularly presenting with bladder bubble involvement concomitantly. Thank you. Dr. Saluja, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. 
then i also have a question <clears throat> i think you, you are made a very uh, a sort of a confusion from your study doesn't stand to much of a logic just because the levels were raised doesn't mean that the bladder and bowel disturbances are related to that how can you make that conclusion from the study of yours the involvement of the bladder and bowel in a stroke depends upon the size of the ischemic infarct more than anything else so you could even have a smaller infarct where these levels would be normal and you could have bladder and bowel disturbances what yes, how sir. You... yes sir we are not denying that the thing is we are not denying that that may occur that even small lacunar infarcts in the subcortical region may yes. lead to may, we yeah. have yes we have we have uh, considered that that because sometimes even a bins wenger like presentation can cause a, a, a urinary incontinence and uh, involvement however the uh, however we included all stroke subtypes so that is we, the sample we all included all stroke subtypes we did only we included cortical as well as subcortical infarcts as well despite including subcortical infarcts it was found that bladder bowel involvement was found significant and the number of subcortical infarcts in our study was roughly almost equal to the cortical or roughly equal to the cortical dr so, saruja dr yes. saruja how do you expect your biomarkers to be equally raised in the cortical and subcortical infarct it's not possible yes sir i i the thing is that it it uh, the, the may the, the issue may also be that this may be this is a, only a small cross sectional study so uh, and there were no control groups and it was a small study so it may be that our results are slightly erroneous we are yeah, considering well, sir absolutely may, may i ask a question uh, now may i consummated yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah sir i uh, just so take a nice presentation dr saluja i will appreciate the efforts uh, being made i will take the question further from uh, dr ranjan itself see we have done similar biomarker studies uh, in brain tumors and we found all these to be raised in it's a non specific kind of a marker we found it in the brain tumor also okay now what we did also was did the serial biomarker levels subsequently also to demonstrate whether these levels tends to fall subsequently with the improvement of the patient and since you have calculated and correlated with the size it does it uh, uh, tells you does it regresses actually or not okay now your point regarding the bladder bowel involvement with the it may be a good observation we i think we must look into that we should not be really debating maybe there is some kind of association of a correlation between this versus the bladder bowel involvement okay that's the second comment which i wanted to make my main question was what is your control level in your study yes so that is the one of the limitations we are sir we have uh, we have the cutoffs for the uh, i had uh, uh, written for the uh, i had uh, demonstrated regarding the cutoffs in my study however we did not have a control group so that is one of the major limitations yeah that's a very study. big the major limitation, limitation. you know please uh, you can, you can take it subsequent we, yes but we have not included control so me we, we we may do a larger study with inclusion of controls yeah, just to are, show whether our results are actually With, because this is only a cross sectional study so that no, no, the... please continue but then thank, for the thank you so much everybody one, one one last one it is this dna con meeting and not iana con which i see in no, the sir. background of no, yours sir, actually i just used the virtual <laughs> background because i used the virtual background because there was no pro- virtual background provided for, for, by, by the dna Doesn't con doesn't matter still you know i was just confused whether i am sitting at the right place or no, i am at the wrong place no no sir you are no. sitting right <laughs> thank you dr thank ali you. for thank the you very so nice talk and a good discussion and i i feel ki we should have a more uh, larger study to uh, conclude for a result like this okay and with this we conclude our session and i thank all the speakers uh, who have participated and all the participants and the uh, who have uh, did, did a active discussion and with this we hand over the mic to oh. Uh, to the organizer dr satna you would like to ask oh no, thank you so much yaar yeah. we are on time and let's uh, hand over the mic to the organizers for the next session thank you so much thank you sir thank you thank for the exciting uh, sessions and the uh, precise uh, training of <coughs> so uh, we are due for our next session which is another exciting session and it's been the era of evolution in the field of stroke so uh, we'll be talking a lot on that we have uh, respected uh, 
chairpersons for that. So I'll request uh, to put up the slides for the introduction of our chairpersons. Shobit, uh, if we can get these slides. So, uh, Bob, yeah. Okay. So uh, for this session, we have, uh, I'll request Dr. C.S. Agarwal, Dr. Chandrasekhar Agarwal, sir, uh, Senior Consultant, HOD Neurologist at the Gangaram Hospital, to please uh, come and join the session and chair the session. I'll also request uh, Dr. Ishanan, sir, um, who is also a Senior Consultant Neurologist and the Vice Chairman of Department of Neurology at the Sir Gangaram Hospital and Professor of Neurology at the GIPMAP. He has uh, authored 65, uh, co-authored 65 papers in national and international journals. A lot of I'm to start with what I say, but we'll see that again. Last year, I met a video of depression, headache, epilepsy, myasthenia uh, gravis, and multiple sclerosis. So uh, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ishanan and Dr. C.S. Agarwal, sir, to invite the speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dinesh and uh, Dr. Ranjan uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, we're starting this uh, early in the morning and uh, we have a very interesting topic. This the seminar is, is basically stroke based and uh, we have three pioneers in this field, Dr. Subhash Kaul, Dr. M.V. Padma and Dr. Ranjan, who are going to deliver their lectures. Uh, so the first lecture is, is by Dr. Subhash Kaul. Uh, uh, can I have slides for his introduction, please? I know Dr. Subhash uh, for a very long time. We were uh, more or less at the same time in US when we were doing our fellowships. Uh, he is uh, he's a renowned figure in, uh, in let's what you say, remind me tomorrow. Okay. Uh, in the field of neurology, uh, he is a DM in neurology from uh, Chandigarh, uh, PGI. He did a stroke fellowship in uh, 1994 to 1996. I did my fellowship in 95 to 97. So they were at the same place, uh, uh, at same place at the same time. And uh, then he, is, uh, he has worked at faculty uh, for 27 years uh, at Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. He is a professor and head department of neurology and dean at NIMS Hyderabad. At present, he is senior consultant at KIMS uh, Secunderabad. He, is, he has chairman research advisory board KIMS Foundation Research Center. He has uh, more than 100 publications in national and international journal and has been a principal uh, and co investigator of several national and international projects, including Hyderabad Stroke Registry, funded by ICMR New Delhi. So uh, I'll request Dr. Subhash Kaul to deliver his talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, good morning. Uh, can, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. E. Shannon, for that uh, very good introduction. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan, for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to speak on the non-reperfusion therapies for acute ischemic stroke treatment. You know that the main uh, problem in stroke is uh, the clot which blocks the circulation. So therefore, the central theme is to reperfuse. That can never be replaced. But till the reperfusion occurs, there's an ongoing damage. And as you can see here, there is a core area of infarct, but there's a bigger area surrounding the infarct, which we call penumbra, where the damage is ongoing. So for the last two decades, there have always been an effort, and there are so many clinical trials, to develop some agents which can protect this penumbra till you thrombolize. So reperfusion cannot be replaced, but there is a need to supplement it with something. And uh, many, many um, uh, methods have been employed and I'm going to just uh, summarize them. Whatever are in the pipeline, what uh, Dr. Ranjan and myself were saying, futuristic efforts. And some of them are almost uh, near practicability. So the first is the FES protocol. Now FES protocol, basically it stands for fever sugar and swallowing. And this was popularized basically in Australia, but later on implemented in other uh, um, European countries. And it is very simple. It's a very strict control of fever, sugar, and swallowing protocol. It's actually driven by nurses. And it involves measuring temperature strictly every six hourly and treating temperature if it's more than 37.5, measuring blood sugar strictly between every six hourly 
and uh, treating it if it's more than 10 millimoles and having swallow screen in all these patients. Now it is done in most of the stroke patients, but the emphasis here is that it is to be done strictly and under strict monitoring and taking the action appropriately, at least in the first 72 hours, because that's when the damage occurs. And there are many protocols which are evidence-based and they all have been found to be positive and giving very good results. In fact, uh, the a uh, lot of meta-analysis and it has been found that the, if you strictly employ this FES clinical pathway, just these three things, then the um, advantage in terms of independent survival at 90 days is 15.7% advantage compared to those who do not undergo this FES clinical pathway. Now compare that with a combined effect of stroke unit TP and aspirin, it's 10%. So FES is very powerful and the number needed to treat if you take aspirin alone is 79, stroke unit 18, thrombolysis 8 to 14 and FES pathway 6.4. These are hard figures which you can see anywhere in the literature. In AIMS group also did a similar stroke care pathway and I was asked to write an editorial for that. Will they generally be smooth? It was a debate. And I clearly surveyed all the literature and found it's a very powerful thing, provided we believe in it and implement it. Now, the second thing is neuroprotective agents, the bugbear. You know, all of us have been so hopeful about neuroprotective and most of the results have been negative. But now here, what I found after the survey of the latest literature, that there are uh, two neuroprotective agents which may have some role. Now, the basis of neuroprotective agents is, again, the same, uh, you know, post-hypoxia, post-ischemia uh, damage. As you know, it is time-driven. The moment there's ischemia, there are ion channel changes within minutes, and then there is an activation of voltage-dependent channels, glycine release, glutamate release. This glutamate release is, seems to be the central thing because it causes excitotoxicity because of it, there's a damage, and uh, there's a nitrous oxide generation, by 15 hours, there's an inflammation in the ischemic tissue, and then there's a free radical generation. And then whatever you may do, even if you reperfuse, you know, it, 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 it cannot reverse all this what has happened. Now, two agents which have been uh, shown is one is cerebrolysin, which acts at many steps in this cascade. And second is a novel agent that's called neuromatide, which uh, uh, is, again, it interferes with the excitotoxicity at these calcium channels. Now, first I'll talk of cerebral protein. It's produced by breakdown of lipid-free porcine brain proteins. It acts like an endogenous neurotrophic factor, and it has multiple actions, but the primary action is to reduce excitotoxicity. It blocks activation of the calcium-dependent proteases and scavenges the free oxygen radicals. The first study came in 2012, and it was mainly done in Asia, and it found that there was not much difference between placebo and the cerebrolysine group except in the people who were very severely affected. That means severe strokes, right? So they were asked to do some further trials. Now, further trials were done, and there was a meta-analysis of these trials by Matt and Bonstein, whom all of us know, who is the president of the Israeli Stroke Society and also vice president of, uh, he was vice president of the World Stroke Organization. And he did this uh, meta-analysis of about nine trials. And what he found is that, uh, you know, if you see, Overall, in these patients, in comparison, in the NIHSS, there was a clearly some advantage. And this is a meta-analysis of so many trials. It's a 30-day NIHS, there was an advantage. But if you take severe strokes with the NIHS of more than 12, there was clearly an advantage of cerebrolysin, which you can see here. This is only the severe strokes. And as far as side effect profile is concerned, they were equal between the conventional treatment and the treatment with cerebrolysin. So based on this meta-analysis and other literature, uh, European Academy of Neurology and European Federation of Neurorehabilitation on Pharmacological Support, in fact, included the use of uh, cerebrolysin in their guidelines. Uh, as you can see here, these are all the uh, so-called agents and they are against most of them, but they are for use for cerebrolysin as well as from, for steloprem. Uh, which is which is kind of acetylopram, but we are talking of cerebrolysin. Of course, the recommendation is weak recommendation. As you know, it's not a strong recommendation, but they have given a weak recommendation. So this is something to look for in future also, at least as a concept. Uh, this is their guidelines, European recommendation, 30 ml for at least 10 days, 
right? And initiated in the first seven days after acute ischemic stroke. Now, the second exciting thing is about the, another um, uh, neuroprotective agent, which is called the nerinitide. It's a new name for us, nerinitide, and it's not available in the market. And this was part of an escape NA1 trial. Now, escape NA1 trial was basically involved acute stroke patients in which endovascular treatment was done. Uh, everybody underwent endovascular treatment, but in some patients, they also gave TPA, those who came within 4.5 hours and all. And basic thing, they wanted to study the effect of the neuroprotective agents. Does it make a difference or not? So half the patients were given neuroprotective agents and other half were not given neuroprotective agents. And that's what they want to study. And similarly, some patients received alteplase and some patients did not receive alteplase according to the recommendation. And overall, they found that there is no difference overall. But to their surprise, what they found, to their surprise, what they found, that patients who had not received alteplase, in them, this neuroprotective agent, nerinitide, showed a significant improvement, right? On the other hand, patients who had received TPA, there, there was no difference. So this was a, a very surprising thing for them. And on that, uh, they, they conclude, the trialists, that to our knowledge, the ESCAPE N1 trial is the first large trial of any neuroprotecting agent in the setting of human ischemia reperfusion. Although we did not observe a treatment benefit of nerinitide for the primary outcome in the trial population as a whole, but a large absolute benefit was observed for patients who received nerinitide and were not treated with usual care alteplase. This surprising finding is the evidence of a modification of the effect of nirinitide, possibly due to a drug-drug interaction between nirinitide and alteplase. And they further add that the biological plausibility of this hypothesis was supported by the pharmacokinetic data obtained from trial participants showing that nirinitide concentrations were reduced in patients who received nirinitide and alteplase. So it seems there's an antagonism between nirinitide and alteplase. So therefore, those who did not receive alteplase, the nitide had showed a better outcome. So therefore, this is the implication for all the evidence. I don't think it is as yet given any guideline or recommendation, but this shows the way for further treatment where this particular molecule, the nitide, will be further investigated. So this is something in the pipeline uh, for, for further non-reperfusion therapy. Now, the other important uh, Non-reperfusion therapy is a sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation. This is very exciting. I have been part of it. Sphenopalatine ganglion is a small nervous center, a nervous, uh, uh, you know, center. Uh, it's a ganglion which resides behind the nasal cavity. All of us have uh, known it since our anatomy days. It was very hard to remember its anatomy. Uh, but SPG stimulation is known to augment cerebral perfusion right, because of its being a parasympathetic center. And in many animal experiments in the uh, couple of decades ago, it was shown that it increases the uh, brain perfusion in mice experiments. And these are the, uh, and this is one of the, uh, again, slides which is showing, it's a demonstrative slides. It's also animal experimentation where you are showing that this is a model of thrombosis in the animal. And after SPG stimulation, you can see that there is a reperfusion, recanalization with the SPG stimulation. And this is a one inch stimulation electrode. It's implanted in a minimally invasive surgery, which our, uh, uh, you know, any neurosurgeon does. It's a kind of a dental surgery. And you can see it is done through the mouth and it takes hardly 10 minutes. And uh, after that, uh, you can take a plain x-ray and see its location, whether it's at a proper place or not. And then it is stimulated with a battery for about half an hour or so. And now there's a very good technology. They have made a Bluetooth technology by which uh, this ganglion is stimulated every day. And in fact, first uh, study, first uh, case of this trial was done in my institute, Nizam's institute, when I was there, because we did the pilot study in, um, in India at that time, Dheeraj, myself, and two other centers were there, and it was published also. And these were the inclusion criteria. Uh, we took only anterior circulation strokes, uh, those who were little, moderately severe, NHS more than seven, and those who had not received thrombolytic therapy. So we did not dis disturb the thrombolysis pathway. They were, they were separate. We took only those who were rejected for the thrombolytic therapy for some reason. Uh, and uh, this is the outcome. And you can see here that the uh, outcome was better. The, the, the patients were uh, compared uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, the, with the data which is available in the literature from the TPA. And 
all these patients showed a better outcome. And based on this pilot study, a major study was done uh, in US and in many other centers. And as you can see, the names of the participants, they are all big names in the stroke. One is Nathan Bornstein himself, who was the principal investigator, but Jeff Saver, Christopher Diner from Germany, Philips Gorlick, Ashfaq Schweb, they are all big names. And they did this study, which was uh, uh, published in 2019. And this is the forest plot where uh, you can see that uh, there's a clearly an advantage of SPG stimulation and the maximum advantage is in patients who are having severe strokes. So 15 to 18 NIHS group, you can say they have got the maximum advantages. And those who have got a cortical involvement also, in addition to subcortical, they had a maximum advantage. The subcortical lacoons don't have so much of advantage. So therefore, severe strokes, cortical involvement, and same is true with aspects also. Obviously, severe strokes are more advantage. And women had more advantage, in fact. So, so therefore, moderately severe cortically-based stroke in women benefited more. Based on this uh, publication, there was an editorial in stroke in 2019 and where the, the, where the message is patient selection will be the key. Now, obviously, this is still in pipeline. This is still in experiments. It has not come into our guidelines as yet, but this is something to look forward because the message so far has been positive only, but patient selection will be the key. And then another exciting thing which we are seeing is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Is it ready for clinical practice? It's not ready for clinical practice, but uh, you know, FDA has already given approval for transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. But the, uh, but the studies are going on in aphasia, in upper limb spasticity, even in acute treatment, early rehabilitation. I mean. So it's something which is in the pipeline. It is something for which we have to look at with uh, some hope and excitement. Uh, and it is something in the pipeline. And, uh, you know, at this time, many hospitals even have bought these machines and they are even doing it, although it's not in the guidelines. But the literature is quite positive as of now. And then the last thing I want to speak is about stem cell therapy. Dr. Kamesha Prasad, Dr. Padma, they have done very nice studies in All India Institute. And uh, what they found is that at least it does not have any adverse side effect profile, but efficacy was not proved. Uh, but it is something which, you know, stem cell everybody is hoping, not in guidelines, but something in the pipelines. So therefore, in summary, uh, what are the non-perfusion uh, non-IVTPA or endovascular, that, that's our standard treatment, IVTP and endovascular uh, intervention. Other than that, these are the things which, uh, which can improve the outcome. This very strict stroke care protocol. It can be FES, but FES basically means stroke care pathway only. A very strict attention to fever, uh, sugar, swallowing, and other things like temperature and all. They have been shown improving outcome beyond reperfusion and beyond any controversy. Cerebrolysin and nerinitide, they offer hope. They don't guarantee the outcome at this point in time, but they are not dead. They are something which are looking forward to. Third is sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation holds promise in some clinical scenarios, if not in all strokes. And uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is something which is being actively studied for its role in acute rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Call. Uh, finishing in time. Well, uh, in time, we have time for questions, answers. Uh, uh, first, I'll open it uh, for the audience. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Can uh, I ask? Can I ask? Sure, sure, ma'am. Okay. So, at the outset, thank you so much. As usual, Professor Call, your uh, talk is something which I will never miss in my in my <laughs> ever. It's always iconic. So one little comment on this is that, yeah, you know, as nerinitide seems to be worked, you know, seems to have the same trajectory as erythropoietin. Erythropoietin yeah. also, when it was combined with alteplase, had a negative effect and it said probably that's what had. So maybe this, this is, there is something with thrombolysis and a neuroprotectin, which, um, which may be, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of a blessing in disguise as well, because there, then there's a role for this in all those who will not be thrombolyzed or beyond thrombolysis. You think there's something similarity. Erythropoietin also had come in a big way, and then it fell apart because they said those studies were never given with thrombolytic. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's possible. It's possible. Uh, we have to just look forward. It seems that many more studies are going to be launched with this. We have to wait and watch. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Ranjan. I'd like to call as usual. Excellent mm -hmm. talk. Padma has already said that. I just want to ask you something. There have been a couple of studies coming about the role of colchichin mm -hmm. uh, in stroke. Would it have something to do with reperfusion strategy? What do you think about it? No, uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, most of the colchicin studies are based on uh, anti-inflammatory agents because that is an anti-inflammatory agent. And, you know, a lot of people say stroke is an inflammatory disease. And I think Padma has done a study on minocycline. And uh, I think, Padma, you can answer this question. Please help me. You always do. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, actually, okay, no that, that, it's a fantastic question, uh, what Professor Ranjan said. That it is true, but colchicin, uh, sir, it has been now actually even with COVID, colchicin had come in and it fell apart. So I think colchicin, as Professor Call said, was targeting the, uh, the cascade of inflammatory issues post ischemia. And uh, it was also tried in acute MI way back, I think three decades ago, it fell apart. So I think both antibiotics and anti-inflammatory may come in a basket somewhere, but they will certainly not be the be all and end all. I don't see that happening. Dr. Padma, are you using colchichin? Certainly not, sir. Certainly not. Okay, fine. Dr. Uh, Ranjan, are you using? We want to learn from you. I would say yes. <laughs> Can I ask a question? I'm Dr. Manjiri here. Yeah, yeah Dr. Manjiri. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, do you think that TMS is actually going the stem cell way or, you know, whichever way? Because, you know, you see, um, you know, TMS in Parkinson's, TMS in depression, TMS in stroke, TMS in epilepsy. And really, if you look, you know, if you do something in a trial protocol, you're giving so much more extra attention to these patients. And uh, of course, you should have a control arm which doesn't receive it. But uh, really, you know, uh, the cause of concern is that um, if you look at the costs which are being charged by certain, uh, you know, 10,000 per sitting and, you know, 20 sittings or eight sittings, uh, it is a matter of concern. And uh, really, one needs to have in guidelines somewhere in place the role of these, you know, iffy therapies or, I mean, whatever. So what are your comments on that, sir? I think, uh, I think Manjiri, you are very right. Uh, it is not evidence-based or even in guidelines for management of stroke. Uh, it is, I, I mean, I, I was so much excited after reviewing the literature of PMS. It all looked positive, except that it is not in guidelines. But the literature is positive. But it is not in guidelines except in depression. I called Majaz Munis. I woke him up in there. Majaz, what is in US? What is this PMS? He said, we are awaiting the results of double-blind randomized control trials. Till now, that is experimental. The thing is that stroke or whole of neurology is so much starved for treatment. We are so much starved for treatment that anything we are looking at with hope. But uh, you, you are right. It is not in, it's not in guidelines. We have to, I think once its role will be confirmed, then all that should be seen, the cost and other things. You are right. It has to be economic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Call, one, one question. Can I ask uh, you a question? Yeah. Sir, please. Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Anshu. Yeah. Uh, there was a, uh, I was actually, we were approached for a study on uh, use of natalizumab for uh, an acute ischemic stroke. Uh, oh. in, so I was just asking, you had reviewed the literature. What is, what does the literature say about that? No, I don't know about natalizumab in acute stroke. I think again, Padma only will answer that. I thought it's for only MS. Yeah, that's what we also thought when we were approached <laughs> by a study by Biogen. Or no, but I no uh, that this must be absolutely new because in the literature I saw I have not come across. Padma, please, you know. Yeah, I I think you know a lot of even beyond natalizumab, there are a lot of this monoclonal antibodies also which is which are being tried, and as Professor Call said, we still uh, cling on to straws in to get the optimal stroke care pathway set. In. And uh, I would take this with a little pinch of salt though because. Uh, Natalizumab is a Biogen product. So, you know, the, the, there is an industry uh, sort of a push to get into newer avenues, but they would not do it with some evidence backing it. And there is evidence backing it. It's not robust. So it is new. Beyond Natalizumab, there are other molecules of uh, monoclonal antibodies. Which are also, in fact, if you look at 
the upcoming strategies for acute ischemic stroke it's it's as big as what you have for an alzheimer's dementia it's a big wheel so it's somewhere there but i'm not convinced though i may be wrong uh, thank I, you dr padma uh, yeah dr ranjan you want to say yeah i just wanted to say that i would totally agree with uh, dr padma uh, uh, the monoclonal antibodies by the companies are being just used left right and center without any any evidence for them and that is what uh, I, i would also talked about the same thing with dr anshu malik and as, of course i didn't want to become a part of this any study with this <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Doctor Call. We will move to the second talk. We are running short of time, so the the uh, the can I have the slide for introduction for Doctor Padma? Uh, she is going to talk uh, a, a very good uh, uh, lecture. I would say, making artificial intelligence uh, work for stroke pros and cons, diagnosis, patient selection, and the outcome prediction with uh, artificial intelligence where are we now so very very pertinent and very important question with the artificial uh, intelligence coming in a big way uh, uh, in neurology or in in medicine so dr padma we we I share with her we joined at the same time dm i joined in pant and she joined in aims i always say that when i introduce her she is a md dm frcp fms fns sc fi and fna she is professor and head of department of neurology neuroscience center aims she has interest uh, in all the fields of neurology but more, more so in stroke and uh, and, and sleep, multiple sclerosis and uh, she is uh, is a padam shri awardi and uh, uh, in 2016 and uh, she had initiated and is in charge of thrombolysis pro uh, program in aims so we are we are in for a very exciting talk uh, by dr padma uh, dr padma please thank you so much thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you professor ranjan for giving me an opportunity to share the same podium with you i did share my screen is it visible okay again i'll share it again is it visible now yes ma'am please uh, put it in slide show mode did that okay so good morning you know the term covid has actually entered the lexicon of uh, us medical professionals and the rest of the world in just last 2 years and with cataclysmic consequences and you will all agree with me but then what has really emerged is like just like a phoenix you know rising from the ashes it was a resilience of human spirit which has risen in the last 2 years and you will all agree with me on this and now we are talking about machines so machines have the resilience machines have that human instinct i don't know so my disclaimer is the approach to this talk will be through the micro prism of a neurologist interested in stroke care so i must underline this that it is a micro prism okay so there is this famous quote by hippocrates life is short art is long opportunity fleeting experience treacherous and judgment difficult now nothing in the world summarizes acute stroke treatment more than this this is exactly what we do all the time with sort of democles hanging on our head and walking the tight rope so the two important tenets in stroke is what time and then our management is extremely dependent on the information which is provided by imaging studies is actually the humongous advances of imaging which has transformed our approach to stroke care from one of nihilism to one of aggression you know the the uh, overwhelming confidence that you will make a difference to the stroke outcome in respect to what time they present to us so time and the information by imaging and what do we want the imaging to do for us we want to differentiate from stroke from mimics bleed from ischemia presence of this critically perfused jeopardized cerebral tissue what we call as ischemic penumbra whether it is a large artery the stroke subtype we want the you know early prognosis early neurological deterioration and what have you and also the long term prognosis including recurrence death disability so but do we have this now this the imaging triage pathway is the time limiting step it's there but it's not always there in all the sites and that's why probably you know if you get some automated methods to help us out using 
the machines, it may help us. But again, I'll throw open this question of the intuition and instinct. Let's see what artificial intelligence is. The machines which are capable of demonstrating cognitive functions such as learning and problem solving, which we all thought that it is a human brain or a living brain is capable of. So artificial intelligence are, you know, there are algorithms which are capable of demonstrating cognitive functions. So you learn, you solve a problem, you adapt, you develop a logic, and then you have rules, okay? And the machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence which is based on complex algorithms and the softwares which are mimicking the networks of a human brain. So then it can decipher very critical problems and it includes special senses like you know, visual perception, speech recognition, decision making. And with more and more data, when it gets exposed to this kind of big data. Now, the deep learning is even more complex and it is embedded into the machine learning system, which is a class of artificial neural networks. And herein is a black box because it has a supervised, it has an unsupervised. So here you devise a system and then the machine starts to devise itself, which is beyond the control of the engineer who first engineered it. So there are different machine learning methods, a broad range, okay? So there's something called a, a, a spectrum of statistical techniques, linear regression, support vector machines, decision trees, regression trees, and these are not the usual trees. The radial basis function kernel, Spectral kernel, spectral regression extensives, linear discriminant analysis. Does it look like Greek and Latin? Yes, it does. Mumbo jumbo. Doesn't matter. Even when we talk of medicine, the engineers also would feel that. So we have a rule-based expert system. And the rule-based is what we learn. Our medical knowledge, our MBBS, MD, DM, you know, MS, MCH, what have you. So this is a learned database. And this is pretty much like, you know, that, that you have a navigation app on a Google. But the AI is based on machine learning, as we had just said. And initial prog programming is, is dependent upon the amount of data you feed into the system. And what's happened subsequent is that with this big data, which is fed in, then the machine starts to become smarter and devises its own complex algorithms and spits out these protocols which have no control of human hand anymore, okay? And if you're looking at a graphical overview of how you apply artificial intelligence in, a, in say acute stroke, and let's say acute ischemic stroke. So we, we know we would like to know the lesion volume or if it is a bleed, what is the volume of bleed, the functional outcome, the onset, when did the stroke happen, okay? and the short and long-term outcome. And then, and in the acute onset, as I said before, the salvageable tissue, the core lesion, the aspect score, large vessel occlusion. So all these things which are now being provided very elegantly by CT or MR-based imaging methods that we have. And again, we talked about the presence of expertise, which may be time limited, which may be not be available. We may not have the expertise in terms of both human personal, like radiologists or neurologists to read that way. So that's where if you have an automated app, which can give you all this, great. And then we have what is called as convolutional neural networks. That itself is a tongue twister. So this is something which is machine, but it simulates the networks with a human brain. So what can CNN do for us? Now, they help denoise the MR brain for fusion images. They use this RTL spin labeling, allowing diagnostic images to be created at a shorter scan. So if it is a six minutes, you're getting it in six seconds. And then artificial intelligent method, which can significantly reduce the amount of gadolinium. So if you're concerned about the contrast amount, you don't want this contrast to be given, you know, you have concerns about the, the nephrons taking over the neurons, then you don't give that much. And it's possible. The machine can do the same thing with far less contrast. And it can be used to predict gold standard imaging biomarkers in situations where it's, where it's infeasible to obtain. So blood, cerebral blood flow imaging. I can't foresee this happening in Timbuktu. So you can train a deep convolutional network to predict a cerebral blood flow 
using only MR images, you're not doing this perfusion using the usual, you know, the nuclear medicine techniques. That you, you're looking at an MR and you can actually extrapolate these images to an image um, methodology which is available with you at most clinical practice setting. So most important for me in an acute ischemic stroke is identifying a mismatch, right? Most of our advances are actually based upon this blessed thing, mismatch, which is not sanquanon, but is something very close to this ischemic penumbra that we have. And that's how we wean in patients for the you know, more advanced perfusion therapies, whether it is bridge or just DVT, what have you. So usually what you have, you have a diffusion and flare mismatch. You may not get that, right? So step one is you features from the MR source perfusion imaging could be identified using this neural network based technique as an auto encoder. And in step two, these features were combined with the diffusion flare images using a different supervised learning algorithms, some sub support vector machines and stepwise regression. And they actually done these studies and they found this that this is an automated, you know, uh, a figure which is closer to one which will help you. And they got 0.68 to classify these patients as has a stroke happened before 4.5 hours or is it after 4.5 hours? That's what I need. Aspects. Now, you know that we already have this app of aspects, right? It'll tell you immediately. You're not even looking at a subjective. Uh, there could be some kind of variability there. My aspects is seven. Somebody says, no, my aspects is eight and seven is a cutoff, whether I go for EBT or not. You know, that kind of a thing, you can have a machine helping you out. And there is a software which is already available. LVOs, now this is absolutely crucial because when you identify an LVO, my chain may change. In a hopper spoke model, maybe I'll just start that. I'll just push in teritic place and just shift them to a place where there is. Or from the, you know, the CT, I'm pushing those 10 steps into the cath lab. So the LVO's identification could be given. You say, you can do the CT angio. Now, I don't have a CT angio. Now, good, get in this app. And even with simple CT image, they could get this sufficient sensitivity and specificity saying that this is an intracranial LVO. And that was based on the CNN or the convolutional neural network. Now, the short-term tissue segmentation and identification is very similar. Classic example is rapid software, right? Now, rapid software is available. Now, it comes with a price. Of course, when you have more of these algorithms which you can identify, then obviously the cost also will come down. Like what happens with mobile phones? They did come down. So, constable work has been already been reported. And we do have uh, the perfect example rapid software, which also needs to be now, uh, I guess, updated. And so, and they did this using the data from the diffuse trial. And they looked at certain parameters like Tmax and others, and they came up to a sensitivity of 100%. Great, isn't it? So this is also being done. And while MR manual identification of the core, okay, how much is the core? What is the target, which is the risk tissue as is being identified on an AI, on an AI and you correlate it with our gold standard as we have right now. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, hot topic. You know, there's something called ischemic stroke lesion segmentation conferences. And this is actually a, a meeting ground by these brilliant engineers and would say biomedical engineering sections to identify and develop these algorithms. So in 2018, the top performing algorithm used a 3D neural network architecture to achieve the score of 0.56 on you know, on 63 patients, and they validated this in 40 patients. And from data which was obtained in the acute ischemic stroke, obtained within eight hours of symptom onset using the MR DWI and also the CT perfusion within three hours. And the more recent ILIT, the IELTS challenges, where they're open competitions. And, you know, these participants train a standardized data set and performance is then evaluated. And uh, in 2015, 2016, 2018, and 2019. Now, this is as far as we go, and then the pandemic struck us, but I think this is going to come out now because they offer a natural benchmark for this algorithm performance and you know, trying to mitigate the problems of comparing performance between algorithms. 
So we will be probably getting from these brilliant brains uh, some more brilliant machines. Now we also want to know prediction of hemorrhagic transformation, which is possible. I think I'll go a little faster because I just have four minutes more. But this also they were able to know using different techniques of how to identify a probability of a bleed if I thrombolize. And because that's the biggest bugbear the clinicians have, why do they don't thrombolize in say district settings? Long-term outcome, that's primarily disability, death, and the recurrence. And this was also being able to be done using the CNN and using the data sets from either CTU or MR-based technique. And please remember, for all of these, you need huge data sets. And in some of these IELTS challenges, they actually use just less than 100 patient data sets. So even that is now evolving that even with lesser number of data sets, you will be able to come up to this. So there are three clinical prognostic scores. Say, for example, we have Thrive, Span, 100. And uh, they have looked at the improvement, the NHS improvement and good clinical outcome, which emphasize that you can use these machine learning methods which can outperform the usual outcome prediction tool. So that's what's happening that the machine can outperform a human brain. So in the applications in stroke, if I have to summarize, you, you can enhance stroke recovery using neuro rehab. You can predict the recurrence. You can predict the essentially the outcome much better than using the other things. But most important in the other things would be trying to identify the stroke onset, identify the amount of brain which can still be salvaged, get LVOs, you know, these kind of things which are like a low-hanging fruit for us. There are a lot of barriers, right? There are problems like disruption of the doctor-patient relationship. If, you know, you just heard this recent thing where a robotic um, a machine had uh, essentially botched up a surgery and the patient died on table and it was too late to intervene. So if something like that happens, then who's going to be incriminated? Are you going to take that uh, machine and put him in the jail? Uh, you know, what are these? We have, this, these are gray zones, limitations in billing, reimbursement, additional costs, of course. Again, you're again coming back to expertise and this expertise being available at all clinical practice settings. So all these are there, MR practice liability. You need to have the legal systems to also to be evolved along with this, because if you have to get machines parallelly into our, um, you know, the thing, and of course, there's always there that are, are the machine is going to replace this. I don't believe, I don't think they can replace us. So there's a dark side. It's a black box. As I said before, the engineers are engineering it. And after that, the machine takes over. The engineer has no control. So the way forward, there is a clear need, you know, to get it more optimally available across all practice settings. I think machines will help us. A lot of proof, a lot of work in progress. So leveraging AI into our pathway of acute stroke, chronic stroke, stroke prevention, stroke rehab. Yes, I do find that this is all there, but then it's not the strongest of the species that survive or the most intelligent. It's one who's most responsive to change. So this is our last slide. To quote Sir William Osler, medicine is a science of uncertainty and art of probability. Listen and listen. The patient is telling you the diagnosis. It seems artificial intelligence is listening. It's high time. We have our skills and adapt to the changes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padma. Finishing in time, and I like the last slide. That's what I keep telling my residents also. Everything is there with the patient. You have to listen to it. It's a very difficult topic, and a very, uh, I tried very well to explain it in, in simple words. I know it's it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to understand for, for a neurologist or for a for a doctor, uh, we we have time only for one question because we are running short of time. We are already nine forty four. One question only, please, Doctor Ranjan. Yeah. Hi, staff, sir. Because you know, I myself had to really, really, really study for this talk because we are, you know, we are genetically programmed to be healers, and we have the human instinct and the gut feeling. So unfortunately, oh. I believe the machines are also turning out to be the same. Yeah. Let's, like let's hope that they, they, they stay as allies and not as competitors. That is why, Dr. Padma, it's a pleasure always hearing you because you come well, well prepared with your slides. 
is absolutely superb. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padma. Now, uh, I'll, uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, I'll request Dr. C.S. Agarwal to introduce uh, Dr. Ranjan and the topic. Dr. C.S. Agarwal, please. Good morning. Uh, in fact, uh, instead of uh, introducing Dr. Ranjan, because it doesn't require any introduction, uh, but I would first like to thank him for giving this academic feast on such an auspicious day of Vasant Panchmi. You know, I don't know whether you are all aware that today is person punch me, the day when we celebrate or when we worship Ma Durga, Ma, sorry, Ma Sharda, who is the goddess of knowledge and uh, education. So I would like to thank him. And then honestly, I don't think he needs any introduction. So I'll request him to please go ahead and present his talk on left atrial cardiopathy and stroke. Dr. Anjan, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, CS. Yes. You're, you're a great guy. And thank you for all that you said. It's a pleasure to be here today speaking after Dr. Padma and Subhash Paul, dying of stroke in our country. I've been talking about this entity, atrial cardiopathy. And uh, I've done a series of talks on this. And why I have come back to you is to tell you that more work which we have done recently in atrial cardiopathy, which we are quite convinced and we'll try to convince you also, is a novel cause of stroke. My first slide itself was a beautiful editorial about atrial cardiopathy. Does it exist? And if it does, what is it? What are the implications? And does it alter our outlook towards cardiogenic strokes and ECS? <coughs> atrial cardiopathy is a severe left atrial enlargement on echocardiography. And we talk about P wave terminal force on an ECG in lead one. This is, of course, a very childish figure, not meant for neurologists who are so learned people, but I just like showing it just to show you about the concept about what I'm talking about. If you see this illustration of the ECG parameter, which is used to calculate the P-wave terminal force velocity is defined as the duration of the downward deflection, the terminal portion of the P-wave of lead V1 multiplied by the absolute value of the amplitude, which gives you the P-wave terminal force velocity in V1. Here again, just to show you, which I picked up from the analysis of neurology, the PTF on the left, that is B, and then you see where the terminal four velocity is about 7,900, which is quite significantly long. The current ECG machines do not routinely report PTF V1. And its values show a moderate degree of measurement to measurement variation, thereby limiting its immediate clinical value as a risk for vascular brain injury. I will give you evidence for that also. However, these technical issues are likely with further clinical development of this marker. And in the meantime, PTF V1 may serve as an important research tool in the ongoing quest to better understand cryptogenic strokes and vascular brain injury. And that's what I'm trying to do. 
many cryptogenic strokes are susceptible to arise from occult cardiac embolization. Since PTA V1, has long been established as a marker of increased left atrial pressure and hypertrophy, associations between PTA V1 and radiant fog, independent of document AF, suggest that atrial cardiopathy may cause embolism in the absence of AF. So this slide is nothing much. But that's to show you the 2D eco criteria for severe left atrial enlargement, mild, moderate, severe, which is not too difficult to measure. Of course, this is just a picture to show you about the left atrial enlargement. Now, before I go further, I would definitely like to give you the concept of a cryptogenic stroke and an ESS. The trial of ORG0172 in acute stroke defines cryptogenic stroke as a cerebral infarct not attributed to a definite source of cardiac embolism, large vessel atherosclerosis, or small vessel disease, despite extensive cardiac, vascular, hematological and surgical evaluation. Evidence of more than one competing cause or incomplete diagnostic evaluation fits into the criteria for a cryptogenic stroke. This, nearly 60% of cortical infarcts on brain imaging are typically embolic. Given the strong circumstantial evidence favoring an embolic pathogenesis of more CS patient, this new entity, embolic stroke of undetermined stroke, to describe non lecana stroke without evidence of ipsilateral intracranial or extracranial large artery stenosis or more than 50%, a major cardioembolic source such as AF, left ventricular dysfunction, or other specific mechanisms of stroke. So, he says, embolic strokes of undetermined stroke are operational. Operationally, remember, defined as non lecana brain infarcts without substantial proximal artery stenosis or major cardioembolic sources, and they represent 80 to 90% of all cryptogenic ischemic strokes. Now, that is very interesting. Now, what are the potential causes of this? Cardiogenic embolization, proximal cerebral artery, Aortic arch or non stenotic carotid plaques, arteriogenic, or the ways the forum intervail with the paradoxical embolization, and other causes, potential causes, which I will not go into the details of. So just look at this slide for the benefit of our postgraduates. What is cryptogenic stroke? What is ESS? Now, if you see on the left hand side, you have cryptogenic stroke on the right is the ESAS. Interestingly, this was in Lancet 2014. The proposed diagnostic assessment was not specified in cryptogenic stroke. But in ESAS, you see the blue arrow coming up, showing you brain CT, showing non lecanine path pre-cordial ECG and cardiac monitoring for more than 24 hours and imaging of intracranial and extracranial supplying areas of brain in fast. So that is what would be the difference between a cryptogenic stroke and ESAS. This is a very beautiful slide. 
Let's concentrate on this for a couple of seconds. What I like to stress here is high risk cardiac source not detected due to incomplete evaluation, very <coughs> common. Typically, clinical and non imaging profile of high risk cardiac source, embolic source of undetermined source, non stenotic atherosclerosis, and most importantly, the thrombogenic atrial substrate in the absence of atrial fibrillation. And that is what is what I'm talking about. And that is what I'm interested in. Now please just think, is AF the only necessary substrate? No. Given the therapeutic implication, the hypothesis that covert AF is a leading cause of stroke in ESS is widely accepted that has led to the current practice of performing prolonged cardiac monitoring. But I'm sure most of you are aware that 70% of patients do not benefit AF even after three years of monitoring. This suggests that AF may not be the only necessary substrate for cardiac cardioembolism. Does AF cause stroke? The stroke causes AF and is AF associated with other factors of stroke? So, with all the evidence which we have and which I am giving, it is the AF which causes stroke, not stroke which causes the AF. Look at this another nice picture. You've got cartier atrial cardiopathy, atrial fibrillation, and thromboembolism. The driving force of thromboembolism is not simply atrial fibrillation, but rather underlying atrial tissue changes. With the dysarrhythmia, with the dysarrhythmia feeding back to both worsen the tissue changes, worsen the left atrial contractile dysfunction, thereby increasing the risk of thromboembolism even further. So please appreciate that. So recent evidence suggests that chamber dilatation, fibrosis, endothelial cell dysfunction, impaired myocyte function, they together are defined as atrial cardiopathy, a term used to describe structural, pathophysiological changes that precedes the AF. Now, I will not go into that, but this is just to show you, because I have a little shortage of time, uh, the other causes of atrial cardiopathy, I skip. Now, we've just done two or three of our own studies, just a passing remark on that. This is one of our study of the role of N-terminal PO-B, nt -po -B is different types of strokes. And we had 108 patients. And our conclusion was that nt -po -B and P level is a biomarker, as is an acceptable diagnostic value for distinguishing cardioembolic stroke from other stroke subtypes. Again, there was a very beautiful paper of the association with left atrial abnormality on ECG and vascular brain injury on MRI, which showed that a left atrial abnormality is associated with vascular brain injury in the absence of documented AF. This is another study though of our own 119 patients where we again showed that the left atrial enlargement is found in undermined undetermined group raises the possibility of cardiogenic regional stroke, at least in some patients. Now, this was the last study which, which you will present, which was done in 2021. This was a study of cardiac antipathy in various structures of acute ischemic stroke. And in this study, we took 110 patients, evaluated the risk factors, did the pro BNP, PD4 velocity, and left atrial enlargement. And what did we find? And this is what we found. We found that the atrial cardiopathy by left atrial diameter 
found equal increase in cardioembolic and undetermined group, but not that much in large artery or small artery. There is something is happening in the left atrium. This is to show you the same figure on both the sides. Then we try to measure the serum and pro BNP. And what did we find? That the proportion of patients with cardioembolic, other undetermined causes were significantly higher in patients with atrial cardiopathy by serum anti pro BNP criteria. And this is again the bar diagram which you can very clearly see. Again, what did we do next? We found, we did that the proportion of patients with atrial cardiopathy by ECG criteria or PTA V1 was significantly higher in undetermined as well as cardioembolic stroke in undetermined more than the cardioembolic strokes. So all these criteria which I have taught to you did suggest that cardial atrial cardiopathy is a different entity, is a different ball game than AF. So our suggestion is suggested that every patient of undetermined cause of stroke should be evaluated for atrial cardiopathy. Every patient should be evaluated with left atrial enlargement, anti-pro BLP, and PTF VR, which I do in every patient in my unit. These para three parameters will add to our management of atrial cardiopathy as a modifiable risk factor for stroke. So atrial cardiopathy is getting more and more a convincing mechanism of cryptogenic stroke. AF is always temporary. AF does not show a dose-response relationship. AF imparts different degree of stroke depending on risk factor. The arguments of cardiac atrial cardiopathy as a cause of left atrial thromboembolism is vast majority of AF occurs in setting of abnormal atrial substrate. And left atrial abnormality is associated with stroke independent of AF. We have a large number of studies going on, but I myself is waiting for the cardiac which should be available to us this year. I conclude by saying this concept of atrial cardiopathy rather than AF may better explain the phenomena of left atrial embolization. Rather than view AF as a necessary and sufficient cause of thromboembolism with factors in patients, it'd be more helpful to view AF and thromboembolism as common manifestation of an underlying atrial cardiopathy. In this formulation, the driving force of thromboembolism is not the dysensemia, but rather host of underlying pathological tissue changes. Thank you very much. This is my Apollo stroke unit. This is my hospital. And this is what I do in my hospital. Thank you very much for a patient caring. Sorry for killing the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ranjan. It was a very nice talk. I would first ask one question, whether if you find that there is a left, a left atrial cardiopathy, what will be the therapeutic implications of well, the uh, observation? Excellent, CS. I, I'm so happy that you asked me. Uh, CS, I, I, in my unit, and I'm quite convinced that if I find an evidence of 65 years old man who comes with a recurrent stroke, I do not find evidence of AF. I find that he has a left atrial enlargement even if he doesn't have the P-terminal force velocity increase in V1, he is pro anti BNP high. I tend to put him on OX. Okay. okay. I think, uh, yes, uh, yeah. you would agree, uh, the purpose of all this is uh, because to pick up more and more patients of cardiobolic stroke, which we said were more common and the more common cause of so-called ESAS, if 60 to 70 percent of these cells is by cardioembolic stroke, then I think my hypothesis may not be wrong, may be correct, and maybe we get more information in this year with the new cardiac study. Any more questions and uh, comments? 
from the audience so uh, do the guidelines promote the use of uh, novax for patients of car atrial cardiomyopathy uh, uh, anshu uh, anshu not as yet but i that's what i said i'm just waiting for a cardia to come maybe that will throw more light on this but i think uh, as i just said that guidelines have not but i think who will write the guidelines <laughs> is you and me we'll set the guidelines and uh, sir fortunately we have also had two theses on the same topic and uh, i agree with what you had uh, said that it is not af it is basically the atrial cardio uh, uh, pathy and the anti probmp which is very important for ruling out these kind of strokes i agree with you anshu and that's what i have been talking to preaching and i think people are now accepting my preach that there is something before uh, af and that is what we are talking about thank you so much thank you so much dr ranjan any more questions please uh so i had a one question myself is dr gp barman i had a one question uh, to professor ranjan and is paradoxical embolism uh, from an upstream vein via uh, a patent foramen oval <clears throat> is also an important cause for uh, cryptogenic stroke pfo and paradoxical embolism from upstream upstream veins so what is your uh, comment on this uh, as pfo i agree with you totally if you uh, see one well, of my slides it did mention that one well, of the common causes of paradoxical strokes is the patent foramen in a vein and that also comes in the differential diagnosis or really what uh, we are trying to treat the patient in कोई मिलना भी चाहता है कोई और आधार मेटाबॉलिक डिसऑर्डर लाइक एक्सिस डिजीज एंड दिस वैस्कुलोपैथी एट्रियल कार्डियोमायोपैथी दिस पार्ट हेलो या या सो आई थिंक वी आर रनिंग अ बिट शॉर्ट ऑफ टाइम सो आई विल रिक्वेस्ट Uh, all of us um, to let's conclude this session it was a very uh, brainstorming session that we had and thanks to the sponsors boringer inglem we could uh, come up with such a good session so uh, because uh, we have to move forward i'll thank all the chairpersons and the uh, speakers uh, for making this such a grand session we'll move forward to our next session which will be a common session uh will be in the hall a only for which the moderator could be dr swapnil so i'll ask him to come and moderate the further session good morning everyone uh this has been great start to the conference with first two sessions including paper presentations and amazing learning from the uh stroke uh, session uh i now welcome you all for the third session which is mrs meena dhamija oration uh, may i now request mr yogesh from omnicurist to share the slides for the chair persons uh, the chair persons please so the chair persons for this session uh, are uh, dr gauri devi ma'am dr jyoti bala ma'am and uh, dr lakshmi khanna ma'am so dr gauri devi uh, as i have heard a lot about her from uh, my professor dr ranjan sir she is uh, advisor department of neurophysiology and senior consultant neurologist at sir gangaram hospital new delhi she is emeritus professor of neurology at institute of human behavior and allied sciences delhi honorary advisor for neurological research at uh, icmr and former director vice chancellor at uh, nimhans bangalore uh, then uh, dr jyoti bala ma'am uh, she is director and head of neurology at fortis hospital noida and uh, dr lakshmi khanna ma'am she is consultant neurologist and neurophysiologist at sir gangaram hospital so i may now request the chair persons to kindly introduce to the speakers for this session good morning all of you uh, i welcome you all to the third session of dna con 22 and uh, now this is the third session of the day the session is mrs dhameja 
Meena Dhameja oration. And for this session, we have uh, eminent neurologist to introduce uh, the oration and orator. We have uh, Dr. Lieutenant General C.S. Narayanan to introduce the oration. So Dr. Uh, C.S. Narayanan has vast experience of services and armed services. He is head of neurology. He was formerly head of neurology at Army Hospital R&R, Dean and Deputy Commandant Army Hospital R&R. His area of interest are movement disorder and demyelinating disorders, epilepsy and stroke. Dr. C.S. Narayanan will, will be introducing the oration. Dr. C.S. Narayanan, please. Uh, thank Gauri, you. Uh, I'm Dr. Gauri Devi. I had some problem in the um, um, mic. Am I now on the screen? Yes, 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 yes Sorry. Sorry. Good morning to all. I was morning. trying to figure morning, it out. Ma'am. Ah, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. I think uh, about the oration, few words. Uh, uh, Damija had done a remarkable thing in introducing this um, oration. And I recall, I myself had given this uh, oration a few years ago. And uh, of course, the introduction will be done of the oration and of the speaker. But few words I would like to say about uh, Gagandeep. You know, all of us. Mr. Yogesh. Ma'am, you, you are not audible, ma'am. Ah, I think the organizers are muting me. Please tell them not to do that. Thank you. So I was telling about uh, Gagan. I think he has done remarkable work, uh, both in neurocystic sarcosis and in epilepsy. And today we look forward to his uh, uh, interesting talk, you know, visual aura. Hmm? Are they epileptic or are they migraine? So look forward to the introduction of the oration. And then uh, oration itself. Thank Sorry. you, uh, Gauri Devi, ma'am, and uh, Dr. Jyoti. It is my proud privilege and honor to speak a few words about Mrs. Meena Damija, who is the wife of Dr. Colonel R. M. Damija, one of the most senior and revered neurologists in our fraternity. Many of us have personally known uh, Mrs. Damija and are aware of her accomplishments. She was born and brought up in an army family background and worked as a social worker from a very young age. One of the most important quotes from a personal diary reads as, help always, hurt never. With this vision and motto, Mrs. Damija worked tirelessly for the upliftment of poor children and society at large. She initially devoted her time to teaching the children of soldiers in armed forces schools and later contributed as principal of the Bayes Hospital Welfare School in the Delhi camp. In addition to this responsibility, she was ever willing to support needy patients and their families in the garrison and beyond. Mrs. Damija was a religious and pious lady who donned the role of a supportive wife, mother, grandmother, besides being a warm friend to one and all with utmost dedication. All of us knew of her selfless love and she was an innocent and noble soul with an incomparable sensitivity towards fellow human beings. Meena Ji was always uh, aiming at perfection at work, but also had a magnetic personality. She was able to establish a special bond with every person that she came across. An avid reader, she used to collect religious quotation verses, and she was an ardent admirer of nature and used to exude peace and happiness. I will end with another quote from her diary, which reads, blessed are pure in the heart, for they shall see God. The oration is in the lovely, uh, loving memory of Mrs. Damija, who prematurely left for her heavenly abode in the prime of her youth on 29 June 2002. May God bless her soul. We would also pray for her soul to rest in everlasting peace. We have uh, Dr. Anshu Rotagi to introduce the orator. Dr. Anshu Rotagi, may I have yes. this slide? Introductory yeah, slide. Have slide for the... Yeah, no. Dr. Anshu Rotagi is Syria consultant at Sir Gangaram Hospital and professor of neurology at Gripmer and secretary of DNA. His area of interest is multiple sclerosis and movement disorder. 
Dr. Anshu Rothke is very eminent neurologist of the city. Over to you, Dr. Anshu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jyoti, and uh, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Gagandeep Singh, uh, who is going to present the, uh, Mrs. Meena Dhamija's uh, oration today. So, can I have the slide for Dr. Gagandeep, please? So, uh, well, this this slide is too small to uh, explain about the oration. Uh, I'll just uh, share with you. A, can I share my screen now? Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to have this oration by Professor Gagandeep Singh, and Dr. Gagandeep Singh uh, needs no introduction to this August gathering. Uh, he is MD, DM, uh, uh, Fellow of Academy of Medical Science and FRCP London. He is currently the professor and head of Department of Neurology at uh, Dhyanand Medical College, Ludhiana, India, and he has multiple fellowships to his uh, account. And he has been the Fellow of Royal College of Physicians since 2019 a fellow of the uh, National Academy of Medical Science since 2016, a fellow of Indian College of Physicians since 2014, and of course, a fellow of Indian Academy of Neurology 2013. His other affiliations include an honorary associate professor, Department of Clinical Experimental uh, Epilepsy at uh, UCL, Queen Square, London. And of course, he is the current president elect for Indian Academy of Neurology, and also the secretary general of Indian Epilepsy Association. And he is also a chairperson of the primary care task force for international legal epilepsy. And he has uh, 98 publication and his H index is about 21. And of course, he has been conferred with multiple awards, uh, which includes the uh, Madurai uh, Neurological Association Award in, 20, uh, in 1993, AC Patel and BC Mehta Award for the best original article for Japi in uh, uh, 1999, the Baldev Singh Oration Award, 25th Annual Conference of National Academy of Medical Sciences, the BC Bansal and Uma Bansal Oration, and the Palatusi uh, Advocacy Award uh, Leadership Forum, which was given by American Academy of Neurology, the GC Sanani uh, Oration for Association of Physicians of India, Bangalore, and a Master Teacher Award by Shine Chennai in 2020. So, uh, so we have a very eminent speaker with us, and we are all fortunate to hear from him uh, about the aura, whether it's epilepsy or migraine. Uh, so I would hand over to Dr. Gagandeep Singh to take it further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anshu Rotagi, for such a, um, such a nice introduction. Uh, I'm indeed honored to be in the midst of uh, uh, some of the best uh, neurologists, the DNA, which is indeed a very large body, and, and uh, some very senior neurologists. And I'm even more honored uh, with uh, the kind introduction uh, given by Professor Gauri Devi, who is my lifelong mentor. Uh, she's a lifelong mentor to so many of us. And she herself had given this oration many years back. So it's indeed a great uh, pleasure to be with you all in the midst of uh, these difficult times. In the meantime, <coughs> let me just uh, kind of just share my slides. Right. So... So the usual questions, can you see my slides and am I audible? Yes, yes, you are You are audible and slides are seen. You can see. Go ahead, please go ahead. So uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, uh, I would uh, at the outset uh, like to say two things. Uh, one is, uh, uh, of course, uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant General C.S. Narayanan has uh, very appropriately given, uh, uh, provided us with all uh, the details about uh, Dr. Mrs. Meena Dhamija, the dear wife, late dear wife of Colonel Dhamija, uh, who, who was with us in this world from 1951 to 2002, and whose motto was help ever and hurt never. And, and she was really a very active uh, personality with uh, a teacher by profession and later went on to be the principal of one of the army welfare schools. Uh, I think I spoke to Dr. Uh, uh, to Colonel Dr. Dhamija about um, a few days ago, uh, just, just to uh, get to know something more about uh, his late wife. And, and uh, I, I, I can say that uh, the memories 
were, were still really, really very live in, in Dr. Damija's uh, mind. And, and he spoke, spoke of her so fondly. So, so I think um, it's indeed a great honor to, to be presenting the, the 2022 Mrs. Meena Damija oration uh, of the Delhi Neurological Association. And the second thing I would uh, really like to say is uh, a big thank you to the executive committee of the Delhi Neurological Association and all the office bearers, as well as the organizing committee of the 2022 DNA conference. So uh, the topic uh, as introduced by the, by Dr. Rohati and uh, Dr. Narayanan is, uh, visual aura. And this is something that has uh, really ticked me in the last uh, few years. And I thought it would be appropriate uh, in this um, clinical audience to talk about a visual aura, because this is something that we often see. Well, not that frequently, but, but we do see, uh, you know, patients with these kind of visual complaints. And, and it is indeed a very difficult situation uh, sometimes to differentiate and, and to say very clearly whether this aura is due to migraine or is it due to epilepsy. So the essence of my talk would be, uh, you know, uh, to outline the differences between the visual aura in migraine and epilepsy. But then there is also an extended spectrum and I would uh, go on to discuss some of this extended spectrum and, and add a few personal cases and my own personal viewpoint on this uh, particular entity. Uh, just to begin with, the aura, the word aura is, is derived from Greek uh, language and it actually means a uh, vapor or a breeze. And, and uh, in, in, in the earlier times, it was thought that, uh, you know, the commonest aura that was described was indeed a somatosensory aura at that time. And it was felt that it was due to increased blood flow uh, and, and it was like a breeze. So, so, so that is how it was named as an aura. Uh, a couple of cases and uh, I mean, uh, I think everyone uh, can uh, try to figure out what is what here? So this is a 23-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who had uh, these kind of visual auras at least two or three in a day for the last 18 years. And, and what he would uh, see is a human black and white figure, right? And, and that would last for a few seconds and it would move horizontally in the visual field. Right. And he had some rare generalized tonic tonic seizures. And this is what the MRI showed a lesion, subcortical lesion in the left uh, visual cortex or posterior cortex or posterior quadrant, uh, suggestive of, uh, and there was a history of uh, neonatal uh, encephalopathy, probably neonatal hypoglycemia. And, and this is probably the sequelae of that. Right. A little more confusing, an 18-year-old uh, girl who had uh, these events about one to two per week in the left upper quadrant. This was also black and white, and she would see some circles or lines revolving, which would be formed. And very rarely in between these circles, she could see the faces of her family members. And this would just last for about three to five seconds, maximum 15 seconds. And there was history of uh, two generalized tonic-clonic convulsions over the last year, uh, over the last eight years. And, and her MRI again showed uh, a cortical subcortical lesion with some edema in the right visual cortex, right? So this is the second patient. Uh, both these patients were started on anti-epileptic drugs and, and they seem to be doing well with uh, well controlled, the auras were well controlled with anti-epileptic drugs. So suggesting that these were epileptic in origin rather than anything else. But this case is a little more confusing. Uh, this is the description by the patient of the aura would begin like a small star on a uh, dark background. 
uh, in the left upper quadrant, the star twinkle starts moving towards the right horizontally. Uh, it then begins to grow in size to the size of a tennis ball. And this all happens over 20 seconds. Uh, the patient also described that he was a little confused during and after this. And sometimes he would feel a fluorescent green computer text screen scrolling, scrolling uh, from up to down in the left upper quadrant. And this sometimes would uh, assume the shape of an LCD screen, uh, which replaced the window on the left side of his bed. And, he, and the patient clearly mentioned that he could see this regardless of whether his eyes were open or closed. Uh, and uh, when these episodes would occur several times in a day, this would be followed or accompanied by a severe headache, which could last for two to three days, and it could be on the either side of the head. This is the description given, written description given to me by the patient. And, the, and I asked the patient to draw or, or to illustrate what he saw. And, and this is what he sent me over the WhatsApp. So, so something that, like this, which grows in size, and he mentioned the size of a tennis ball and, and uh, the LCD screen, which he mentioned, uh, this is what he has shown. And sometimes he would have this uh, visual sensation of ants crawling. And then sometimes he would also see his mother-in-law and uh, uh, see her left eyeball of the left eye disappearing and then appearing, right? So, so these are the kind of, uh, uh, visual auras that the patient could see. And you can see somewhere in the left posterior quadrant, there is a calcified lesion uh, also seen on the MRI. Uh, and I'll come to the importance of this particular location in my later slides. Uh, and, and this patient incidentally also responded well to anti-epileptic anti drugs. Now, going back a little into the history, William Gowers uh, is perhaps one of the first in the late, uh, in the 18th century in his book, A Manual of Diseases of the Nervous System, was the first to describe the visual aura, right? And, and he described it as flashes of light, which were often multicolored, sometimes single colored, and red and blue were the most frequent. And sometimes they were more elaborate, you know, something like a face. He also recognized that uh, visual disturbances do occur in migraine, uh, although the, he never used the term aura to describe the visual disturbances in migraine. And this comprised of two things. One is the partial loss of sight and spectral appearances. And I'll come to what are spectral appearances a little later. So William Gowers also recognized, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, the Manual of Diseases of Nervous System written by Williams Gower is freely available on the internet as also several other of his lectures. And he also recognized that visual disturbances can occur as an isolated syndrome, whether of epilepsy or migraine, over many years. And, and when they are presented present as isolated uh, symptoms, just an aura, uh, this might closely resemble that of migraine. And he also uh, recognized that it is often difficult and can be confusing to differentiate between the two uh, because he wrote, when, patients, when the patient's account is all that we have to guide us, we must make our diagnosis from the general features of the case, not forgetting that one disease may unquestionably pass on to the other and then some attacks might be of indeterminate nature. So, so this uh, clearly underlines the fact that there, there were uh, important differences between migraine and epilepsy visual aura, but also sometimes the two could be confused with each other. And this is uh, a description, uh, a, a multimedia thing kind of described by one of the uh, patients to me. Uh, so, so these are, uh, you know, uh, multicolored. That's that's what Gower said, and that's what patients uh, with epilepsy often have. These are multicolored, uh, and and they kind of appear and then disappear. Now, this is another description by a patient, and I'll I'll just play this with you. And the patient said that there was something like this, which kept on moving, then kept on blinking, 
Uh, and, and indeed in literature, what is described was exactly what this patient described, a horizontal movement uh, of the object. And this horizontal movement of the object is very typical of an epileptic visual aura in comparison to a migrainous visual aura. So this is a description by the patient. Now, this is another description, a historical description. One of the first monograms on migraine, migraine as it was known at that time or sick headaches. Uh, and it was a monogram of about 180 pages by by someone known as Edward Living. And this is also freely available on the internet. He, he was from the King's College. And this is how he described the visual aura of migraine. And I think this, uh, this description is self-explanatory. It commences with a slight diminish, diminution of vision. Then the lower part, rather inclined to one side, appears as if hidden by something which is a luminous object. So something that comes, a luminous object that comes between the eye and the object, and this gradually enlarges, a half ring is formed by serrated lines of prismatic colors, uh, appears in the place of darkness, and in about three quarters of an hour, the appearance ceases and a violent headache succeeds. So this is a very apt description of a migrainous aura. Uh, and in describing a migrainous aura, we need to understand, understand certain terms. And I'm just list those terms here in this particular slide. What is photopsia? Just the occurrence of light flashes of light. You know, the older terms, the flashing, uh, the, the camera flash, which suddenly there was a bulb and it used to flash. So that is what a photopsia is, is like. And, and the term tichopsia or fortification spectrum are simply jag, zig, zigzag lines with a luminous border. And I'll tell what a luminous border is. And it resembles the fortification of a medieval town. So these, this, this kind of fortification, these spires, these uh, pointed conical things, that is what uh, in, in many of the European medieval towns, you would have these kind of fortifications and, and uh, the term fortification spectra is derived because of a resemblance with these fortifications. Scintillating scotoma is something more than the fortification. The ragged edge is the fortification spectrum, but when it is combined with the scotoma, which is scintillating more often than just being something black. So that is a scintillating scotoma. Phosphine is a different thing. It is just a phenomenon of seeing light without, without there being a stimulus of light. And it is attributed to a variety of causes, including ocular causes, retinal causes, uh, cerebral causes, brain causes, uh, seizures, migraine, and all of these. And, and you can actually feel, uh, you can actually see phosphines when you, you know, you just close your eyes and, and press uh, with your finger on the eyes, you will see a light-like sensation and that is known as phosphine. So that, that is the description of phosphines. Macropsia is when objects appear larger, micropsia smaller, telopsia when they are farther off, pilopsia when they appear nearer, and metamorphosia is when there is a change in the shape of the objects. These are father and son, uh, Wilfred Airy, who was the uh, royal astronomer in the 18th century, and one of the best historical descriptions, uh, including this diagram, was done by him and his son, who both had uh, migraines with aura as well as uh, typical auras without headache. And, and this is the classical description of the scintillating scotoma. You can see uh, it starts off as a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, small scotoma near the blind spot and then gradually increases, increases, increases. This is the entire scotoma. And you can see the fortification spectra which are scintillating and multicolored as well as highly luminous. So, so all these terms, this is a 18th century picture uh, drawn by um, Hubert Airy, the son of Wilfred Airy, both of whom had uh, typical auras without headache. And, and this is a very apt description. Uh, <clears throat> Just to again emphasize the point, the fortification spe spectrum, the luminosity, and this is how these appear in the fortification spectra. Uh, more similar pictures by the Irie brothers. 
And this is a description again, freely available on the internet, uh, a drawing by Babinski of uh, how his, one of his patients described the visual aura of migraine. Right. And this is a town uh, by the name of Narden in Netherlands. And, and when, you, when you are descending into Amsterdam, you can see this town. It is surrounded by lakes. And when the sun shines into the lake, you, you see something like the fortification spectra with luminosity. And this is also a, a very apt uh, analogy to the fortification spectra or the scintillating scotoma of migraine. And, and this is a multimedia presentation which uh, was uh, made by, uh, uh, I requested uh, one of my friends to make it. And, and this is how uh, uh, visual aura of migraine appears like. Um, so it begins as a small spot. You can appreciate the fortification spectra and the colored spectra uh, at the periphery of the scotoma. It gradually increases in size. And but what you can see is it is something that comes in between the eyes and the book, which uh, apparently this person is reading. It gradually increases in size. And you can see that it is the, the periphery is multicolored, has fortification spectra, and, and, uh, and there is a great amount of luminosity. Of course, this takes a much longer period. This is a very short uh, uh, period over which this has developed. It takes a slightly longer period as we shall see in the subsequent slides. But this is a typical description of uh, migrainous aura. So I have listed here the differences between the visual aura of migraine and epilepsy. Uh, so, so when we when we go to you know buy a house, we we look at three things: location, location, and location. In terms of differentiation between migraine and epilepsy as a cause of visual aura, I think the three important points are duration, duration, and duration. The aura of migraine typically lasts for about 15 to 30 minutes. It is always more than five minutes. And this is the distinguishing point between a visual aura of migraine and epilepsy. Epileptic visual auras are always short lasting, usually a few seconds and never more than five minutes. You can get good. rest of the things, everything, you know, there is a huge amount of overlap and, and you can get get uh, all kinds of things in both kinds of auras, right? But, but I think the duration is the most important thing. As you saw, uh, I mean, very often it is stated that you get uh, colored auras in, in the epileptic uh, visual aura and, and you get uh, black and white phenomena in the migraineous aura. But the first two patients I described were clearly black and white. They clearly saw black and white figures. So, so, so uh, color versus black and white uh, can occur either in epilepsy or in migraine. Of course, lateralization to one field, it is more typical of ep epileptic auras. It would, uh, migraine can vary from one side to the other side. So the side consistency, and then the spread and the gradual spread from the center to the periphery. Sometimes it can be the reverse. But uh, this is very typical of migraine and does not usually occur in epilepsy. Uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the, the uh, descriptions in literature of the epileptic visual aura. And, and this is, I have copied all the descriptions that were described in this paper in brain. And I have uh, uh, by various patients in this series of uh, epileptic visual aura or posterior quadrant or occipital lobe epilepsy. And this is how patients described. And I, I, I'm, uh, I have put them in different colors to emphasize that uh, visual auras due to epilepsy are often multicolored, right? So I think it's extremely important. And when I see patients, this is a habit which I have made in the last few years is whenever I see patients reporting visual aura, I, I have uh, uh, a set of color pencils and uh, markers in my clinic in the outpatient department. And I hand them over and I give them a piece of paper and, and I ask them to draw. 
just underlining the fact that a picture is worth worth a thousand words and the way they draw it we, the patients just go and sit in a different room and they draw these uh, auras i think it is just fantastic and and it really uh, is is really very informative of course it is important that these patients should maintain an aura diary and then there are also scales which have been formulated and validated for rating the visual aura uh, as migrainous or epileptic and this is one of them so just to emphasize uh, how uh, important it is to ask the patient to draw the visual aura some patients with migraine might just have the aura and not the headache so that is known as typical aura without headache i think it the literature reports that this happens in about 4% of the cases i know some very very senior neurologists who have uh, described to me that uh, uh, they have a typical aura without the headache uh, and and in one of the cases it was related to a toothpaste uh, uh, which was being used and once the use of the toothpaste uh, was stopped the aura also auras also stopped so these patients these people do not have headaches and this is uh, in in my experience i have seen about 3 4 such patients and you know the history is very typical in their younger periods uh, younger life that means in their 20s and 30s these patients would have migraine with aura but later on the headache disappears and and all that they have is just the auras right so that is typical aura without headache and this is a beautiful uh, diagram which has been drawn by one of the patient one of my patients and she has actually put down the time so 132 the aura begins then 133 how does it increase in size till 158 when the aura actually starts subsiding so this is a beautiful description on one page which one of the uh, one of uh, uh, the patients Uh, made it and then sent it across to me uh, of how her aura progressed and she has clearly uh, put in the time in minutes uh, of the progress of the aura so this is also known as acephalgic headache or silent migraines and which may occasionally be prolonged or persistent in which case it is important to rule out cerebral infarction headache can also be a feature of uh, epileptic seizures and both ictal and post ictal headaches have been described and these have been uh, incorporated into the international classification of headache disorders including the third version and and there are some very typical features of it i mean it's important that these you know something like melas which is which can both cause seizures and and can cause visual auras and migraine so so that is something that uh, needs to be excluded so it is better not accounted by any other icht3 diagnosis but both ictal and post ictal headaches have been described and there is this unique phenomenon of migralepsy in which an epileptic seizure occurs so there are two things that are important for migralepsy one is uh, it can only occur in migraine with aura it does not occur in migraine without aura and the seizure usually occurs within 1 hour of the onset of the migraine right so this is a description of the cortical spreading depression how it happens and how does the uh, visual aura progress often so if it involves the occipital cortex it leads to a visual aura but occasionally the cortical spreading depression which we know to be the pathophysiological basis of migraine can spread anteriorly uh, to Uh, to lead to a somatosensory aura and then it can lead further and it can progress further anteriorly uh, to lead to what is known as hemiplegic migraine and if it goes even further then it can cause an aphasic aura so all these kind of auras have been well described in migraine it is just the cortical spreading depression which was uh, in the 1940s and 50s by leo who who made some elegant uh, experiments in rats and described the cortical spreading depression in a variety of con conditions 
and, and this spreads anteriorly at the rate of three millimeters per second. And, and this is known to be the pathophysiological basis of migraine with aura. So often people who have visual auras can also have somatosensory auras. They can have hemiplegic migraine and they can have an aphasic aura, right? Uh, I will just, uh, one of my, Good friends in the Delhi Neurological Association is uh, Dr. Debashish Chaudhary, who is, uh, uh, is, is a uh, very well-known international expert in headaches. And, and this is a picture which I had uh, uh, clicked in Rishikesh when we were uh, together for a meeting. And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can see uh, the difference between the two pictures, you can see there's a lot of grain in, in the picture on the left, your left, uh, left of the, uh, the picture on my right, yeah. So, so this is known as visual snow, which is often a visual accompaniment in migraine. Uh, there are, uh, um, you know, now diagnostic uh, criteria uh, available for visual snow, which have been clearly elucidated. There are a number of non-visual symptoms, including tinnitus, which to my surprise is noted in, visual snow is a very common condition and has been noted in about 40% of patients who have migraine and visual snow. And then there is this 26-year-old uh, girl who presented with her first seizure. Uh, she was tying her shoelaces and then she moved her foot back beneath the chair, but she continued to see the image of her, her shoe. So this is palinopsia and, and this is a very typical uh, feature. And uh, when we scanned her, she had a, a typical lesion in the occipital cortex, uh, which was attributed to tuberculosis. And, and you have, you know, you have, this is a diagram of the posterior quadrant uh, of the brain. Uh, you know that there is, uh, this is the calcarine fissure, above that is the cuneus. Uh, below that is the lingual gyrus, uh, anterior to it is the fusiform gyrus, the lingual gyrus itself uh, goes anteriorly as the parahippocampal gyrus and above the parieto occipital fissure is the precuneus. And all of these areas, things like visual snow and palinopsia uh, usually occur when the, when the fusiform gyrus is involved, right? Uh, typically, if the supracalcarine cortex or the cuneus is involved, you would get an inferior quadrantinopia. If the lingual gyrus is involved, you would get a superior quadrantinopia. Just a couple of uh, minutes more, you know, this is a photograph of Lewis Carroll. His real name was Charles Ludwig Dodson. And he is known and, and is famous for having authored Alice in Wonderland uh, and, and Alice through the looking glass. And he clearly described, I'm sure uh, you would remember from your school having read Alice in Wonderland. You know, he describes uh, Alice who chases a rabbit on a hot sunny afternoon. The rabbit goes into a, into a hole. Uh, Alice follows in and she keeps falling down into that hole going deep, 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 and, and eventually comes to a room. And there, there is a lotion which she has and she becomes very small. And, and, and uh, that leads on to a door which you can see here, uh, but she doesn't have the key to that door and, and which is on a table. And therefore she e you know, eats a cake. Uh, there, is, there is a cake lying there which says, eat me and she eats the cake and she suddenly becomes huge, right? So micropsia and metamorphosia and macropsia. And, and indeed, in that, uh, in in the book, she says, "What a curious feeling! I must be shutting out like a telescope, right?" And and uh, uh, and then she goes into that door, and there is uh, that. That's the entire. Uh, it's a wonderful story. These are some pictures uh, from Alice in Wonderland, the book. And incidentally, there is there is a big buzz that Lewis Carroll, the author, had migraines. Question was. Did he have migraines with aura? And, and uh, was Alice in Wonderland inspired by his auras? And, and um, uh, you know, there is a lot of literature. In fact, uh, he used to maintain diaries and about 13 of those diaries are available. And 
clearly, if you see the entries in his diary, and, and these diaries are also available on the internet, uh, he clearly had moving fortifications followed by headache. So he clearly had migraine, uh, migraine with auras, right? So this is something uh, very interesting and going into the history, looking at all of this, reading all of this is indeed a great pleasure. Uh, and and uh, with this, one more thing that I would like to present is the Alice in Wonderland syndrome. Now, now uh, Alice in Wonderland syndrome is a phenomenon which is often reported in adolescents in a variety of settings, including uh, migraine, including epilepsy, including uh, drug overdose, psychosis, and so on and so forth. This was first reported by an American neurologist, Carol Lipman, and who described this in 1952, seven cases. And, and these are some of the descriptions, you know, See, case one, some hours after the attack of a one-sided headache often occurs a sensation of the neck extending out on one side for a foot or more. Uh, then case six, I get tired of pulling my head down from the ceiling. I could have pulled it down all night. So, so this is also something that can happen in migraine. It can also happen in epilepsy. It has dis been described in encephalitis associated with infectious mononucleosis, and indeed we have seen some patients in our clinical practice of this. The term Alice in Wonderland syndrome was actually this, you know, first used by a British psychiatrist by the name of John Todd, who described six cases. And these are the description of, of those cases. Some of them had epilepsy and some of them had migraine with aura. So this is something that we need to always Consider we should not brush it aside. It is a definite condition which can be encountered in both the conditions. And, and, uh, and, and this is something that we should not discount in our patient. Oh, nothing, this is nothing. You, you're, you're probably not having anything. This is indeed something that can happen. And, and most often it happens due to involvement of the extra striate cortex. Lastly, you can get as described in this uh, report by, again, by William Gowers, as early as 1879, which he goes on to describe a patient who had a typical aura, which appeared to be migraineous to me, but responded well to bromides and belladonna. So you can have structural lesions of the brain and, and uh, the aura could be exactly like the visual aura of a migraine. And this is one such case series uh, by Gordon Plant and his colleagues. And they have in that particular paper listed some characteristics which describe, uh, which can indicate that this is not a simple migraine with aura, but it is um, indicative of some underlying structural lesion in the posterior quadrant of the brain. And, and the authors go on to state that the onset of aura for the first time in the fourth or fifth decade, if the duration of the aura is less than five minutes, if there is a change in frequency, if they are side locked, they're associated with a visual field defect, uh, that is an indication that there might be a structural lesion or a tumor. And, and it is important to image such patients. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, a patient listening. I, I think uh, I have been able to convey my feelings that there are indeed some distinguishing features uh, between the visual aura of migraine and epilepsy. Uh, ideally, they should have been named differently, but, but uh, I think at this stage when people are so used to using the term aura, it, 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 it's probably not possible, but indeed, as you realize that there is a considerable overlap and it is also important to know what are the, what is the extended spectrum of visual aura conditions like palinopsia, visual snow, and the fact that visual auras, typical visual auras of migraine can be associated with structural lesions of the brain. Thank you. Thank you, one. Uh, Thank you, Gagan. It was fantastic. 
you know, when I first uh, uh, saw the title, I was wondering what will Dr. Gagandeep speak for one hour on this subject? Most fascinating and the way you went into the history uh, and you quoted my uh, book, Alice in Wonderland, which I love to read. And you know how she strings and then becomes long and so on. And I think uh, very importantly, you emphasized the difference between migraine and epilepsy aura. I think as a practical point of view, it's very important for uh, diagnosis, management, etc. And uh, another thing you mentioned about how uh, people as they age, you know, the migraine characteristic changes and only visual aura remains. I'm one of those examples. I do get aura occasionally without a headache, which I used to get earlier. Then I spoke to Professor Osselton and he said, people who have migraine for a long time, their visual cortex sensitivity changes, you know, so that they can even exposure to sunlight can uh, create those aura. So there may be some permanent changes in people who have migraine. I don't know if the same thing would happen for epilepsy with visual aura. I think it's worth perhaps looking at it. And I'm fascinated by your patience for putting such lovely pictures, you know, the way they drew all the aura, remarkable. Please uh, thank all of them from our behalf also. And Gagan, it was an extraordinary oration. Remarkable. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And the DNA should be complimented for inviting you for this oration, this important oration. Thank, thank you. you, Gagan, and thank you, DNA Organizing Committee. Again, a thank great you. pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, expert comments. And also, again, a big thank you to the entire DNA, the executive committee, and the organizing committee. Thank you. Sir. Thank, thank, you. Thanks thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir, for a great visual representation of visual aura. Uh, moving on to the next session, I now... Thank you, Dr. Mark. Gagandeep. Thank you for a very excellent oration. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now hand over the moderation to Dr. Devnath, sir, for the next session. Good morning, everyone. The next session in Hall A, session four, will be uh, Dr. A.D. Shahgal Oration. He was a great uh, neurosurgeon uh, who belonged to Rajasthan. And the chairperson for this session will be Professor Yadaljit Singh and uh, Dr. C.M. Malhotra. Can I have the slide for Dr. Daljit Singh? So, uh, Professor Yadaljit Singh is the director and head of uh, GB Panth Hospital in New Delhi. And uh, Dr. Sivam Malhotra is a senior consultant in the first Apollo Hospital in New Delhi. Now, I would like uh, Dr. Yadaljit Singh and Dr. Sivam Malhotra to kindly take over the session and proceed accordingly. Dr. Yadaljit hmm. Singh, please. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, after this wonderful oration by Dr. Gagandeep, it is time for us to move on to uh, yet another very decorated, prestigious, celebrated, and well-recognized oration. I think ever since the DNA exists, its association with Dr. A.D. Sagal exists. And uh, DNA is actually very proud to have had oration in the name of Dr. A.D. Sagal. Uh, we, it gives us a chance annually to remember Dr. A.D. Sagal. I think each one of us have had uh, individual experience, at least those who are seniors, with Dr. A.D. Sagal for his commitment for neurosciences, development of neurosciences in Delhi, and uh, his enthusiasm in uh, building up academics uh, for uh, Delhi as a, as a group also. I also recall personally having met him a number of times, uh, commendable knowledge both in neurology and neurosurgery, and his you know, enthusiasm to help the people out of the way, which uh, I think most of us who knew Dr. A.D. Segal uh, would agree with me. Number of orations which he has started at number of places about which the family even didn't know his uh, contributed financially. Um, uh, economically as well as uh, emotionally to support number of them. So in order to do that uh, oration today, 
um we have uh, dr rajesh acharya and dr satnam to do the formalities of the oration i would first invite dr rajesh acharya uh, to tell us more about dr ad sagal followed by dr satnam who will be introducing our orator yet another legend uh, in uh, neurosurgery in india dr vk cha over to dr uh, acharya thank you chair person esteemed seniors and dear colleagues i feel honored and privileged to introduce dr ed sahagal oration to this august audience and gathering in fact i met dr ed sahagal first time in june 1992 then i was a general surgeon in a remote village of rajasthan one of my friends called me to gangaram hospital stating that if you learn lap coli in this hospital from dr chobe and go back and practice you will be a successful general surgeon in rajasthan but as fate would have it there was no vacancy in general surgery at that time in gangaram hospital so i met dr ed sahagal since there was a vacancy as a jr in neurosurgery department and dr sahagal in his first meeting with me asked me if you are genuinely interested in neurosurgery join gangaram hospital and if you are interested in general surgery join my sahagal nursing home in kailash colony i said sir i want to become a neurosurgeon i applied earlier at jaipur sms hospital i cleared theory examination but could not go get through the practical so i started working with him after 3 months of working with him my pathway of life changed that i would tell later on first let me introduce dr arjun dev sahagal was born at ganganagar in rajasthan 1932 he did his mbbs from indore in 1957 he joined neurosurgery residency at cleveland clinic usa in 1958 he certified the american board examination and became consultant at cleveland clinic in 1963 in spite of a promising career in us he moved back to india in 1964 and he started and headed the department of neurosurgery at gb pand hospital then he started neurosurgery at sir gangaram hospital later he established sagal neurological research institute in 1969 and he started neurosurgery at holy family hospital four institutions he started neurosurgery and headed these institutions and at sir gangaram hospital he was head of the department from 1968 to 2006 he was member of the board of management he was president chairman of the legal cell of our hospital and he was also chairman of the organ transplant committee of our hospital in fact he popularized private practice in delhi and north india at that time he was president of almost all the societies in india he was president of neurological society of india he was the founder president of indian society of stereotactic and functional neurosurgery he was president of neurotrauma society of india healthcare federation of india he became vice president of international college of surgeons he established first ct scan in north india and first mri in north india his contributions were many to name a few he popularized intrathecal steroids he even invented his own sagal's stereotactic frame he modified the gardner's neurosurgical chair and gardner wells tongs used for skull traction he had numerous publications he attended almost every conference and he was either on the dais or if he was in the audience he was the center of attraction of any discussions he helped and inspired numerous neurosurgeons including me and i believe dr satnam and many others will also agree today we pay homage to him for his unusual zest vigor of life he was multi talented he had leadership qualities he was fearless speaker his humor was tremendous in spite of missing him losing him 16 years back we still remember him miss him today and forever thank you 
warm regards to all of you thank you dr acharya so uh, for this wonderful introduction of dr sahgal i mean one can continue more and more about him he deserves much more than what uh, we can put him on words so let me invite uh, dr satnam the current president of uh, dna uh, to introduce the orator of uh, this year dr d sahgal oration dr satnam singh chatta over to you. satnam good yeah good morning everyone it's a matter of can you hear me hello can you hear me yes huh. yes we can good morning everyone uh, it's a matter of great honor and pride for me to introduce my teacher my mentor professor ek jain professor oops i've gone to the last slide Professor V K Jain is not only a neurosurgeon par excellence, but he is an excellent teacher also. We have learned a lot from him, and he is very fond of teaching his, his students and used to be very particular about taking classes. On a more formal note, uh, Professor Jain did his MBBS from prestigious King George's Medical College in 1974. and then he went to nimans for his mcs which he passed in 1981 he was appointed as assistant professor at nimans in 81 till 84 and then he became associate professor in december 84 till he left the institute in 87 he joined sanjay gandhi pgi lucknow as additional professor in 1987 and then he was promoted as professor of neurosurgery in april 99 till he left the institute in february 2010 he joined sir gangaram hospital as chairman department of neurosurgery in february 2010 and uh, till uh, uh, september 2012 uh, before when he joined devki max hospital saket as senior director of the uh, hospital of department of neurosurgery there he went for micro neurosurgery uh, fellowship to fujita university japan and he has been a visiting fellow to international neuroscience institute hanover professor sami center he has been a visiting professor to fujita university japan visiting professor to university of geneva department of neurosurgery there he has been an examiner for award of neurosurgery degree at national board of india and many universities in india he has authored a book on cranio vertebral junction anomalies the indian experience published in 1997 he has authored many articles book chapters in many international and national publications and journals he has made numerous presentations and guest lectures in national and international forums he has been the president of neurological society of india president of skull base society of skull base surgery society of india president of indian society of cerebrovascular surgery president of neurotrauma society of india president of up uttarakhand neuroscience society vice president asian congress of neurosurgery vice president of asian australian society of neurological surgeons he has many contribution to sanjay gandhi pgi neurosurgery department he was the one who started mcs course there in 1989 he has been the head of the department for more than a decade he was the one who started collaboration with japanese neurosurgeons japanese neurosurgeons used to come there for they used to spend one year and work there and indian neurosurgeons faculty would go to japan for learning and uh, working there and we used to learn we as a student used to learn from japanese neurosurgeons also since it was a new department established there so he was instrumental in establishing several protocols for the ot micro neurosurgery icu he was the one who started 8 am pre operative session in the morning every day where he used to be there 10 minutes before the 
uh, session. So every student had to be there at 8 a.m. sharp or even before that. And we used to have a good grilling from him. I had the privilege of being his first student from Sanjay Gandhi PGI. He started several neurosurgery packages there. And he was the one who started computerized data back with ICD coding way back in 88, 89 there. His contribution to the field of neurosurgery, he has worked enormously on CV junction anomaly. He designed and published art, the, of uh, artificial C1 arch technique. He has worked on hypermobile AAD, genetic, its genetic association, treatment protocol for CV junction tuberculosis, treatment protocol for AAD with carry malformation. He has worked on trans thoracic surgery and 360 degree stabilization of thoracic spine. He has worked a lot on a benign subarachnoid hemorrhage. He has been an avid player of basketball. I don't know whether he still tries his hands on that or not. Uh, here he is seen with Dr. Abdul Kalam, the president, and uh, Professor P. N. Tendon releasing a book on neurosurgery. Here Dr. Jan and Mrs. Jan are being honored at a conference. And these are some old pictures. Uh, Mrs. Jan with their two little daughters in the Sanjay Gandhi PGI campus when it had just started in 1988. This is 19, uh, 2004, Dr. Jan and Mrs. Jan in their lawns. And uh, this is a picture, uh, I think, way back in 1990, uh, 1989 or 90, when I was also there and the operation theater, Dr. Jan is sitting here, Dr. Piyush Mittal, Dr. Sneel Gupta, who is now head of the department, PGI Chandigarh, Arun Singh, uh, my class fellow. I am missing in this picture, probably I was the one who was clicking this picture. And uh, Dr. Jain, uh, outside the department, was very friendly with all his residents. And in the department, of course, he was very strict. And uh, here he, the residents are seen dancing at his home, a bonfire, and having a good time with him. This is, sorry, Dr. Jan and Mrs. Jan with their two lovely daughters. They are grown up and married and well settled down. Mrs. Jan is a creative author and editor. This is Dr. Jan seen here with his large family of students who all are very fond of him and have learned a lot from him. Uh, this is young Dr. Jan seen with his colleagues. This is uh, Professor D.K. Chabra and very young Dr. Deepu Benerji there standing and a few other faculty from Japan. This is Dr. Jain interacting with his residents and his staff and his lawns. And Dr. Jain is seen here with his friends in conferences, meeting them. He's fond of interacting with people. Uh, this is the new operation theater started in uh, Sanjay Gandhi PGI department, which has been dedicated and uh, named after Dr. V.K. Jain. And uh, Dr. Sanjay Bihari also started two orations in 2019, uh, one in the honor of Dr. D.K. Shavla, another one Dr. V.K. Jain, an annual regular feature, fourth uh, oration was held just last year. So great honor to both of them by Dr. Sanjay Bihari. And uh, thank you so much. Over to chairpersons. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satna. Now over to sir. So, I am trying to share my uh, slides. How do we do it? Green button there. Yeah, I have done share. I am seeing all of them here. Yeah. How do we do it? You have to Can select, you and, select and double click them. Is not double open. click on the slide? Yeah. Right. 
Thank you. No. Just a minute, yeah? Go to the front, please. Yeah, right. Slide share. No, we can see the slides. Yeah. But yeah. Yes, sir. Please start. We can see it. Dear Dr. Dalit, Dr. CM Malhotra, respected seniors, my colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Satnam, for your kind words and elaborate description. Uh, I am really overwhelmed by your introduction. I met this great man, Dr. Satnam, in 1989 when I was attending a world, ninth World Congress, International Congress on Neurological Surgery in Delhi. And after that, I met him many times in conferences. And I really admired him. And many people admired him at that time. He was in private practice, but he used to attend all the conferences. He established a very good prestigious department at Gangaram Hospital at that time. I remember dur during 1998 time, he was convincing many people and trying to establish Neurotrauma Society of India. And finally, he established Neurotrauma Society of India and he was the first president of Neurotrauma Society of India. And then around 2000, he became president of Neurological Society of India. And everybody used to meet him in the conference. He was a very jovial, very energetic and very friendly person. And if you talk to him, he really used to exude confidence. And I'm very lucky that I personally knew this great personality. I thank the executive committee and the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity of giving this oration in the name of this great person. Friends, it was in 1949 that Professor Jacob Chandi established the first neurosurgery department in Asia in Valor. I'm sorry. Uh, it's being hidden by this photographs. I don't know how to go. So he initiated the first neurosurgical training program in India at Christian Medical College in 1957 in Valor. So neurosurgery progress in initial years was a little slow. Gradually in various parts of the country, neurosurgical centers developed. I joined a neurosurgery in 1977. Uh, I don't know whether you will believe or not, at that time there were only 180 neurosurgeons in country in India and this included trainees at that time. So I was, my friend used to call me, I have one upon 180. But today, if you see All India Institute of Delhi, that had, that department itself has 75 neurosurgeons, of course, including the trainees. There are about, uh, I think, uh, 20 faculty members and um, 35, 45 trainees. When I joined neurosurgery, that time the colleagues used to tell anybody who wants to become neurosurgeon is a crazy doctor, crazy person. And my seniors used to tell me that it's very hard work. Don't ask for food and don't ask for going to the bathroom for 36 hours. Have contracted stomach and distended bladder for this period of time. And what did we have for diagnosis at that time? We had plain X-ray, and geography, ventriculography, and myelography. There was no neuroradiologist. All these procedures were done by us. And I will tell you some situations, what is to happen. Suppose a patient comes with the history of raised intracranial pressure in the evening without any localization and is drowsy. What would I do? I will take him immediately to the uh, radiology and do an angiogram, right carotid angiogram. We would find evidence of hydrocephalus, then take the same patient to operation theater, do a bar hole, and then bring back to radiology and do a ventriculogram. 
which would show posterior fossa tumor and then again take the patient to operation theater and do a VP shunt. So the single patient would take our whole time, whole night, and in the morning we will be free after doing shunt. And another scene for head injury patients, when serious patients of head injury with pupillary dilatation would come to the emergency, the dictum was that we should not uh, miss any extradural hematoma and we should save all extradural hematomas. So the patient would be immediately taken to the OT without any investigation. Exploratory boreholes would be put first on one side where we suspect there can be a extradural hematoma. Then if there is no the hematoma there, then we put exploratory boreholes on the opposite side. If there is no hematoma there, we put two more exploratory boreholes in posterior fossa. I think uh, so it would again take so much of time. It appears so crude management if you take today's management when we can take a patient immediately to CT scan room and we finish the diagnosis within two minutes. And what were the tools available for neurosurgeons? There was only headlight available. We did not have any microscope. And the, there was no bipolar cautery, only monopolar cautery was available. And there was retractors were hand held by the assistant and the same assistant who had done that head injury or posterior fossa tumor in night would be there to assist in the morning and the surgeon would be sitting doing posterior fossa in sitting position assistant would be holding the retractor cannot see the side sometimes it will fall down sometimes it be too much high we had uncontrolled suction and irrigation was by a large syringe so and what was the documentation? How to tell others what one has done? It was all descriptive and diagrams were made by hand. We did not have photographs. We did not have videos which are available today. Today we have all these photographs and videos which can explain things in a much better way. Gradually, all these things have improved. And now, uh, first degree CT, first uh, CT scan in 1980, then second generation, third generation. And now we have three dimensional CT scans. We have MRI scans which are three dimensional. We have functional MRI. We have digital subtraction and geography. We have PET CT scan. We have PET MR. These are the diagnostic tools which are available today, which have developed over the period of time. And we have microscopes available. Initially, there were first generation microscope, which knobs used to be open, but now we have very good microscope, electromagnetic brakes and all those, and then we have micro instruments. So a lot of things have developed during the last uh, 30, 40 years, and these things are now available in most of the places. So I'll just give you some examples what we can do with these instruments and microscope. Mm -hmm. See, this is a patient who has this deep seated frontal tumor and with the help of microscope and micro instruments, I could remove it completely. This was grade one astrocytoma. And you see after three years, this is glyos portion and it's completely removed and patient is doing very well and there is no need of radiotherapy also. Another case of third ventricular craniopharyngioma with hydrocephalus. We have gone transcalosal and removed it completely with the help of microscope and micro instruments and this is post-operative after seven days. Complete removal of the tumor. Another right thalamic tumor with hydrocephalus again went transcalosal and removed this tumor completely. This was grade two tumor and it received radiotherapy also. And you see after two years, a small portion is seen here. No hydrocephalus, no shunt done. So this patient is doing very well. Now about a small CP angle tumor. You see this microscopic recorded view. We can see these are the lower cranial nerves, tiny lower cranial nerves and tumor is seen somewhere here. And this is the dissection of arachnoid. So with microscope and recording, you can show everything now, what was not possible earlier. So this is the tumor which is on 7th, 8th nerve complex, vestibular schwannoma. And this is the medial portion of the 7th, 8th nerve. And here is the bone where it is going inside the internal acoustic canal. We need to drill this bone to find that tumor. See, fine dissection of the arachnoid. You can see 
pica and its branches over here and these are the lower cell nerves ninth nerve 10th nerve and accessory nerve superior petrosal vein seen here which should be preserved again dissected nicely and this is the rectoid which is being cut so we need to drill this portion we'll we are drilling it completely drill to open the internal acoustic canal now after drilling just cutting the dura of the internal acoustic canal and then we would make a incision in the tumor this is dura which is being cut so after cutting the dura we will make incision and then we will do little bit of intratumoral decompression making the cut on the tumor this is intratumoral decompression removing chunks of the tumor and then once it becomes little small we have to turn it remove it now we are just turning it and removing that is the lateral portion of the tumor and this is the eighth nerve the caustic nerve and seventh nerve is here and this is being turned medially tumor and nerve the being dissected from the nerve over here it is the internal caustic canal from where tumor is being removed and uh, you see this is almost completely removed from internal acoustic canal so then we will turn and remove the medial portion also completely dissected now it is being turned over here and you see the continuity of the nerve here over here this is the eighth nerve and above that is the seventh nerve uh, yeah you can see both the nerves here in between them there is a small tiny vessel running that is the vessel so this is complete dissection of the acoustic neuroma which was small and there is a small vestibular connection over here and retinoid which will be cut and it will be completely removed so with the help of microscope and micro instruments we can do such beautiful work and remove the tumor completely and this patient this tumor has been completely dissected off the nerves and we remove it completely and this patient seventh nerve and hearing is intact post operatively and his vertigo subsided now there is another big cp angle tumor you see this is a big cp angle tumor in a 14 year old boy which was incidentally found because ct scan was done after he has fallen down from the stairs and he has no deficits so we again removed in the same way and after surgery when we did the mri this is the small tiny tumor which is remaining so dictum today is that preserve seventh and eighth now even if you have to leave about a millimeter uh, sheath of tumor along the nerves and this was then treated with gamma knife so nowadays we have gamma knife which is available which was not there at that time now we talked about uh, ct scan and mri only anatomical imaging we have imaging beyond imagination now beyond anatomy you see this we can see where is the motor cortex and what is its relation to the tumor we can see where is the speech area and what is its relation motor cortex relation to the tumor and we can find out the speech area also and we can do tractography and see the relation to the tumor you see this tumor over over here see it is pushing the pyramidal tract medially it's not going through the tumor and then when we remove this tumor completely after surgery then you can see this tract has become straight and patient has no neurological deficit so you can see anatomical and functional things also then we have another facility which is called neuro navigation with the help of which we can localize tumor very well before surgery and make a incision a skin incision and bone cut accordingly exactly over the tumor and don't go here and there 
Then we have per operative MRI available here. You see this case. This is the preoperative MRI. This is first intraoperative MRI. Partial tumor has been removed. And then this much is remaining. So you can go again and do this much removal of tumor. And this is the final removed operative MRI where total tumor has been removed. Another example, see this preoperative picture. This is the tumor and you have removed partially and done MRI during surgery. And then you remove remaining tumor and do complete tumor removal. So complete tumor removal can be achieved. So we have nowadays preoperative MRI also available in some centers. Coming to vascular surgery, there was a time when it was considered very difficult to do aneurysm surgery. Nowadays, with the help of microscope and uh, micro instruments, you can do very good surgery. This is a paraclanoid aneurysm. You can see this cutting the retina here. You can see internal carotid artery, it's bifurcation. Now we are cutting dura. We will drill the anterior clinoid process to expose the intracavernous portion of the internal carotid artery and go to the proximal portion of the neck and then clip the aneurysm. So this is the drilling of anterior clinoid process and this is removal of anterior clinoid process and this is the roof of optic canal. So there is some bleeding from cavernous sinus which will be stopped by surgery cell. We are cutting the distal neural ring. We have already cut the roof of optic canal. And this is the optic nerve. This is the surgery cell kept on the cavernous sinus here. We have already cut the distal neural ring. Now we are dissecting the proximal neural ring. This is the internal carotid artery. Here is the PCOM. This is the anticoroidal artery. Here is the artery, which is near the proximal dural ring. And we are dissecting there. This is the ophthalmic artery going under the optic nerve here in the optic canal. So aneurysm, proximal neck is somewhere here. So we are dissecting arachnoid for getting to the proximal neck. And this is the proximal neck of the aneurysm and distal neck is somewhere here. Just dissecting with micro instruments, micro scissors. Distal neck is somewhere here. And this is the complete neck and there is aneurysm going back. That is the aneurysm. This is the optic nerve. Now, this is the distal part of the neck we are dissecting. And I think dissection is almost complete. And laterally, we had already dissected. Medially, we have dissected. And we can just put a clip over there. And this is the internal carotid artery, which will be formed. And this is the ophthalmic artery, which is spared. The clip tips are lower down. And that is the aneurysm. Now the aneurysm has been excluded from the circulation and internal carotid artery is patent and well formed. And the, this is another case where there is a small aneurysm in the carotid cave over here, which you cannot see right now. This is the internal carotid artery, bifurcation. This is choroidal artery and this is the PCOM artery. Aneurysm is not seen here. The optic now, and we have to see this optic now going in the optic canal over here. Aneurysm is hidden here under this dural fold in the carotid cave. So we have to do remove the anticlinoid process from here also and can I, a roof of the optic nerve we have to remove by drilling. This is drilling going on. Drilling that portion. It's a very small micro del which is used in the microscope with the help of microscope. Hands have to be really steady, otherwise it will injure the internal carotid artery or the optic nerve. So it has been drilled. Now we have cut the dura over the optic nerve in the optic canal. And this is the proximal. You have to 
dissect for proximal internal carotid artery. Distal dural ring has been cut. Then we have to cut the proximal dural ring. And then this is the proximal artery going into the common sinus over here. Now we can see some aneurysm here. We have to go to the proximal neck. So we are cutting the proximal ring of the dura over here. And now you can see the complete aneurysm. Complete aneurysm is seen now. Very small, cherry-like, but angry looking. Slight rough movement and this will just rupture and you won't be able to do anything except clipping the artery itself. So this has been dissected and we put a small clip here. And we have to see that other arteries don't come in the blade of the clip. So this has been placed here. So vascular surgery has improved so much. So we can see pre-operative angiogram, such large aneurysm and post-operative angiogram, aneurysm gone and vessels intact. Another case, pre-operative angiogram, large aneurysm and post-operative angiogram, no aneurysm. Another case, this is pre-operative angiogram and this is post-operative DSA. And further developments that we can trap the aneurysm and do bypass, which can be slow, Flow bypass or high flow bus bypass. You see this aneurysm, this is the aneurysm, the CT angiogram, aneurysm from the cavernous portion of the internal carotid artery. This one was operated, trapping was done, and STA, MC, anastomosis was done. You can see this superficial temporal artery supplying blood to the middle cerebral artery. And this is CT angiogram, superficial temporal artery supplying blood to the middle cerebral artery. So we have trapped the internal carotid artery, which don't you don't see in the neogram now. During the last few years, interventional neurosurgery has come out, come out with a big way, in a big way. And we can do aneurysm coiling. You see this pre-procedure, this is the aneurysm, and after coiling, this is the aneurysm. No aneurysm seen. This is large aneurysm where flow diverter was put and this aneurysm is not seen anymore. In an AVM, arterial venous malformation, embolization has been done and it is not seen anymore. Carotid artery stenosis, pre-procedure and post-procedure, you see nice flow and this is carotid stenting which is being done regularly now. Another thing which has just recently come in is thrombectomy. You see this middle cerebral artery is not seen at all. And after thrombectomy, this you can see it completely. So interventional work has increased a lot and is being done regularly. And it appears to me that vascular neurosurgery seems to be disappearing at least in private hospitals and is being replaced by interventional neurosurgery. Nowadays, when a patient comes to private hospital, and there's a choice between coiling and uh, um, uh, operative obliteration or clipping. They say, Pura silk hood jayega, kya fayda hai, coiling kara li jaye. So, I think uh, clipping is mainly now it is done in uh, institutes. Coming to spine surgery, when I was a resident at that time for lumbar spine, there was only laminectomy and discectomy. And for cervical spine, there was only laminectomy. After some time, we started doing anterior approach, doing discectomy only. And then uh, we did not have seen CM also at that time. And there was no instrumentation. We did not have screws or any rods at that time. Now, we have got a lot of instruments. And in cervical spine, many times at that time, only laminectomy was done and patient used to develop quadriplegia. Sorry to interrupt you, the HR person kindly, we are running short of time. So kindly manage accordingly. Okay. How much time is remaining, please? We have, we have already short about 10 minutes, please. That is the five minutes maximum. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So this is the cervical spine. You see such a big, large compression here. And 
instrumentation has been done and it has been decompressed. You see this? Another cervical spine. This is big decompression and instrumentation. Another large OPLL. You see this OPLL? This is large OPLL. See in CT scan. Again, decompression and large, this thing has been done. So big surgery can be done nowadays. You see this OPLL. Again, anterior decompression is required. And you see we have done this anterior decompression and fusion. In CV junction, I'll just go quickly. You see this preoperative fixed variety and this is post-operative. We have done transarticular fusion. Another case where we went posteriorly but could not do and then we have gone transoral and this is the thing preoperative this is postoperative and we have moved this here move down so we have let's remove the projecting part another case large fixed and tart axial dislocation i have gone transoral and removed that portion of the bone and reduced it and fixed it Another case, similarly, you see the dislocation. There is side-to-side -side dislocation also, and we have to remove this bone from transoral approach and reduce it. This has been done, you see, reduced, removed this bone also, and side-to-side -side dislocation also reduced. Another case, so now we have uh, spinal instrumentation available, minimally invasive spine surgery. See, previously, such a big scar and a lot of blood loss. Now we can do just small incisions and do minimally invasive spine surgery. We have available 3 dc arm, we have O-arm, we have neuronavigation. We can do a lot of surgery for scoliosis. Now endoscopy has come in a big way for hematoma removal, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, intraventricular tumors, pituitary tumors, and even for spine surgery, a lot of endoscopy is being done. And then we are doing a lot of epilepsy surgery. We are doing surgery for movement disorders, deep brain stimulus. And we have good neuromonitoring for brain, for spinal cord and for nerves available here, which is used to, during surgery. Surgery becomes very safe. So where we have reached, preoperatively, we have excellent anatomical and functional orientation by 3D high quality CT scan, MRI, functional imaging, 3D, DSA, PET, CT, MRI. And then per operative, we have got so many facilities now. Neuro navigation, excellent binocular coaxial, microscopic vision, micro instruments, ICG and Doppler to see blood flow, per operative use of floor sense, neurophysiological monitoring, endoscopy and endoscope assistance, and QSA, spinal table, 3D, C arm, O arm, everyday evolving spinal instrumentation, per operative CT scan and per operative MRI scan. So many facilities are available. Robotic surgery is also around the corner. However, these facilities are available right now in mainly metro cities and big cities and have cost attached in private hospitals. Problem of availability and affordability will continue for some time. What is the future? In future, we will have general neurosurgeon or specialist neurosurgeon with so many facilities coming in and so many subspecialities developing in neurosurgery. I think in future, we will, need, we will have neurotrauma surgeon, separate skull-based surgeon, cerebrovascular surgery, interventional neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, spinal surgeon, stereotactic and functional surgeon, neuro-oncology surgeons, endoscopic surgeons, peripheral nerve surgeons, and epilepsy surgeons. All these have separate societies also nowadays. So future probably will be belong to neurosurgeon following a subspeciality rather than a general neurosurgeon. That is what is the future. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. And I think the future is for a specialist neurosurgeon. Thank you so much, Dr. V.K. Jain. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you, uh, Dr. V.K. Jain for his nice presentation. Now I like uh, Dr. Daljit Singh, the chairperson, to conclude the session. Thank you, Dr. Daljit Singh. Okay. Thank you, sir, for uh, showcasing the journey of uh, neurosurgery from an era of uh, 60s to 2022 now. 
and i'm quite uh, sure you have done a great justice to the oration thank to dna also for inviting sir for choosing dr vk jain to deliver this um, uh, prestigious oration um i mean i'm quite sure when he mentioned that uh, rather than general neurosurgeons there is a time coming of will we be having a spine surgeon or maybe lumbar surgeon or maybe thoracic surgeon subsequently l1 surgeon or maybe l2 surgeon we don't know where would be heading on but as the time passes on i think that becomes inevitable you know sequely of evolutions which we have no control of it if it is like that it will remain like this or uh, that is how the evolution of time has uh, happened over the period of time i'm quite sure there will be people who will do only cervical area and then the people who will do only thoracic area there will be people only cp angle let's see how the things go on we have to live in the time where we have born and we have to learn the techniques and things of our time for the benefit of our patients that is what we do thank you so much sir for delivering such a wonderful oration over from now from now on dr malotra around i'm sorry i didn't get to yeah, see you danjit good morning you did not allow me to speak yeah, yeah. i was looking for no, you at this one please i'm extremely face. sorry i satnam good to see you sir it was a wonderful presentation and you reminded us of the days of intrography to intraoperative mri and i am i am i am happy to see dr chawla's photograph in one of your satnam presentation and uh, you see how in last 30 40 years from x rays plain x rays and if i remember correctly dr chawla used to stand on my head to get a scan done or angiography done and i i see satnam i'm i if i remember correctly satnam was my junior in a, a in the same college and yes things have changed one of a very small incident i would like to share with you guys dr sagal oration because it is a dr sagal oration and we were in practice in uh, uh, south delhi from last uh, 30 40 years uh, me a uh, me when i shifted from batra hospital to apollo hospital one day i got a call from dr sahgal saying uh, beta can you come and see one of my patients i said it's a, it's a honor so i went there and to my surprise there was there was the, the patient was on ventilator and there was a that was the only patient in the nursing home so i was really uh, uh, Hesitant to ask, कि सर ये क्या मतलब आपकी मतलब प्रैक्टिस को क्या ये सब हो गया है? तो कहते हैं कि बेटा साला तुम सब अपोलो वाला साला all my patients have taken. But then he said, CM, you did the right thing. Because neurosurgery, what we used to do in colleges or institutions, have come to a long way into the practice, and in practice. state of the art neurosurgery is being done regularly dr jain will uh, dr dr malotra please feel like to wind okay. up the session we are really ready okay, sir. okay doctor sorry uh, sorry for that sorry for that dr ranja i am sorry because uh, this this is uh, just a emotional time uh, thank you very much thank you let me speak and uh, complete the session uh, this This is it. From now, uh, from, from oh, thank now, thank you, Dr. Ranjan, for stopping me at least. <laughs> uh, uh, from now onwards, uh, we will be having two parallel session. One will be at Hall A, and another will be at Hall C. So the Hall A uh, moderator will be Dr. Neelam, and Hall C will start with Dr. Sopnil. Kindly, Dr. Neelam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. good morning everyone so uh, thank you for the wonderful session sir and now we are moving forward to our uh, fifth session of the day uh, which would be uh, chaired by dr uh, manmohan mehndi ratta sir uh, dr ak mahapatra sir and dr atul prashad sir uh, i would request to share the chair person slide please uh, so uh, dr manmohan mehndi ratta 
is a senior director and senior uh, consultant department of neurology uh, bl kapoor uh, hospital and max healthcare group uh, dr ak dr ak mahapatra uh, sir is a director uh, of aims bhubaneswar and uh, dr atul prashad sir uh, is principal director and hod of neurology uh, blk max healthcare so i would like to request dr manmohan mandiratta sir dr ak mahapatra sir and dr atul, atul prasad sir to kindly uh, chair the session thank you good morning uh, i think we are running late and we all know that this session very interesting session and we will have uh, three speaker in this session and first speaker is professor sarat chandra everybody know about him and he is going about talking about uh, the epilepsy and this is a very important thing we all know that epilepsy surgery has started about 25 years 30 years back very big way and functional neurosurgery and epilepsy surgery is a part of new armameter so i think without any delay we should request professor sarat chandra to start his talk because we are already 20 25 minutes late so i think that should be nice to hear him thank you sarat thank you dr mahapatra for uh... so can i speak sir dr mendrata can you start yes can sir you... dr sarat dr chandra please please it's the right thing that a senior neurosurgeon introducing his own colleague that's very nice yeah please so thank you very much sir let me just share my presentation is my screen visible sir no yeah. yes so sir. at the outset yeah sir very nicely very nicely yeah so at the outset i am very grateful to the dna con for giving me this opportunity and of course my respects to prof samapatra prof samendrata and dr atul prasad who are the chairpersons for this session and i have been asked to speak about uh, neurostimulation in epilepsy and also something about minimally invasive epilepsy obviously this is a big topic and i will try to complete as early as possible and i know that i have, my time will be strictly limited by the chair person so i will finish in 17 minutes so we all know that epileptogenic focus are actually networks and we have understood a lot of different things that is the lesion necessarily need not be in the center of the zone and it could be away from the zone and there could be multiple networks which are expanding over a period of time so you could have multiple nodes in various parts of the brain so the concepts are changing and it is becoming more and more complex over a period of time but if you look at surgical strategies we could have something like a receptive surgery very similar to a chip in a computer becoming faulty and we have to remove it or we have to disconnect it from the surrounding structures or we could do something like a neuromodulation which would be a majority uh, portion of my own talk here now if you look at overall outcomes we know that the outcomes of epilepsy surgery is not homogeneous uh, so we could have cases which are complex which do not have good outcomes and then we could have cases which are straight forward and can have good outcome what is more important is that if we do not treat this straight forward cases over a period of time because these are dynamic there will be a shift to the left now neuromodulation is approximately required in 50% of the cases of complex cases where there is no substrate seen and that is the reason why the neuromodulation workup should be performed in a tertiary center because we have to ensure that there are no surgical substrates there so we know the definition of drug resistant epilepsy which is failure of two drugs well combined appropriately chosen for a minimum of uh, well there is some sound can i request to mute the sound please uh, so we all know about weep trial uh, but uh, most important uh, uh, we all know the uh, uh, impact that the weep trial has in drug resistant epilepsy and we were also fortunate enough to publish this very highly quoted recited trial in a new england journal of medicine where we showed that the benefit of surgery is not only 10 times more than the medical therapy but if the children do not get treated early there would be a rapid deterioration of their cognitive functions 
I apologize for this uh, very clustered kind of a uh, present uh, slide. But if you look at drug resistant epilepsy, the first step is to do an MRI. So if the MRI is positive, rest of the workup becomes easy. If MRI is negative, we repeat the MRI and try to find a lesion. And that is where we go in for more complex investigations. Now, neuromodulation is to be performed when there is no reasonable hypothesis which has been developed despite MRI, despite all the advanced procedures, or there has been a surgical failure. More recently, uh, uh, procedures like RNS is also indicated for substrates over the motor strip. Now, this is a paper we published some time ago, but it was very useful for us because here we showed the role of outcome as a concordance between PET and SPECT and not MRI. So having a concordance between PET and SPECT, of course, allows us to develop a very strong hypothesis and it also may allow us to do invasive EEG in certain section of population. Now, if you look at neuromodulatory techniques, we have invasive and non-invasive. And invasive, we have DBS, vagal nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, RNS, less effective are hippocampal and cerebellar. Non-invasive are also available, and I will be briefly touching upon it. Since my topic is also stimulation, I would also be briefly showing the role of stimulation through a CEG, stereoencephalography, to produce habitual seizures, to confirm the hypothesis. Firstly, speaking about vagal nerve stimulation, it's the most widely performed uh, neuromodulatory procedure. More than 100,000 people have undergone this procedure. And as shown here, there is an increase of outcomes over a period of time coming to approximately 50 to 60%. The complication rates are minimal because it's an extracranial procedure. And most important, there is an improvement of overall quality of life in terms of memory, mood, verbal skills. In fact, VNS has been advised even for depression in certain countries. So if you do VNS, the overall mood improves of the patient. So again, this is a long-term study which was recently published and you can see all the parameters which affect the quality of life have significantly improved. Now this is, if we consider VNS as a separate drug, we should not consider it as a surgery. So we should think, think of it as a lifeline, as an additional lifeline drug. And in that way, it has an advantage over other drugs like levetiracetam, which can cause depression. And it does not cause all the other complications which may be associated with multiple anti-epileptic drugs. Now, uh, it has also been now recently approved for uh, pediatric age group, leading to about 90% reduction in uh, the seizure frequency. And you can see again, there is a steady increase of the outcomes over a period of time in this long-term study for pediatric intractable epilepsy. Similarly, there has been a very important study called the PULSE trial, which again showed that a combination of vagal nerve stimulation with best medical therapy is much more superior than the best medical therapy itself. So the whole perception changes when we consider vagal nerve stimulation as an adjunct to the drug. There is disturbance again. May I kindly request people to mute their speakers? More recently, there have been uh, devices. Can... More recently, there have been devices which could monitor your cardiac rhythm uh, in cases of patients who have ictal tachycardia before seizures. So, summarizing, it's the most commonly used device. Surgery is relatively straightforward over in two years. Uh, it can be used both for adults and children, elevates mood, less invasive than DBS. It's definitely expensive, but less expensive than DBS. Uh, and the obvious issues are that the battery has to be repeated every four, five, six, seven years. So just to show a brief surgery, how it is done. So this is a patient where we didn't find any substrate. So give a cervical incision. And the reason I'm showing is when we expose the vagus now, every neurosurgeon is uh, familiar with exposure of vagus now. But when you expose the vagus now for this procedure, it is very important for you to preserve the vasa nervorum of the artery. Otherwise, if you lead to devascularization of the artery, that may not lead to proper efficacy of the vagal nerve stimulation. So here you see when we are exposing the vagus now, we are holding it by the sheath and then carefully dissecting it without disturbing the vasa nervorum. And then of course, we loop the electrodes around the vagal nerve, which is a bit tricky and requires some experience. And then we put 
uh, the uh, generator in the chest area and then we program it so programming starts after 2 weeks now for patients who have severe lennox just start who have multiple drop attacks we developed this new technique of endoscopic assisted corpus callosotomy with commissurotomy and here for the first time we described a combination of callosotomy with anterior middle and posterior commissurotomy and with this we were able to achieve 100% improvement in drop attacks and a significantly higher improvement in other seizures now briefly speaking about dbs we stimulated the anterior nucleus and uh, uh, basically we initially perform a low frequency stimulation followed by high frequency stimulation so this is a case where we had done so initially we produce a driving rhythm to ensure that the dbs is connected to the area of anterior nucleus and then produce a desynchronization at 150 or sometimes even at 200 or 250 hertz which leads to stabilization of the brain waves and we actually see the eeg stabilizing once the dbs is put on so santes trial is the stimulation of anterior nucleus of thalamus which was a multicentric trial which definitely has shown the superiority of dbs over uh, just uh, any other technique just stimulation and this was a double blind trial now it's important to understand that when we consider neuromodulatory techniques very few patients are seizure free but there is still a significant impact on the quality of life because there is a reduction of seizures seizures by 70 80 90 percent and these are the patients who do not have any other options the adverse reactions in dbs definitely are more uh, than in vns and uh, one of and it has been approved by the fda for all the clinical utilization now if you look at the ad advantages obviously it's it's an effective neuromodulation but obviously it's more expensive than vns and i think one of the shortcomings of dbs is that it is more prone to cause a depression so while vns can cause mood elevation uh, dbs in combination with a drug like levetiracetam can actually precipitate depression in some patients but again you know there are uh, uh, in the, every patient has to be individualized now before i end neuromodulation rns is something which is not available in india but i would like to give a brief idea so we have a generator with combination of electrodes where it stimulates Uh, the epileptogenic area and kind of knocks it off, and this has now been approved for clinical use. And if you look at long-term studies, it's most effective wherever there is a failure of invasive EEG, or where there are multiple foci, or there is a neocortical epilepsy, and more recently, when we have lesions over the eloquent cortex, where the patient is concerned about hemiparesis, that is where we can also do RNS. And like other neuromodulatory procedures, we can see that there is a sustained improvement. over a period of time and now we have long term studies up to 10 years this is a recent study which has been published and there is a sustained and increased improvement over a period of time like other neuromodulatory procedures similarly this is a very important study which has been published recently which shows that an early performance of rns in patients with drug resistant epilepsy leads to better outcome so definitely rns is promising has a longer battery life but the problem is it's very expensive not in available in india it costs about 25 to 30 lakhs so i don't know even if it's available how many of our patients will be able to afford this hippocampal stimulation could be considered in certain indications wherever we have a non lesional hippocampal disease or there is a significant concern for decline of verbal memory and again like other neuromodulatory procedures if done properly can lead to about 50 to or 50 to 70 percent improvement in seizures. Now, for historical interest, cerebellar stimulation has actually shown very good outcomes, but somehow it has been given up. And we should all understand that cerebellum plays an important role in epilepsy. Now, this was a patient whom we published more than 11 years ago. It was a hypothalamic hematoma in cerebellum who presented with status, and then when we removed it, patient had become completely seizure free. and this has got a large number of citations right now even though it's a case report so now considering non invasive stimulation techniques obviously they're not as effective as invasive and the range of efficacy varies from 20 to 30% but obviously the advantage is that you could it's non invasive and you could do it in patients who cannot undergo invasive procedures so summarizing neuromodulation it's a third line of treatment for drug resistant epilepsy it's a safe and adjuvant treatment options are available 
it's it's I would say it's quite effective. Consider if you don't consider the angles, ILA grading can lead up to ninety percent of seizure outcome. That's why it should be considered like another drug, and uh, procedures like VNS can lead to better cognitive outcomes. So the future is quite exciting because what would be the future brain targets? And there are so many other targets which could be developed for neuro uh, stimulation. Now for India, obviously the cost concern is the biggest, and also the improper advice given to the patient because when you show something like a pacemaker, the patient. can you know sell the property or even poor patients may be forced to undergo this procedure and that is why it's very important for the surgeon to tell the patient that it is by far a less better option than a proper open resective epilepsy surgery and that is the reason it should be done in tertiary institutes because that is where the patient can be worked up completely to ensure that there is no epilepsy surgery substitute believe me we have seen cases of venus done even in cases of mts and such uh practice paradigms should be strongly dis discouraged so now ending my talk i would like to show you one video where we put scgs so history of ectal by so polyspike and slow so you can see this patient had mr negative but the video is showed bilateral bitemporal onset mr was completely normal the dynamic meg showed localization to the left side the lorette so impaired immediately and we did ectal spec as well as the pet and with this we got bilateral temporal localization so we placed about 11 electrodes and this was guided robotically as you can see we have now done robotic procedure in more than 300 pet cases this video demonstrates the technique of ecg which is otherwise not required in case of but and this is how we drill and place the ecg electrodes the length of the it's all available on the irole uh, uh, youtube videos and then we use both spontaneous seizures and uh, stimulation in order to reset the left temporal lobe and we were able to spare the dominant hippocampus so this is a spontaneous seizure with an ecg intact and this is a stimulation so we stimulate once the patient has a spontaneous seizure so that we get the can double confirm the epileptogenic focus more recently we are doing scg guided uh, uh, rf lesioning so we put scg and then we burn we stimulate it produce seizure and then burn it inside itself it can be done by the bedside so all the surgery can be done at the bedside itself now concluding these we have done till date 2000 cases of epilepsy surgery we have published over 300 papers we have established a center of excellence for epilepsy and we have published in high impact factor journals including enegm and nature we have developed new techniques for the first time in the literature and they have been now followed world over like robotic guided rf lesioning of hypothalamic hematoma endoscopic hemispherotomy now is accepted world over it's come into textbooks this is a textbook by john hopkins with a forward by dr yasar gill and more recently this came out in the cover page of jns where we demonstrated a bloodless hemispheric disconnection so for me it has been a great sense of satisfaction to see an era where the hemisphere was personal physically removed uh, to an era where we can do bloodless hemispheric disconnection so with this i will end my talk i would like to these are some of the basic sciences papers which we published and we have given multiple uh, demonstrated surgeries in multiple places in india and abroad along with multiple cmas like to acknowledge all the members of epilepsy surgery team especially doctor uh, i think we should stop now because yes. uh, it's okay i know the uh, time is over so because I'm, if you all speak for 20 minutes there will be no time for discussion i have finished in 17 talk. minutes sir my talk was for 17 minutes it's uh, exactly 18 minutes okay uh, dr mendrata you want some yeah. questions somebody to ask ask yeah i think we can have the questions together because the three topics but if the delay it happens then everything will be finished if everything goes late then there will be no time for discussion uh, anyway, so what do you I, Uh, I suggest I, you can take couple of questions, sir. Question Since now, I can question now because if okay. everything is delayed, then nothing, no question will be asked. It's a very important oh. topic. Any okay. question from the audience? Yeah, one doctor Sagar Mehta has raised hand. I saw that. If, uh, are they asking question? Uh, he raised hand. I don't know. Yeah. Otherwise, I have a comment. I have a comment. 
yeah please and I, see i was talking about cost the bone marrow transplant allogeneous bone marrow transplant cost about 30 lakhs when the horse horseptin receptor injection came for the breast cancer in a year 25 lakhs have been used liver transplants cost about 30 to 40 lakhs so i think we have a subset of people those who can afford for it so cost should not be our pro diabetes are about 7 to 8 lakhs so cost is a factor but it should not be the only factor because large number of people in india can afford for it so when sarath was telling cost we should also think that people are doing bone marrow transplant for a long time in private even at aims bone marrow transplant cost over 10 lakhs and liver transplant cost money so we should uh, always say it is available but may not be all section of society can take it another comment i would say the past nsi conference I attended 1979 80 the cerebellar stimulation for epilepsy was presented by dr kanaka and those days even in 60s and 70s the madra center was doing amygdala stimulation amygdala hippocampus stimulation and cerebellar stimulation so stimulation there for a long time, but the technique and the infrastructure and gadget software and all these things are better. So now we are getting very good result. We all must congratulate Dr. Sarath. And if there is no other comment, Dr. Mendrita, because I thought yes, sir. cerebellar stimulus in India for a long time, but that had gone out because the technique was those days not that modified and uh, things are much better now. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the valuable uh, comments on the talk of Dr. Sarat Chandra. He has done a wonderful job. Wish to thank, yeah. sincerely thank Dr. Uh, thank you, sir. Dr. Dr. P. N. Ranjan for uh, asking us to chair this session. And with me is my colleague, Dr. Atul Prasad. We are sitting next door, but Omicron instructed us to sit in separate rooms. So we are on the same floor, just next door, but but uh, trying to connect with each other through video. Now we have a talk by Dr. Manjari Tripathi. Dr. Manjari Tripathi is a very dear colleague and she is uh, our uh, Secretary General of Indian Epilepsy Society also. And she is nationally and internationally acclaimed neurologist and epileptologist in the country. So I will at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I will request Dr. Manjari Tripathi to give a talk on NORS, that is new onset refractory status epilepticus. We all face challenges and she will tell us how we can handle these challenges. Mandri will appreciate if you can finish in 16 Yeah, the, the thing is not allowing me to share the screen. Uh, greetings to all of you on Vasant Panchmi, uh, especially uh, my teachers and colleagues. Um, it is indeed wonderful to have this program on this particular day. Now, one must understand that NORS is, of course, a huge conspiracy by a group of uh, dysfunctional neurons. And uh, this conspiracy is absolutely devastating for families and patients who have this condition. Now, as its na name implies, it's a refractory status epilepticus. So it has already reached the stage of beyond 30 minutes of continuous convulsions and they have not responded to your benzodiazepine and one first line agent so benzo plus a first line agent and the favorite first line agent nowadays is levetiracetam or maybe valproate or phenytoin and the patient is still convulsing but then this is the generic definition of a refractory status so what is so specific about norse now we know that when we manage status, we have to give a first line, which is uh, really a midazolam for us at AIMS and phenytoin or levetiracetam. But the NORS patients, they are going to be on higher drugs. They would have crossed the barrier of levetiracetam, lacosamide, phenytoin, valproate, and they would have made us reach to the intravenous agents and made us reach into electrophysiology by connecting the patient to continuous EG. So management wise, NORS is already requiring higher standards and higher resources for management. So that's the broader pers perspective. But then definition wise, here's a case. He's a young man who's, you know, well into 
21 years where he should be going and, you know, uh, finishing his studies and going into work. But however, he develops all of a sudden, out of the blue, focal seizures with impaired awareness, which don't stop and then go on and on and on with the convulsive status epilepticus for 21 hours or more. And he reaches us 21 hours later and he requires sedation, he requires an ICU, he requires an EG. So basically it was a young man in a family where something stuck out of the blue and he's ended up in uh, requiring monitoring. And monitoring shows these tonic episodes um, which occur sometimes on the right side, sometimes on the left. And there, there are these generalized period, uh, periodic uh, you know, pleds which are occurring. And then later on, he goes into this uh, slowing. So definitely he has had some event. His imaging, this is not his imaging, it's a representative imaging. So the imaging may be normal. In his case, it just showed few hyper intensities in the white matter, but it may show, you know, changes in the classroom. It may changes show changes in the white matter. It may just show some atrophy if it's done later on. Now, we investigated him for almost everything, including herpes in the CSF. We did his antibodies in the serum and the CSF and almost fungus and all the workup which was there. There was no, you know, nothing which came positive. He was treated empirically with antivirals, with the autoimmune, you know, immunomodulation, immunoglobulin steroids. And then, of course, he received uh, even, uh, you know, uh, 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 advanced uh, cyclophosphamide treatment, but he died after three weeks. So what happened on his death was that looking from the other side, from the caregiver side, the parents were not at all prepared for this. They had not even envisaged that something which hit their son who was completely normal could take away his life. This entity was described in 2005 in a paper which was published in the Annals of Academy of Singapore by Wilder Smith. And you can see here, there's a failure of extensive investigations to reveal anything and catastrophic outcomes. So though this entity was described, you know, in a publication format only in 2005, I'm sure we had been seeing these patients even before this. So as you can see here, his series showed uh, so many deaths. And really, if you look now, the deaths can be up to 30%. So 30% of them are going to die. It's really a horrific condition to have. So how do you define it apart from the fact that there is refractoriness, well, these people should not have a prior history of epilepsy. There should be no pre-existing relevant neurological disorder. They should be completely clear in their structural, toxic, and metabolic causes. So you have to have investigated them for these. And of course, there is a related entity called FIRES, which is a subcategory of NORS, where the febrile infection could occur, you know, within the prior two weeks or 24 hour period prior to the onset of status. So really, these are not people with epilepsy or any neurological condition. I urge all, all of you to visit the website norseinstitute.org, which really gives a lot of information both for the clinicians and the patients, uh, the caregivers. So basically, we have, in a nutshell, you know, super refractory status. We have autoimmune conditions, which, which are negative in the first 72 hours. Uh, of the evaluation. So you should have 72 hours where you've sent in all the investigations and hopefully receive the reports, which are all negative. And of course, the status is continuing. A majority of cases can be cryptogenic. So again, this is a very good pictorial representation where you see that uh, there is a negative family history. There is negative antecedent history. Uh, except for the fever, which may be there. Majority of them are males, like I showed you. And then there can be fever, there can be gastrointestinal illness, there can be upper respiratory tract, there can be just headache. And then you have the status coming in. And then they are left with sequelae in the 70% which survive with drug resistant epilepsy, neurological deficits, cognitive impairment, and behavioral issues. And they enter into a chronic phase of the disease. Now, this tells us what are the common clinical clues we should be looking for for specific etiologies. If it's an inflammatory and autoimmune encephalitis, we suspect 
uh, you know, we have to look for paraneoplastic and or other non-paraneoplastic autoimmune etiologies. And, uh, you know, that's a separate seminar by itself. Uh, we do the VGKC, the NMDA, the GABA, the GAD, the glycine. We, in the older person, we, uh, or even young girls, we send the paraneoplastic profile. And the clinical clues for each are there, whether it's the paraneoplastic or whether it's the NMDA or the VGKC, which will present with uh, facio-brachial dystonic seizures. And then we also send uh, rule out infectious etiologies. We send a pan viral profile in the CSF. Uh, there could be specific clinical uh, findings like in the varicella zoster, ataxia. Uh, we look for genetic causes which are coming up in a big way and there are certain genes which can present with NORs and fires. So you should be sending this genetic profile specifically for SCN1A, uh, PCDH19, CADASIL, mitochondrial and POLG uh, mutations. So really it involves a lot of uh, this part of it. And if the patient has had a very aberrant response to lacosamide, which you've given, then suspect a Dravé syndrome. If the patient has had history of hepatic involvement, suspect a POLG. Uh, if the patient has had migraines before, suspect a mitochondrial uh, or cadacel etiology. So investigations in all patients, of course, you are going to send the bloods for, uh, you know, all kind of metabolic as well as toxic uh, investigations and autoimmune workup you're going to do an mri brain and sometimes you may have to do specific uh, protocols particularly swi um, to rule out small bleeds uh, you would have sent a pan viral profile uh, you would have sent uh, you know bacterial and fungal uh, it, uh, you know uh, investigations in the csf uh, chest x-ray uh, particularly in these days you have to do covid because that's another thing which can bring on norse and uh, you would have done a, a toxicological screen. In our country, I've had a patient who presented with NOS who's, uh, who's a young girl whose mother was feeding her camphor for some, as some Ayurvedic prescription. So really you need to look at essential oils, particularly eucalyptus oil, which is so widely used in our country, and camphor, um, which could bring on uh, this kind of status. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have to uh, investigate for all possible immunocompromise. Um, uh, it's all there on this uh, flow chart here. Um, you may have to do a whole body pet, a brain pet, which could give you uh, clues to autoimmune or paraneoplastic etiology. Uh, you would have to send porphyria workup. Uh, you would uh, also do an MR spectroscopy, particularly if you're suspecting a mitochondrial uh, and then, of course, uh, the most expensive would be probably the genetic workup. Sometimes we do end up doing a brain biopsy in some of our patients where everything has yielded negative and the caregiver's consent. So how do you manage these patients? Well, of course, if you find the etiology, you're going to manage it uh, accordingly. But if you find no etiology, you have to send up all the workup, including the autoimmune, and you have to start them. You've ruled out infection, so you've re definitely ruled out herpes, you've definitely ruled out fungus, and you've got your India ink, which is negative, you've ruled out uh, a bacterial infection. Uh, you're waiting for other things to come in. Uh, you must start, and the patient has failed all the anticonvulsants according to status protocol. So you end up with a refractory and a super refractory patient and immuno uh, therapy with methylprednisolone, which we probably use uh, quite frequently and immunoglobulins. Uh, we at our center tend to do plasma pheresis before giving immunoglobulins because once you give immunoglobulins, really you're pushing plasma pheresis away for a good three to four weeks. And uh, if patients uh, show some response to this, but not a full response, then uh, we do move on to alternatives. Uh, in NORS, um, it is preferable to try Anakindra or Tocilizumab because these work through the interleukin pathways which are involved in NORS. However, Rituximab and Cyclophosphamide have also been tried. Uh, cannabidiol, uh, 25 milligrams per kg, has also been tried. And off late, Bortezomib, uh, which um, we tried in one of our patients. Related to this, a subcategory of NORS is fires, and it's um, not uncommon that, uh, you know, we see it in a young child, one in 100,000. Usually fires occurs in younger children of less than 15 to 17 years. The seizures are pretty explosive, prolonged, and may continue lifelong as refractory epilepsy. Uh, 
they leave the child burnt out with learning and motor disabilities and behavioral disturbances. And of course, as I told you, they can be fatal. So really uh, what's happening when uh, infection occurs in fires is uh, instead of, uh, you know, having a protective effect, uh, there is a neuroinflammation pathway which is triggered, uh, which leads to uh, either seizures or encephalitis or encephalopathy. And there are wonderful articles about this. The latest theory of Norse and fires, of course, is uh, this where there is an inflazome overactivation, which is of the NLRP3 pathway. And this triggers, this is triggered from the microglia. So there's a role, not just, uh, you know, everything we think about neurology is neurons. No, it's the microglia. It's a supportive, uh, you know, tissue there, which is uh, causing this inflazome um, overactivation. And it works through the interleukin pathway. And we know what kind of inflammation interleukins can trigger, particularly after COVID, we've seen it. And uh, this leads to an aberrant excitability. And that's why the potential therapeutics here, you would tend to favor anakindra um, uh, rather than, you know, rituximab. So this is just to show you that um, we do see patients with drug resistant epilepsy and they come to us for drug resistant epilepsy. But when you take the history, they've had this febrile episode many years back. So this is going to give you a clue that this patient probably had fires in the childhood and was left out with a burnt uh, out drug resistant epilepsy. In a nutshell, uh, my talk I'll probably finish before time is that um, uh, always uh, suspect Norse and fires, send in, send out all the investigations that you can, which I mentioned, and uh, you know, treat the status, but go into specific immunotherapies and immunomodulations. Uh, once you find your labs coming negative within 72 hours, uh, the earlier, the better, and this would uh, mean uh, giving them methylpred, this would mean giving them plasma pheresis, immunotherapy. Anakindra, the dose is 5 milligram per kg, really, I've used it in just one patient. Rituximab, I've used it in a lot more patients uh, because it's easily available. Uh, intravenous cyclophosphamide in another one patient uh, we've used. And uh, we generally start with the ketogenic diet because we have a good ketogenic diet uh, uh, program with a trained dietitian. So ketogenic diet through the RILES tube is really uh, another uh, thing which we can give, which is easily available. And of course, uh, we ha should have ruled out the contraindications to the ketogenic diet, um, particularly porphyria and carnitine. Uh, amino acidurias, etc. Certain amino acidurias which can actually worsen if you inst institute the ketogenic diet. So um, the rationale for immunotherapy is really um, an intrathecal overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, chemokines, interleukins, uh, activation of T cells, perivascular cells. Uh, microglial activation and overdrive of these uh, cells and uh, really all your first line management of status has failed that's why you would probably go in for immunotherapy a little more about anakindra it's really uh, showing dramatic response not always there are series which have reported a not so dramatic or useful uh, response and uh, it works by the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist mechanism. The other one which we've used is tocilizumab when Dr. Deepa was with us. Uh, we gave it in one of our patients. And um, it uh, does not cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, but because the blood-brain barrier is so disrupted in these patients, um, it is effective. And cannabinoids uh, have also been tried, uh, particularly in fires. This is just to show you uh, the most famous, uh, you know, case of um, receiving anakindra. And you can see here, the bar shows the number of seizures. So uh, the patient has been seizing away and around day six, anakindra is started. And um, as soon as anakindra is started, there is a complete cessation of the seizures. But however, the patient develops a dress and um, uh, anakindra is, uh, is stopped. And once it's stopped, uh, again, on day 41, the seizures, you know, kind of come back with a rebound. 
Um, and they try everything possible, propofil, propofol, felbamate, ketamine, everything. But finally, they stop with anakindra. And anakindra has actually been used for three to six months. And actually, rheumatologists have been using a lot more anakindra than us. So the take-home messages uh, which I'd like to give is that keep NORS and FIRES on the back of your mind while you send out the investigation. Wait for the labs to rule out an active infection for the first 72 hours. If 72 hours are getting over and you've got no lead anywhere, go ahead and start immuno modulation or immunosuppression with the proposed agents. If the first line agents fail, do not hesitate to go aggressively for second line agents. Start ketogenic diet because that's something which is so benign to use. And of course, um, it's very essential that we as clinicians communicate daily with the caregivers and tell them that your normal patient who came to us without a history of epilepsy, without any neurological problems, uh, you know, will have a high morbidity and can have a high mortality in the best of hands. Uh, really, uh, this is a grave disease with catastrophic consequences and should not be taken lightly. With this, I'd like to thank the organizers once again for discussing this very important topic, which is challenging to us. Uh, almost, you know, once in a month we find patients or maybe more than that coming to us with this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manjari, for covering this uh, beautiful topic in such short time. Actually, you gave that one liner, which I was thinking I'll say, do early, do fast. You said, think early, think fast. This is what I was also thinking. Here we have to go have high index of suspicion. Quickly do it, do induction therapy. Don't think of escalation like we in other diseases do and go, go full blown. So thank you so much. If there are any questions, one or two questions we can take. I know it's a, it's a very, and we all have face problem. And Manjari, we in our institute have bio apps which covers most of the infection spectra which you have mentioned, which can be very helpful with one test in CSF is highly impactful. Uh, any questions from yeah, the audience? I, I have a question. Actually, the only problem with such patients is when they are in the ICU and ventilated, uh, using immunosuppressants is really a difficult task. That is the main issue, by either using tuflizumab or rituximab, because these patients are in uh, having some infection in sepsis, so it's a very, very difficult decision to make. So Recently, that way, a patient with COVID who had developed NARS, we treated with IVIG. She did well. But otherwise, it's a very tough call. Yeah. So, so Agri, uh, Agri with monoclonal antibody, definitely the risk of uh, flare-up of uh, dormant infection and existing infection. Dr. Manjri, you want to make a point? Yeah. So, yes. Uh, you know, rituximab requires mm. a lot more preparation. Uh, you have to make sure the vaccines are done. You have to make sure hepatitis no, is not there. You know, all those things. So, I think uh, anakindra and cyclophosphamide. Uh, cyclophosphamide is something which is so easily available. So, really, you will have to suppress the active infection. Uh, you'll have to give uh, high antibiotics to rule uh, to control septicemia. But really, as I said, time is of essence. Uh, that's why probably the NOS organization, which I mentioned, uh, the website, has clearly said, do not wait beyond 72 hours. Because if you're going to wait longer and longer, you're going to end up having more acquired infections, more nosocomial infections in your patient in the ICU. So probably, you know, you have to counsel the caregiver at 72 hours. Look here, so far, your fungus is negative. So far, this is negative. That is negative. Uh, herpes is negative. So, uh, you know, with certain risk involved, um, we should initiate it before the patient has a pneumonia, uh, VAP, or, uh, you know, whatever. Thank you, Dr. Manjari. I think I echo what Anshu said. Uh, when you have a very small team and you have to take big decisions, it's not that easy, especially where it, everything costs and cost is very high. Thank you, Anshu, for bringing out that point. I think we have done with this talk. Thank you, Dr. Manjri, for a very nice talk. And I like the next topic, uh, what uh, Sita is going to speak, peace. And here my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Atul Prasad, as I said, we are sitting next door, but seeing each other virtually, so, Dr. Atul, please introduce Sita and uh, kick off yeah. the next talk. Yes, sure, sir. sure, sure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, is Dr. Sita there? It's always, yeah, always challenging. There. It's always challenging to present a talk before before lunch. 
Uh, so, but anyway, uh, Dr. Sita, uh, she's uh, she's a, a consultant in Aussie at Kims Hyderabad, and she's going to be speaking about post I think I told your uh, uh, internet. To remind Dr. Sita, she has seventy. Okay, I think we can just start off, Dr. Sita. If you can hear me, we can just start off. Her topic is post-stroke epilepsy to predict, protect, and prevent. And she has 17 minutes and three minutes for discussion. Over to you, Dr. Sita. Dr. Sita, are you around? I saw you in the Dr. Sita. Uh, group. In the gallery, I saw you. Yeah, she's here. Uh, she's just started. Oh. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. P. N. Ranjan and Dr. Sudhir Chagi for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, important meeting. So I was asked to talk about post-stroke epilepsy, predict, protect, prevent. So all of us know that post-stroke epilepsy as well as post-stroke seizures is an important problem both in the ICU and in our OPDs and post-stroke seizures are the commonest cause of epileptic seizures in the elderly. And approximately 50% of the cases of epilepsy after the age of 60 years have an ischemic etiology. And the incidence of stroke-related epilepsy okay. is high after 60 and represents up to 10 to 30% of the various types of seizures occurring yeah, in, the elderly in various studies. The incidence is varies somewhere from 4 to 42 person based on the study designs and in india uh, the according to danuka et al it is around 13 percent also interesting is to know what is the cumulative risk of post-stroke seizures within one year it's around six percent and by 10 years it becomes more than 10 percent also there is a temporal relation between the seizures and the vascular etiology prior to stroke onset seizures can be seen in 4.5 percent and uh, uh, following that, early seizures, uh, as I already said, around 4% and post-stroke seizures anywhere between 10 to almost 40% with an average of 15%. And whenever somebody comes with a seizure after the age of 60 years, one should always be evaluated for a underlying vascular etiology. And it uh, seizure may be the initial manifestation of otherwise occult cerebrovascular disease. And uh, following the seizure, uh, there is a risk of developing a subsequent stroke when compared to the control group. <clears throat> then coming to the definitions. Post-stroke seizures are defined as single or multiple convulsive episodes of the stroke related to reversible or irreversible cerebral damage due to stroke regardless of time of onset following the seizure. So it can be early or late. That seizures uh, is a single or multiple convulsive episodes uh, due to a reversible or irreversible injury, whereas epilepsy means recurrent seizures following stroke with a confirmed diagnosis of epilepsy or a single late post-stroke seizure. But however, more than this, we are interested in two important aspects of seizures. One is the early post-stroke seizures and second one is the late post-stroke seizures or so-called post-stroke epilepsy. The early post-stroke seizures, otherwise they are acute symptomatic seizures. They occur within a week after the onset of, of the uh, stroke and 45% of the cases occur within first 24 hours. And this is related to the injury related to cellular, metabolic, and biochemical dysfunction. And the incidence ranges anywhere from 3 to 6% or in some studies up to a very high percent of more than uh, 10%. Late post-stroke seizures are more common than early post-stroke seizures. They occur after seven days. The incidence is around 1 to 14%, which is related to permanent neurological and glial cellular alterations neuronal circuit reorganization, and hyper-excitability. According to ILAE, a single late post-stroke seizure is also considered a structural epilepsy. So even if it is single seizure, the patient needs to be treated because of the risk of recurrence is 60% within 10 years. Then what are the predictors for early post-stroke seizures? Occurrence of either a lobar hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cortical infox, hemispheric TIS, lacunar infox, are associated with post-stroke early seizures. But however, if it is intratentorial, the risk is negligible. And in 60% of the seizures, the seizures are either partial seizures and in rest of the patients, they occur as generalized tonic-clonic seizures. 
The next question is, what are the predictor factors for early seizures? The major predictors are cortical involvement, agitated confusional state, initial stroke severity, whereas the minor are associated metabolic uh, parameters like hyponatremia or hypernatremia, hypo or hyperglycemia, and a renal dysfunction. The post-stroke acute symptomatic seizures can also occur in young strokes. Usually, if there is history of use of anxiolytic use or moderate severity of stroke, cortical involvement, or metabolic disturbances like hyponatremia. The initial stroke severity is also associated with the risk of uh, developing early seizures. So if you see in this, according to the Scandinavian stroke scale, the higher the severity of the stroke, more the risk of development of epilepsy, which is seen in up to more than 10% of the cases in case of very severe strokes. And I already said the early pathology is the early post-stroke seizures. The pathophysiology is enhanced release of excited toxic glutamate, ionic imbalance, uh, along with the breakdown of the membrane phospholipids, which leads to release of free fatty acids in the penumbra of the stroke, which plays an important role in the epileptogenesis. Coming to late seizures, which occur usually one week after to many years after the stroke, the risk is 24% uh, by three weeks, and uh, almost nine, more than 90% will develop the seizures by two years. But however, they can develop a seizure anytime, even at 10 years after the stroke. The risk factors for late post-stroke seizures are, if there is an early post-stroke seizures, the risk is almost one third of the cases will develop later. Late onset of first seizure, that is, uh, that I'll show an example, hemorrhagic infarcts. Again, as I already said, low uh, increased severity of the stroke with a low ranking scale, recurrent strokes, multiple or large infarcts, cortical damage and hippocampal involvement. So for ex uh, and second, another important finding in uh, uh, various studies is if there is a longer interval from stroke to acute symptomatic seizures, the predictor of late post-stroke seizures is high. That means if somebody develops a seizure uh, at uh, day four to seven rather than immediately, the risk of recurrence is higher in those who develop a seizures uh, later than the um, on the day one. The risk factors in young also, uh, um, as uh, discussed in 2013 study, if somebody has a total anterior circulation infarct whether it is partial or total, if already there is a acute symptomatic seizures, use of antidepressants, hemorrhagic infarct, males, and presence of hyperglycemia were predictors of uh, late post-stroke seizures or epilepsy in young people. So why this happens at the late? So already the cortex is affected either in infarction or hemorrhage. This leads to neuronal excitotoxicity due to various mechanisms, which leads to structural brain abnormalities, mostly gliosis. Uh, the gliosis uh, is preceded by plasticity with reorganization associated with various pathological changes. And later, this gliosis is most important for the late seizures or the epileptogenesis. So recently in epileptic disorders, uh, just a month ago, there is a very nice uh, uh, prediction model based on the meta-analysis for the prediction of post-stroke seizures. So the prediction of post-stroke seizures is complex and use of anti seizure medication prophylaxis is controversial. So <clears throat> in that, uh, they have included uh, many studies, but finally, out of uh, more than 1,500 studies, they could include only 162 studies. Uh, the summary of this study, which included more than 1 lakh participants uh, with predominantly ischemic strokes, with a follow-up for acute stroke seizures uh, considered from 1 to 14 days and late up to almost 5 years, um, the predictors of post-stroke seizures are cortical involvement, functional deficit, increase in the, the more the lesion size, early seizures immediately, and also younger age. Uh, always younger age is a predictor for uh, post-stroke seizures as well as epilepsy. Hemorrhagic infarcts, uh, these are the commonest predictors across the various models. Based on this, they have given two scores, which are very relevant bedside uh, <clears throat> to use uh, for prediction. So this is a one is a select score and second is a cave score. In select score, uh, each uh, parameter is given a score of uh, either uh, one to, to zero to two or zero to one uh, for severity of stroke, large artery or small artery, early seizures or late seizures, uh, cortical involvement present or not, and territory of MCA or not. And the higher the <coughs> select score, the more uh, the risk for epilepsy within five years after stroke. The second one is the cave score where the cortical involvement, uh, again, age, 
uh, more or less than 65 years hemorrhagic volume acute symptomatic seizures will predict the uh, uh, development of the post stroke uh, uh, late seizures or the remote symptomatic seizures so that is about early and post stroke seizures next we coming to what are the investigations usually you do it is like any other seizures uh, one should do an EEG, which may show focal or diffuse slowing or epileptiform discharges. CT MRI will show the cortical or subcortical infarcts. Sometimes we do a, a stroke workup along with the carotid Doppler for any stenosis. So the next question is, uh, do early seizures have any impact on the prognosis? Yes, an immediate outcome, but they do not affect the functional outcome. And it also affects the rehabilitation. Hence, it is very important to control the seizures. And uh, more than the seizures, the severity of the stroke is the predictor of uh, the functional outcome. So the next question is, can we prevent the post-stroke seizures? Actually, the literature uh, about prevention of stroke seizures talks about only the use of uh, statins. So this is an important meta-analysis about the role of stroke statins for prevention of post-stroke seizures as well as epilepsy, which is a review of seven cohort studies. So if you can see in this diagram, uh, the pre-stroke statin use is not associated with any influence on the seizures, but following the stroke, if somebody is using the statins, it reduces the risk of development of post-stroke epilepsy at a later life. So after this, next is management. Coming to the management, uh, so do we really use, uh, there are two questions in this. One is, can do we use prophylactic AEDs? The answer is no. Um, the, the next question is, do we need how long to use the once you start the AEDs? So the Stroke Council of American Heart Association recommends the seizure prophylactic treatment in acute phase only for ICH and subarachnoid hemorrhage, but not for infarcts. If it is a single seizure following the stroke, it is acute symptomatic seizure, no need to treat. But if there are recurrent seizures, one can treat them for at least one month. In few studies, it is up to three months. And chronic AED therapy is not required in case of early seizures. In case of late epilepsy, when to treat? If there are recurrent early seizures, if there are many, if there is early or late post-stroke status epilepticus or epilepsy, late seizure with severe disability because the risk of re is high, and also with recurrent strokes, one should continue the anti-epileptic drugs. But what are the challenges? The recommendations are very uh, controversial and uh, contradictory in various studies. So it's not always black and white. Once, and most important challenge is identification of the seizure because atypical presentations are common. In the, for the person who following stroke develops a seizures, they present with either an acute confusional state, slowing in activities or behavioral change or unexplained falls. So let us, uh, the guideline, many guidelines are available, but uh, the European Stroke Organization guidelines uh, really answers the questions. The first question is for adults who have ischemic stroke or intracranial hemorrhage, do we really need to give immediate primary prophylaxis with anti-epileptic drug when compared to no treatment? The answer is no need for secondary AED prophylaxis uh, following the stroke uh, without any seizures because the risk of recurrence, occurrence of seizures is less than one third of the patients. Even if somebody gives, we should stop immediately after the acute phase. The second question is, uh, do we give secondary prophylaxis? Uh, that is uh, for adults with ischemic or uh, hemorrhagic stroke, if they have at least one acute symptomatic seizure, does immediate secondary prophylaxis with AED compared to no treatment uh, will uh, uh, is recommended? The answer is uh, secondary prophylaxis is also not recommended. That means you continue the AEDs. Uh, and acute seizure recurrence after the acute symptomatic seizures is also less than 20%. And hence, there is no need to continue the medication for long run. But the real recommendation is for patients uh, who develop uh, one uh, unprovoked seizure, that means the acute setup is over and they have already a stroke and either a late seizure uh, after the acute symptomatic phase is over, then we, the recommendation is the risk of recurrence is more than 70% in 10 years and hence the secondary prophylaxis should be implemented for all patients who develop these late seizures. The next question is which AED one should use? Always monotherapy because nearly 90% of the persons uh, after stroke get controlled with single anti-epileptic drug. Uh, so initially in the uh, previous decade, many drugs were available. People were using phenytoin, valproate, levetiracetam in the acute stage because you were able to give a loading dose followed by maintenance of carbamazepine. But uh, what is the evidence available for the use of uh, these drugs? Uh, so in randomized controlled trials, it has been shown that controlled release preparation of carbamazepine is less tolerable than levetiracetam and lamotrazine. 
Following the recommendation was use either levetiracetam or lamotrazine. And it was found that there is no difference between levetiracetam and lamotrazine. And uh, but however, the adverse events were more with levetiracetam, especially the behavioral issues and others, and hence lamotrazine became popular. But however, the up titration with lamotrazine has to be slow with a risk of rash, and most of us were using levetiracetam in the past decade. Uh, the recommendation regarding the first generation AEDs, which are mostly sodium channel blockers or even sodium valproate. So the, uh, actually, they are not most appropriate choice in stroke patients because they can have sometimes a negative impact on the functional recovery as well as bone health, especially with phenytoin and even carbamazepine. They have a suboptimal pharmacokinetic profile. They do interact with anticoagulants or even the aspirin on which most of the stroke patients are on and they are poorly tolerated because of the CNS toxicities and there is lack of level A evidence regarding their specific use in elderly patients. So what about the newer AEDs? We need more information to reach a level of evidence but recently for the past I will say more than five years we are using newer drugs uh, uh, in addition to lametrosine and levetiracetam we started using glucosamide as, as well as even uh, brevaracetam. So the newer AEDs do not interact with anticoagulants or antiplatelets, no significant impact on the bone health. And though initially lamotrazine and gabapentin were recommended, gabapentin nowadays is not used uh, because of its uh, more frequent uses as well as the CNS side effects. So the levetiracetam became safe and effective option. So what about lacosamide? So lacosamide, there is a good amount of literature because it came before brevaracetam. So the six months is a freedom when compared to carbamazepine. Uh, was uh, almost 80% compared to 60% and also it uh, maintains uh, to almost nearly uh, two-thirds of the patients at 12 months uh, when compared to 50% of the patients uh, in patients with carbamazepine with a better side effect profile compared to carbamazepine. Similarly, lacosamide can be used as monotherapy uh, with, uh, with a 50% responder rate in more than 50% of the cases and she's a freedom at long term in uh, also is possible. Then second thing is because there is a chunk of patients who do not respond to monotherapy, that's around 20%, lacosamide was added. And again, the responder rate and she's a freedom was good in the long run uh, with more than 80% of the patients going into uh, significant remission. Coming to brevaracetam, it is used, uh, it's promising drug with the least side effect profile, no drug interactions with easy to titrate and IV preparations are available. And there are no trials still now available specifically for post-stroke seizures for the use of brevaracetam. Uh, so recently there is a review article about the anti seizure medications for post-stroke epilepsy, which is a real world prospective cohort study. So it was found that uh, when they compared the first generation or older generation with newer generation AEDs, where mostly the newer generation, they have used uh, levetiracetam and lacosamide. So the conclusion of this study was that she's a recurrence was lower in new generation compared to older generation AEDs and anti seizure medication regimen withdrawal and chance of doses is also low in patient whenever you are using newer generation and the conclusion of the study was newer generation anti seizure medications their advantages over the older for uh, efficacy as well as side effect profile. So this is another, no, this is no, the same study to use the summary of various uh, studies where they used uh, summary of the various studies where lacosamide, levetiracetam uh, versus carbamazepine, demotrazine versus carbamazepine, gabapentin, levetiracetam was used. And they found that uh, levetiracetam and carbamazepine were equally efficacious in adults with post-stroke epilepsy. Levetiracetam causes significantly fewer side effects than carbamazepine. Levetiracetam monotherapy is safe and effective therapeutic option in elderly. Lacosamide also has a better efficacy than carbamazepine suggesting that both lacosamide and levetiracetam scored better than uh, the other first generation drugs as well as lamotrazine. But most uh, we need more data about the use of brevaracetam. Also, most important is the interactions with other medications. You can stop, I think. Uh, in, in the I think we'll have to stop. Uh, with, uh, recorded, uh, study analysis, they found that lamotrazine and eslic abjepine had least interactions with statins because statin is associated drug in most of the um, uh, and uh, and uh, drugs used for a stroke when compared to other primary drugs or even topramate. But however, in our practice nowadays, we use either uh, lac lacosamide or brevaracetam or levetiracetam in most of the patients because we don't need very high doses and tolerability is reasonably good by using just 500 milligrams twice a day of levetiracetam or 100 milligrams twice a day of lacosamide 
or just 50 to 100 milligrams twice a day of bevacizumab. So these drugs uh, are being used more and more. Then the final question is how long to treat these patients? Start the treatment even after the first seizure uh, in post-stroke uh, epilepsy. Uh, early seizures, which is the uh, late seizures, early seizures should be treated only for one month, maximum three months. Late seizures treatment should be continuous even after a single seizure. The problems of AED therapy should be monitored, monitored for side effects in elderly patients for effect and cognition, uh, especially when you are using first generation AEDs, drug interactions with anticoagulants and other uh, cardiac medications, which most of the patients are. Also remember that baclofen can increase the risk of seizures. <clears throat> then the drug interaction should be you know, taken. Drug resistance uh, uh, is another important problem for stroke seizures, so, which is seen in 20% of the cases. The predictors of drug resistance is early age of onset of stroke, especially the young strokes, uh, those who have cerebral hemorrhage, those who have severe strokes, and uh, those who have status epilepticus at the onset. And then the incidence of post-stroke status epilepticus is around 20%. Early status is seen in 13%, late status is seen in 6%. And the higher disability, the higher the risk. And then again, there are predictors uh, for post-stroke non-convulsive status in the ICUs, especially if it is a cardioembolic stroke or if the carotid endotrichum and seizures, the, the, the association is very low incidence of seizures. The cause for seizures is mostly embolic stroke or disturbed cerebral vascular autoregulation due to hyperperfusion syndrome. So to conclude, post-stroke seizures is the commonest cause of adult onset epilepsy. Management is controversial, but definitely there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of anti-seizure medication in early post-stroke seizures. In uh, newer anti-seizure medicines as preferred for post or late, uh, late post-stroke seizures or epilepsy, and one should be aware of the side effects of AEDs as well as drug interactions when we are managing them. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sita. This was a recorded, uh, I know, the talk, so we could not uh, stop in between. Uh, but very nicely covered. It's a very difficult topic. As you said, 3P, I will say you gave practical point to the practicing neurologist. So those 3Ps I have covered here in this. Uh, definitely hyperdynamic seizures or early seizures versus late seizures. What say hyperacute? acute and remote seizures. So one should be very careful and the underlying pathology, how big is the infarct, where it is located, and what are the other associated features. Uh, we have not used phenytoin for a long time because of even cardiac effects and drug-drug interaction. Other oral drugs like carbapine can cause hyponatremia and newer drugs are used to have her. And I see at times in emergency directly brivaracetam being used or levitaristam being used. Brivara is becoming now a fashion in the ER. So with this, my colleague, Dr. Atul Prasad, is busy with some emergency. He asked me to conclude, but Dr. Mahapatra wants to make a point. Yes, sir. It's all right, all right. I think it's okay. It's very yes, good. Sir. I think so, I, have enjoyed, I have enjoyed all the talks. It was wonderful. Let us but, give them a big hand. But let you us see, sir, if there are one or two questions. If to Dr. ask Sita. some questions. Sir, yes, I have, uh, I'm Dr. Manjiri, sir. My, uh, my comment is for the lacosamide IV. Now, uh, there is evidence to show that in elderly people who are hypothyroid, there can be a prolongation of the QT interval and Absolutely. there can be arrhythmias. So, yes. lacosamide oral is completely a different ball game. It's safer. But when we are giving IV, we've had two incidences. One resulted in death where uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, cardiac arrhythmia induced in elderly. So I think when we see stroke in elderly, this point should be kept in mind. It would be safer to use levetiracetam or, uh, you know, uh, uh, even valproate if the liver functions valproate, are okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Dr. Manjari. Definitely. That's what I said. Sodium channel, uh, like even phenytoin is sodium channel and lecosamide is also sodium channel. It came in 2009 as WIMPAT, but now it's widely available in our country. Sita, do you have any comment to make what Dr. Manjari said? Uh, yes, sir. I agree, sir. Actually, now there is a lot of uh, literature on lacosamide saying that the effect on the re recently Jacqueline French also has reviewed this. And uh, though officially the 
Lacosamide may not cause significant cardiac effects. Better to avoid sodium channels like Manjiri said. I agree totally. Phenytoin and Lacosamide should be avoided. The IV drugs, like you said, available are Valparin, uh, Levitracetam and possibly Brevacetam. Yeah. So as my senior colleague, Dr. Mahapatra said, all the three talks had been very good and very impactful. Uh, and uh, we wish to thank Dr. Sarath, Dr. Manjari and Dr. Sita. By and large, confining to the time and finishing. I know lunch is delayed by three minutes, but still we have finished before one. So, Dr. Mahapatra, we should give a big hand. You can unmute yourself. You should unmute yourself, Mahapatra, to to give a I big have hand. Nothing, you have nothing, yeah. I have no no more to comment. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yes, sir. You have all and, enjoyed and, it. Thank and, you. And thank you, my our co-chairs, Dr. Mahapatra, and my dear colleague, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra, and Dr. Atul Prasad. Uh, sincerely thank the organizers once again to giving us the opportunity to carry on this session. Thank you very much. Have uh, I don't know how to have lunch. Uh, yes, is sir. lunch being sent to Dr. Mahapatra, me and... Uh, <laughs> that will be very Dr. nice. <laughs> <laughs> they should have sent two days back by courier. <laughs> yes. Thank you thank so you, much, Shobit and Dr. Neelam. Thank you so much. So, appreciate. Thank you. Um, Thank you uh, so much for cha chairing the session, sir. And thank you so much, uh, all the speakers, for sharing the wonderful and detailed informative sessions. So now we are moving forward um, for the lunch break. And uh, alongside, we have e-poster sessions in Hall B. And uh, in Hall C, we, have, uh, we are having another session. So we are continuing with that. Thank you so much. Okay, so I've just uh, got one announcement to make, sir, so because we have most of the faculty members here with us. Uh, DNA officers already shared the uh, link for joining the general body meet, which will be due for around 5.30 p.m. Uh, after the day's uh, sessions are over today. So uh, there would be a different link to join the GBM in the evening hours. Um, so uh, with this, uh, I think we had a good morning session. We'll uh, have a break. Uh, of around half an hour and we'll start our session at 1.30 uh, sharp and uh, those who still want to continue viewing, they can go to Hall B to view the uh, e-posters and Hall C programs, quite interesting topics are being delivered over there as well. So for Hall A, we'll see you again at 1.30. Thank you all. Uh, hello, Yogesh, if you are there from Amigiris side, maybe we can put a board for lunch break uh, and that can be shared on the screen till 1.30. Yeah, but uh, Shovich sir uh, sent me, they will share with me, but I got uh, not received here. Okay, fine. So I'll, I'll let it, uh, like you and Shovich handle that part. Then we'll be back at 1.30. Okay? Yes, yes. Sure. Okay.
はい
Hello, uh, Shobit, or uh, maybe we have Yogesh with us. Hanji. Yeah, so we have these slides for all the chairpersons ready? Yes, yes, it's ready. Okay, fine. So it's just like a minute, we'll start. Yes. So Yogesh, can we have these slides? Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to DNA Con 2022. I hope you all had a breather and a good break. We just had a lunch break. And I think uh, what we had in the lunch, uh, more than that, we have more delicious topics at hand and we have really good uh, topics in our hot plate tonight uh, to, uh, in the afternoon. So uh, for this session, we have, uh, I'll request chairs, uh, Dr. Colonel P.K. Sethi, sir, who is... Uh, MD Medicine Ames uh, and Professor Neurology Jipmer, Emeritus Consultant and Ex-Chairman at Department of Neurology in Sri Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. He has special interest in epilepsy, stroke, movement disorder. He has more than 187 national and international publications. And uh, he has been fortunate, uh, he's been awarded with the uh, Vishishseva Medal, General American Award, President's Physician. And he has been awarded with Padam Shri in 2002 by the President of India. So I'll request Dr. P.K. Sethi sir to join us. Now we also have our next chairperson, Dr. Anirbin Banerjee. Uh, Dr. Anirbin uh, Banerjee, he has been the uh, Associate Director of the Neurosurgery Department at the Medanta Institute of Neurosciences. He has done his MCH Neurosurgery and he's been a fellow earlier in the Functional and Restorative Neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic USA and uh, also at the uh, vascular neurosurgery department at the LSU University. So uh, his special interest has been a stereotactic and functional neurosurgery. Uh, I've been keenly following his updates on the social media about all the uh, DBS surgeries and the work that he is doing. Uh, he has a lot of publications and we're glad to have him. 
and our next chairperson is Dr. Suman Koshwa. Uh, Ma'am has been the professor and head of neurology uh, department, the Institute of uh, Human Behavior and Allied Sciences. She has uh, area of special interest in uh, cognitive and behavioral neurology and movement disorders. And she has started comprehensive stroke unit and IV thrombolysis. And with that, she has received awards like the ISA Stroke Award in 2018 for the stroke awareness. So uh, with such eminent chairpersons, I'll request uh, all three of them to coordinate and uh, we'll start with our sessions. Um, I welcome you uh, to this uh, session on movement design. We, are, we have three topics, uh, mainly brain, uh, deep brain stimulation on dystonia. We have a very good speaker there. And then we have deep brain stimulation at Parkinson. And last is the movement disorder emergency. I have two very good uh, chairperson with me. And uh, we'll, uh, we'd like to welcome the speakers. And let us start with uh, Dr. Pramod Pali has been already, uh, let us have this, can we get his biodata? Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Pramod Pal. Uh, he did his MBBS in Calcutta Medical College and his medicine from PGIMR in Chandigarh, DNB, uh, General Medicine National Board, and in New Delhi, DM Neurology, and Nimans, Bangalore. His special interest is movement disorder, especially Parkinson disease, dystonia, tremors and psychogenic movement disorder. He is also interested in spinal cord ataxia, rare movement disorder, genetics and ataxia, and extrapyramidal disorder. Today, as I told you, he'll be speaking on deep brain stimulation in dystonias. We love to hear him and love to know which dystonia patient should receive and when should he receive deep brain stimulation. Um, the, uh, my co-chair later on when other speakers will speak, we'll introduce them. Let me request Dr. Pramod Pal to start his uh, thank you. presentation. Thank you, Professor Sethi, and uh, thank you, Dean Khan, for giving me the opportunity. So I'll just share my screen first. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you. Okay, just one second. Okay, so uh, over the next 10 minutes, uh, I'll, uh, over the next 20 minutes, I'll be speaking uh, on the utility of deep brain stimulation for dystonia. So just a few preliminary slides on what is dystonia and uh, how we should investigate a patient of dystonia. So it is a syndrome uh, characterized by sustained muscle contraction, frequently causing twisting, repetitive movements and abnormal postures. And uh, the latest definition, uh, the old definition of 1984 was modified in 2013. And these people came out with a axis classification for dystonia which is you know, for tremor as well as dystonia, the same pattern. So in axis one, we see the clinical characteristics like what is the age of onset, body distribution, temporal pattern, and associated features. And in axis two, uh, we try to define the etiology of the uh, dystonia, whether it is a nervous system pathology, uh, what is the type of nervous system pathology, and whether the dystonia is inherited or acquired. Uh, so this is very important for uh, the therapeutic point of view. And uh, traditionally, we classify a dystonia again in the axis one as age of onset, like infancy, childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, middle adulthood, etc. And then by body distribution, which is very important when you are dealing with a therapeutic intervention like uh, surgery. Uh, so focal dystonias, we often, most often we are never going to do uh, deep brain stimulation, unless in certain cases like the task-specific dystonia, etc. Then 
uh, segmental dystonia, multifocal, generalized, and hemidystonia. So generalized and hemidystonia are most often, you know, taken up for deep brain stimulation, provided other conditions are met. So then we, again, in the axis one, we try to see how the dystonia evolved, whether it is a persistent, action-specific, diurnal fluctuation, or paroxysmal, etc. And finally, we reach a diagnosis, which reach a syndromic diagnosis, whether this dystonia is isolated dystonia or it is associated with other disorders like myoclonus, Parkinsonism, etc. And whether it's a part of a other hereditary disorders or it is a, just a pure uh, you know, DIT syndrome. So again, these have a lot of implications in a, choosing a surgery, as I'll tell you later on, and uh, also what is the outcome of a surgery. And there are other disturbances there where it is because of secondary, you know, toxic uh, hypoxia or brain infarct, etc., where again the etiology as well as the, the prognosis is quite different. So when you see a patient, ultimately we uh, have four pillars, you know, age of onset of symptoms, distribution of the dystonia, presence or absence of other features, other neurological disturbances, and presence or absence of other non-neurological manifestations. And we do a lot of uh, investigations to pinpoint a diagnosis, uh, including the commonest things like childhood dystonias. We look for Wilson's disease, KF ring. Then we do obviously MRI of the brain and all these studies to rule out secondary dystonias like cerebral cerebroplasmin, uh, then uh, bone, sometimes in bone marrow for the storage disorders, then uh, electrophysiology, and finally the genetic studies, which is very important. Uh, with the advent of whole exome sequencing or targeted sequencing, we come to know what is the actual diagnosis of genetic dystonia. And in this context, I want to highlight that DIT1 or you know the uh, dystonia type 1, this has a very good prognosis after deep brain stimulation. And then we do a good clinical evaluation because as you all know that uh, the dystonia syndrome progresses over time. And so we need to you know, evaluate the patient and see what is the status before the intervention has been done. The stimulation sometimes causes a lot of problems like psychiatric problems or it can cause stimulated related problems. So we again need to carefully document these things like psychiatric evaluation and uh, whether the patient has any fixed posture, whether there is developed contracture or not, because if there are contractures, deep, deep brain stimulation will never help those patients who have already developed uh, fixed contractures. And sometimes we need anesthesia to evaluate the degree of contracture. Then uh, sometimes, again, baclofen pump is used to see a therapeutic response. And finally, a, a good trial of medicines, especially for the dopamine responsive dystonia, DRDs, et cetera, should have been given before even thinking of going for a deep brain stimulation for uh, dystonia. So these are some of the you know, uh, features we get after investigations like acanthocytes, brain abnormalities. But if you see these type of brain abnormalities, like often in mitochondrial disorders or, you know, PCAN mutations, etc., where the pallidum is totally gone. Okay. In those cases, deep brain stimulation probably will never help. So we need actually a clean MRI of patients with dystonia to say that this patient probably will have the best outcome after deep brain stimulation, because we need a healthy nucleus to target. So we do documentation of the severity of the dystonia by using some scales like Burke, Fun, Marsden, dystonia rating scale, and other rating scales are there. And also we do a good video recording in just pre-DBS video recording so that we can compare it after the operation. So symptomatic treatment, I'm not going to go into details, but you should uh, surgeon, typically a, a surgeon and a neurophysician, neurosurgeon are uh, work in a team and uh, the neurologist should have tried all possible medications to decrease the dystonia. And then uh, if it is not, you know, the patient did not benefit and the DBS has a prospect, then only the surgery comes into the um, picture. So the, among the functional surgery, we do DBS of uh, most important is globus pyridus internus. Sometimes in some cases, case by case, we can go for either ST or thalamus. Then we do functional neurosurgery in India. Still, we do a lot of lesional surgeries like uh, GPI one side lesion. But if we do both side lesions, then the patient may you know, have a lot of problems. And we discourage doing at least at the same time uh, bilateral uh, parallelotomy. But sometimes in rare cases, 
or in cases where who cannot afford a DBS, we can sometimes do staged uh, parietal surgery. One on one, one side we have done in pecan mutations and later on on the other side. But these are all GPI uh, ablation surgery, but our talk mainly today is on the uh, DBS, deep brain stimulation. So, uh, so we, though DBS, we do not know exactly how it works, but nonetheless, uh, it causes a very high frequency stimulation and sometimes it causes the inhibition of that particular area. So, in the pathophysical dystonia, you should uh, realize that we do not know. But there are a lot of studies ultimately point towards the imbalance in the direct and the indirect pathway. And this leads to an abnormally low rate of discharge of the inhibitory GPI and substantia nigra pars reticulator inputs to the thalamus. So there becomes more of excitation and the body does not know to have a focused movement and thereby just when you try to you know, hold something, there is overactivity of the other parts of the body, other muscles, and therefore the inhibition is lost. Therefore, we target the GPI. So uh, the general principles of treatment of dystonia, it is actually it is more based on a personal clinical experience and weighing knowledge and, or of efficacy against potential adverse events. And also it depends on the age of patient, anatomical distribution and cost and affordability. So the surgical treatment, as I have already told you, the listening we do not uh, like unless the patient cannot afford DBS. And uh, the, it is... We don't have time to discuss about what is DPS because I have only just now another 10 minutes left. But it just to inform that it is a pulse, like a pacemaker, which is typically implanted in the upper chest. The system generates short electrical pulses, similar to a cardiac pacemaker. And there are one or two electrodes, depending on which side or both sides you are doing, which is you know put inside the brain through a bar hole and then connecting wire under the skin that connects the generation generator with the lead. So DBS acts by modulating the dysfunctional circuits and uh, several randomized and open level studies have reported that reduction of motor symptoms for in DBS for dystonia is occurred by over 50 to 80 percent. There is elevation of dystonia associated pain and subsequent improvement in quality of life. So one of the few conditions approved by DNA uh, by uh, FDA is uh, DBS for dystonia is a conditional humanitarian grounds. Best results of DBS for dystonia Whenever I'm talking of DBS, I'm implying that it is a parietal DBS. It is for the DIT1 positive dystonia and idiopathic cervical dystonia. The appendicular symptoms appear to respond better than the axial symptoms. Now, as I already told you, we do all these scales and preoperative assessments and a good preoperative MRI. And then subsequently, again, we do assessments at seven days, 90 days, and 180 days post-operative. DBS at Nimes, uh, under the guide, uh, Main, uh, our main person is Dr. Dwarkarnath, and we have done a lot of DBS for dystonia. And we usually uh, prefer the Medtronic. We have the Medtronic uh, planning system, and uh, we use the target by uh, the direct method. So uh, these are all the uh, surgical you know, uh, things which I'm not going to go into details. But uh, there are the trajectories are parasagittal and in the coronal plane. Now, uh, use of MER, though it is used for the Parkinson's disease, but most likely we are not able to use this in the when we do DBL for dystonia because it is uh, the operation is done mostly under GA because the patients have a severe dystonia and they will not be able to frame fixation, etc. will be a problem. But DEXMED is an alternative anesthesia. It is very important to, you know, when you are doing that, you should not hit the uh, visual tracks when you are targeting the GPI. And uh, if you can do recording, uh, it is well and good. And these are the typical pre-operative frame fixations and targeting. And this is the post-operative. We do scout uh, CT scans, et cetera, to see whether the leads are in the proper place or not. So implantation of electrodes, uh, it actually, uh, this is a, a figure where it shows that how the MER, the recording of the GPI is done. But this, again, we need a very, very light anesthesia or awake patient. So what happens after the D GPI DBS? But it is not like uh, DBS for tremor or DBS for Parkinson's where, you know, the next day you get some improvement. So improvement occurs. The pain may improve very fast and the physical improvement, improvement after that. But the tonic postures and et cetera take months, even six months after the DBS to uh, improve. 
So there are complications of DBS like adverse side effects of surgery, intracranial hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, hardware related effects, and adverse effects of stimulation like dysarthria, difficulty in swallowing, etc. And uh, these I'm just going to skip. So I will show you some videos. Maybe that is the most important thing which we can do in the next five minutes. So, um, so what is our experience? So we had done. We had published this paper sometimes back. We had done ten patients of. Uh, GPI DBS and the outcome seven patients had a good improvement more than 50 percent improvement in the BFM scale and the remaining three patients showed good improvement in early follow-up and uh, one patient was lost to follow-up uh, and uh, these were multiple uh, etiologies so you can see here primary GNLs today we did for two patients NBIA for two patients then Wilson's disease and Camptoconia etc for one patient each. And uh, this is a improvement scale which shows that in the pre-DBS, you can see, and as the uh, time uh, goes on, there is improvement of all the parameters of feeding, writing, uh, swallowing, etc. in these patients. So I'll just show you a video here. This is the, one of the first patients which we did, is JLI's uh, dystonia. You can see here, so I just uh, request other people also not to take the video because these are all patients' property. And so this is before the DBS. And uh, this, so you can see here uh, before the DBS. So he was walking like this before the DBS. And you see after the DBS, this is a very, very significant improvement. And we have changed the batteries. And he's uh, almost 10 years now follow up with us. This is a patient, very unfortunate. This patient had a very, very severe generalized dystonia. And we did the earliest patient, youngest patient, six years old. We did a, and this is after the DBS, you can see such a good improvement. Unluckily, the patient developed uh, infections. Patient, we had to take out the uh, DBS and later on actually patient died. So not in our hospital, in some other hospital after about few years. Okay. So this is a childhood onset dystonia. So these are the patient where we reported earlier, bilateral parallel DBS in dystonic camptocornea. You can see this is the, before the DBS. This is six months after the DBS. And this is after about a few years after the follow-up. So there's a very good improvement. This patient had changed the batteries about twice. And uh, now I think we have put a uh, rechargeable battery. Then another patient, as I told you, the DIT1, that is they do not have any brain abnormality on MRI. So this is a patient who had DIT1. So this is a pre-DBS. I have closed, uh, I have not shown the face because of the privacy. And this is three months after the DBS. You can see here, uh, so significant improvement. So when they walk, you will just make out. Uh, just let them walk, you will see. So the upper panel is before the DBS. So if this patient actually had developed some contracture. He was thought of having psychogenic movement disorders. So it is very important to know, to recognize very early uh, what is the type of, so this is after the DBS, you can see the lower panel and soon you will see that before the DBS, uh, when he was walking, how he was walking. So there was a significant, but he had a contracture in the spine, which obviously DBS will not help. So, and this is, uh, so DBS is uh, most important for, you know, uh, is indicated only after enough time has elapsed for spontaneous remission. And one of the disorders where nowadays the DBS is being targeted is Tardai Biscarisia, where they develop very severe head neck dystonia. And uh, there can be, however, there can be spontaneous remission in about one third of the patients after five years. So we should, you know, give a proper you know, time after the onset of the dystonia to see if there is spontaneous remission in these reversible conditions. And uh, this is an uh, article published, Deep Brain Stimulation Tardive Syndrome. And they had done about 117 patients of Tardive syndrome had been uh, had undergone DBS, GPI DBS, and there's a very good improvement in you know about 95 to 100 percent improvement in more than eight or ten cases. So I'll just show you one of the patients. Though this is not our uh, you know paper, but this is a patient whom we recently did DBS. Uh, I'm not showing the face because of the privacy, but this was before the DBS Tardive dystonia. Uh, you will see how he walks before the DBS and how uh, he has improved after the DBS eight months post-operative. So um, this is one of my colleagues, Dr. Ravi Yadav's patient. But this is a team. So this was the patient before the DBS. And I hope I could have showed you the face and leg. But there was a very, very significant improvement after the DBS. 
So, uh, yeah, so to conclude that uh, DBS is an effective treatment in most cases of primary dystonia, like DYT1 dystonia. And primary dystonia respond much better than secondary dystonia. Secondary in the form of, you know, secondary to other degenerative disorders like Wilson's disease or PCAN mutations or secondary to infarcts or hypoxia uh, or trauma, etc. We have done a lot of uh, hemidystonias who have undergone uh, parallel DBS, uh, parallel uh, lesioning on one side, but there was no significant improvement. So the overall benefit from DBS seems likely to accrue gen gradually after the first six months, uh, at least six months after the surgery in patients with generalized and segmental dystonia. The outcome of DBS in dystonia depends on careful selection of patients and proper surgical placement of the DBS lead. I have not gone into these programming and etc. because just to tell you that DBS is not for uh, dystonia is not like that for Parkinson's disease. Programming is dif uh, difficult. The voltage the patient requires is much higher. The battery drainage is much faster. So if a ordinary battery, non-rechargeable battery, lasts for about four years for a patient of Parkinson's disease for the G for the dystonia, it will just get drained off within two years. Okay, so it is better to have uh, rechargeable batteries which a lifespan for about 10 years for patients of Parkinson's disease probably in dystonia it can last for about five years but again the cost is 10 lakhs in our country in our hospital for rechargeable batteries and about five lakhs or to six lakhs for the charging normal batteries so these are the last few points high degree of precision and optimal targeting and a multidisciplinary group is needed the scenario is unique when compared with other diseases with DBS and will demand that individuals will have a patience to wait for getting the full benefit. And DPA, DBS of GPI should be considered as a valid indication for both generalized and segmental dystonia when other therapies appear ineffective. But patient education is very important. So I'd just like to thank my team of uh, Nimes Parkinson's disease and movement disorders subspecialty, especially Dr. Dwarkarna, Sri Nivas, and Dr. Ravi Yadav. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, uh, Dr. Siti, can I ask a question? Sure, sure, please ask the questions. Uh, Dr. Pal, this is Dr. Ranjan from Apollo, Delhi. Uh, two things. Uh, of course, we have a very large experience of DBS and Parkinson's in our hospital, and Dr. Tyagi is at it. But we have not done many DBS in dystonia. Uh, my fear about dystonia is one that is it over a period of time? the DBS effects become lesser and lesser and the dystonic movements come back. That's point one. Point two is, do you really think that we should venture to do DBS as secondary dystonias? Okay. So uh, about the effectiveness of DBS uh, in dystonia over time, we do not have much of experience. Uh, but definitely in tremor syndromes and all, uh, the effectivity as well as in PD also, we have been seen that uh, it comes down, the effectiveness. And sometimes, especially in PD, I'm telling you that sometimes when the patient had responded to levodopa over time, the DBS changes the plasticity of the brain in such a way that they may develop you know, resistance to levodopa as well as in patients with ET, we have found that when we have done DBS, initially there's a good improvement. After that, there is a cerebellar damage occurs after the DBS. So I will not be able to tell from my experience about the DBS in dystonia. In worldwide also, there is not much of long-term follow-up. This is just the emerging area. About the secondary, yes, you know, people have come to us with uh, these things that whatever it is, even if there's a 10% improvement, 15% improvement, we want to go ahead with a uh, DBS. So we do now offer, especially patients of, you can see that patient of a child whom I told uh, didn't survive. The patient had a significant improvement, at least for five, six years, they will have improvement, though the disease will progress, a peak end, I'm telling, where the, already the GPI has been damaged. So yes, on humanitarian grounds, uh, we all explain to the patient that disease is progressive, but still we go ahead with a DBS and it is being practiced worldwide that, you know, in metabolic disorders also, Wilson's also, we are doing DBS. Hey, are people doing the uh, DBS in secondary dystonias worldwide? Yeah, yeah, they are doing. In, they, I are doing. they are doing. They are doing. If you talk about secondary dystonia, which is the secondary dystonia where the results of DBS has been the best? Out of See, all that the is, uh, yeah, that is uh, our tardive dystonia. That is one of the drug-induced dystonias. I know. So drug-induced dystonia is a very good 
you know, uh, evidence is there now. That is the second dystonia where DBS is helping uh, a lot. But I am trying to tell you that if there's a brain lesion and if the GPI is already very damaged, it is better not to do because ultimately it doesn't help. Okay. So, but if still the thalamus and the uh, th is preserved, sometimes people do uh, thalamic DBS also in dystonia. Dr. Paul, you would agree that uh, the era of tardies, dyskinesias is gone now. We are talking about the Nimbahans days when the patients were taking antipsychotic no, 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 pills. Uh, now, I am just taking, now, we hardly I am just see tardy dyskinesia. Because tard the, no. See, there are now the third eye term is only not used much. I think it is now a. I think. Yeah. The time is over. And Neuroleptic induced dystonia. Anyway, so thank you very much. Lot of Dr. Pramod, yes. only one thing. Yes. Recently, very recently, it has come in neurology that cerebellum now has come in a big way giving inputs for these abnormal movements. Is the cerebellum is also going to be target for this deep brain stimulation because it is now being called the smaller brain ahead of the print. It has come the last Last month, urology. Cerebellum is a difficult area to target. This is number one because of the uh, structure where it is being located in the posterior fossa. Yeah, definitely they will do tandem stimulations and all. These are all on a trial basis. It is going on. The dented nucleus and all definitely are the areas which can be targeted. Thank you for a very good presentation. I asked my colleague, Dr. Arvind Benji, to introduce the next speaker and he takes over. Thank you, Dr. Sveti, and a wonderful presentation by Dr. Uh, Pal. Uh, good to see him after a long time. He was one of my neurology mentors in uh, uh, Nimhans. Uh, the next speaker needs no introduction. Dr. Sudhir Tyagi, an eminent neurosurgeon in India with extensive experience in the field of stereotactic and functional neurosurgery, currently working as a senior consultant neurosurgeon in Indraprastha Polo. And we are eager, at least I am extremely eager to learn from him, uh, from his rich experience in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. Please, Dr. Tehagi. Dr. Tehagi? Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Anirban. And for the kind words. I'll be speaking on the deep brain stimulation Parkinson's disease today, outcomes and challenges. These are the different uh, frames which has been used in past and I have been using the CRW frame right from the very beginning since I started the functional neurosurgery. DBS basically, as you all know, it's a high frequency stimulation which induces the functional inhibition of the target region of the brain. An electrode is implanted into target site and is connected to the circuitry place pulse generator. That's all about the basic of the DBS. Little bit about the history. The initially, the FDA approved of DBS for essential tremor only. That was in 1997. And later on in 2002, for Parkinson's disease, DBS was also FDA, got FDA approval. And my first case was for the PD was Parkinson's disease, DBS was in on 31st May 2002. Other uh, uh, indication kept on adding later on in 2003 for the dystonia, then epilepsy in 10. Then we did the two cases of the epilepsy, inductible epilepsy after that, and other psychotic disorder later on. The patient selection criteria is one of the most important thing when you are going to do a DBS in any uh, disease, any movement disorder, especially in the Parkinson's disease. It should be an idiopathic Parkinson's disease with good liver of our response. These are the patients who really respond well to the DBS as well. Yeah. Patients should be medically and psychologically stable, and it should be a severe disability on, on ER scales, depending on the UPDRS scaling. PD medication should be effective according to the neurophysician who has been already been treated the patient. This is a very, very important point. The patient should have been treated by the neurophysician, especially who is a good experience in the movement disorder. And when the movement disorder specialist, the neurophysician thinks that the, my medicines are not properly working or they're getting a lot of dyskinesia or other side effects with the medicine and disease is progressing and symptoms are also progressing, 
with the medicine. Only then uh, he will refer the patient to the neurosurgeon. So basic workup should have been done by a good neurophysician, not by a neurosurgeon. So there should not be any bias when you are going to do a DBS. The age usually not been barred. I have opened from 30 to 75 years of the age patients. The exclusion criteria are also equally important when you are selecting a patient. Patient should be a good surgical candidate. There should not be contraindication for any surgical thing. Previous neurosurgical history should not be there. Anybody who has gone through any uh, head injury or the brain hemorrhage already has been operated. Any surgical history has been there in the brain. They are not good candidates for the DBS. Anybody who is having the cardiac demand pacemaker, they are also, there may be some cross talking between the pulse generator of the neuro, uh, neuro and the cardiac. So these are also not good candidates. Then repeated MRI, the patient who require repeated MRI, especially the high resolution MRI, then they can, they can change the parameter of the uh, pulse generator. So they are not good candidates. But now we have some selected uh, MRI settings in which we can do the MRI of these patients. Then patient with secondary or drug-induced Parkinson should not be taken for the DBS. This is the UPDRS scale, which is used by our neurophysician uh, preoperatively. And accordingly, we see the patient in which stage the patient is coming. Usually, they are the patient stage three and stage four patients who come to us through the neurophysician for the surgical intervention. We are the different, I have done 153 cases since 2002. Out of them, the 133 cases are Parkinson's disease, eight cases are essential tremors, and dystonia is 10 cases. Then two cases of intractable epilepsy I have done, who are having the multiple foci, there are two cases. And the predominantly, they are the males. These are the different targets which I have used, like STN for especially for the uh, Parkinson's disease, GPI for uh, when the patient is having predominant uh, rigidity and the dyskinesia, VIM tremor for the essential tremors, but the, most of the patient, initial two patients, I did the GPI, but later on in Parkinson's disease, in all patients, I have done the subthermic nucleus stimulation. Different techniques have been used by different neurosurgeons, MR-based, CT-based, ventriculography. The, I was using basically the CT, initially I was using CT-MRI fusion with neuroatlas, but recently I'm using CT-MRI fusion along with MER. I think that works well for me. And mostly I'm not using neuroatlas now. The CT scan has, has its own advantage because it has a geometric fidelity and the spatial accuracy is very good. Disadvantage is there's poor neuroanatomical definition in the CT scan of the subthalamic nucleus. MRI is good for the good neuroanatomical definition. Rather, I, now I take the visual target also and I match it with the calculated target uh, on the CTMR fused images and then I take the patient for the surgery. Disadvantage of MRI is, as you know, it's anatomical spatial distortion and their susceptibility and chemical shift artifacts. So it is better to fuse these images with the CT scan. So I use the, this head-to-head -head technique on the chamfer splicing, which is called image fusion, and the CT and MRI images are fused. And then you, I used to see the target on the neuroatlas. That's how I take the AC and PC, and accordingly calculated target is taken on the different images. And then I see it on the MRI and CT fused images as well. This is later on, we can see it on the neuroatlas. As you see, the subthalamic nucleus is very well seen. And then you put the target uh, subthalamic nucleus. These are the different assembly of the deep brain stimulation, including lead in the brain, then this extension wire and the IPG. This is the whole assembly of the deep brain stimulation. There is an external assembly, like we have the clinical clinicians programming, patient programming, programmer, and along with this, there's a wireless remote system is also now available from where the patient is at home and the, our neurophysician is sitting in the hospital and uh, myself and Dr. Ranjan has done some cases in which we have done the, the remote programming. This is the... Uh, that's how we make the 14 millimeter bar hole and put a cap just to hold the, yeah. This is one of the patient with the intraoperative neurostimulation and the clinical examination is also very important part in the patient, the Parkinson's disease. 
for that we have our neurophysician inside the operation theater so that it should be checked independently whether the patient is really showing symptomatic improvement on the neuro stimulation the data is transferred in front of me <laughs> the computer and then we check the different rigidity tremors and the dyskinesia so we will be doing the neuro stimulation in a one minute time now so this is dr anjan checking the rigidity so this is was a very important part seeing the intraoperative uh, when you see the intraoperative improvement then you are very sure you are at the right target and you are not getting any side effect during the surgery you can check it at there and then this is another method of checking whether you are right your uh, your electrode is right inside the nucleus or not because size of nucleus is about 7 to 8 mm so mer will tell you exactly when you are entering into the subthalamic nucleus and where you are coming out of the subthalamic nucleus so this is very important to do microelectrode recording during the surgery so we do it in every patient and then do the accordingly after checking everything we do the lead placement and fix up the cap over it so that it doesn't move and check it on the cm also that's how it's seen and this is the ipg pass pacemaker we put subcutaneously in the subclavicular region and this is one of the patient very disabling tremor on the left side only very funny type of the tremor but ultimately it was diagnosed as a pd parkinson disease tremor only because there was a lot of debate before surgery but he has tried all the medicine everything and there was no ego this is a fourth post op day and we have just done the first programming of this patient this is we'll switch on it yeah we are going to, this is right now switch on we'll switch on it and check how is the response moment is start stimulating the Part tremor uh, is start going down. Now it is completely it is stopped. Like, you can check the different <laughs> symptoms like rigidity, tremors, dyskinesia. This is another patient with a very advanced Parkinson's disease. Patient was on the medicine for last twenty years, but this is kept on progressing as it does. And uh, with medicine, all kind of medicine he has taken, he was not showing much improvement now. So the neurophysician decided to send it for the deep brain stimulation. Then we worked up the patient and found it in the stage four. We were used to take the help. Doing for daily activities, and used to get very rigid in between. So he has the full triad of the symptoms like rigidity, tremors, and the kinesia. Then we did the DBS, bilateral DBS in this patient, and now this is the after two weeks of the surgery. We have done. Tremors, yes, sir. This is after two programming, after two weeks. <coughs> he has shown improvement in all the three. Symptoms: rigidity, tremors, and the echinacea. And his medicine also started getting less after two weeks. He came up to, up to about the fifty percent of medicine for those he was getting earlier. Here, the 
patient was a retired army officer. You can see from his gait, he's back to his normal self. So another patient, bilateral tremors, PD. Very funny type of tremors, but ultimately the diagnosis was Parkinson's disease itself. And there was a bilateral DBS was done. This is at time it is switch off. Now we are going to switch it on. This patient improved on a very little of the very little voltage and uh, showed significant improvement on very little stimulation. So you were used to take a little time to respond once we start the stimulation. But after 30 seconds or so, the tremors will go complete. That's how this patient was a significant improvement. So when we come to the outcome in this STN, we have the follow up for the last 20 years, so around, you can say about 10 years uh, follow up average follow-up, we have seen that on time has increased about 53%, which is usual studies. And we have also shown, seen that the outcome was very good in when it comes to the on time. And moreover, this over a period of time, the dyskinesia also reduced significantly and keep on reducing over a period of time. Then this is efficacy. The, Overall fluctuation of the dyskinesia also reduced very significantly in the in our off time also. When it comes to hours, it has been seen the on time hours has increased about six hours in whether it is the PD stimulation or the STN stimulation. But most of the time I have done the STN stimulation and there is significant improvement in the on time. This is a 10 year follow up study in which it shows there is a all the symptoms over a period of time has improved and they kept on uh, showing the patient was symptomatically better. And later on, we'll see the, how the drug dose also reduced. There are another study in which the tremor residue bradycardia axial symptoms and everything, including speech, gait, and posture, has showing some improvement. Though uh, it is not uh, good to say that speech, gait, uh, speech, and posture improve always, but most of the patient has shown improvement. In HY stage, also there is a change from stage four to stage three and stage three to stage two, in this case, in the long-term follow-up. Then these are the p-values significantly less in all the symptoms, which has shown improvement over a six months period from the baseline. There are different studies. The follow-up is about from six months to 36 months. It is about how the doses has reduced. Most of the patient has shown about uh, decrease in the dose, so the maximum reduction has gone up to 50%, rarely below 50%. The certain symptoms which doesn't improve and we cannot claim to the patient that they will improve. These are one of the patients, most of them are non-motor symptoms like cognitive issues, depression, anxiety, and sometimes gait and the posture instability doesn't show that improvement as we or patient expect. Especially and the compulsive behavior as well. Another thing is, patient has to be checked uh, by the psychologist. If you feel the patient is having some psychological issue because they have unrealistic uh, uh, expectations, and because of that, sometimes there's the issues. So you have to tell maximum improvement just can go up to the 80%. And in the studies also, it has shown. The 43% show very good improvement, 33% are indifferent, but 20%, 5% patients are not really happy uh, with the DBS. When I do the DBS, I tell there are chances about 80% chances that patient is going to show significant improvement. The speech disturbance is another thing which may or may not show improvement, but uh, with the different research papers, whenever there is speech disturbance, now we can reduce the uh, voltage uh, on the left side, in the dominant side. That also sometimes helps in getting the speech uh, disturbances better. Then freezing of gait and the postural disorder, as I told you, sometimes they don't show much improvement. And again, uh, the recommendation is you should reduce the uh, voltage in these cases. Weight gain is another indifferent thing. 
which nobody knows how it happens after DBS, but it, there are studies within one year of the DBS, many patients have shown weight gain. So we have to tell the patient in advance. Then these are the behavioral and cognitive issues. All these things we have to tell the patient has to take the help of the uh, psychiatrist and neuropsychiatrist and psychologist before the, for the evaluation or before surgery and after the surgery also to manage these things. Then the potential complication is about point uh, about one percent average about one percent chance of infection or the brain hemorrhage. I had one patient in which I had the thalamic hemorrhage in one patient, but patient showed improvement over a period of time. It was not a big uh, size, a small hemorrhage, but I had to uh, stop the procedure in between when the, I showed patient is having some weakness on one side. Advantage we all know that is a, when the Drugs are not working, and the properly selected patient, we can do the DBS. It is very important the patient has been selected uh, properly. If you don't select the patient properly, then I think it is going to backfire even when you do the DBS. A patient may end up without any improvement or may have some dis uh, side effects. So it is very important that we should uh, select the patient properly, and it should be selected by neurophysician rather than a neurosurgeon. That will be a better thing to do. And then we can go ahead. It is a good uh, therapy in selected patient, that will I say. But I think still there's some breakthrough has to be happen in future for the better treatment of the movement disorder in Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much. A wonderful talk uh, by Dr. Tyagi as usual. Very educative and profound. Now the session is open for uh, any questions from the audience. We can take one question to start with. Dr. Tyagi, many times earlier they used to say five years is the honeymoon period for uh, medical treatment. Then you should think of DBS before it is too late. So sure. as you as you and Dr. Paul both emphasize the selection of the patient. Yeah, I think that when it comes to the dyskinesias, patient having uh, liver dopa induced dyskinesia, they are the patient who can be taken early for the surgery. But if the medicines are working and the patient is doing well, I think we can delay the DBS till the medicines are working well and the side effects are less. So I think the patient-to-patient -patient selection is very important. You cannot make a blanket rule for that. Can I make a point of treaty? Yes. Dr. Ranjan also wants to speak about it. Can I make a point, please? Sure. I think what you said was absolutely relevant. I was about to make the same point. There'd be a lot of studies to say, why do you want to wait for Parkinson's to become advanced? We have to pick up patients even when they have moderate disability. And the two main indications being moderate disability response to L-DOPA and severe dyskinesia. You are very right because many times, once the dementia sets in, and the dementia may be setting on very slowly. So he, that was a kind of five years period. And many times, of course, it depends on the patient you suggest to him, he may not choose to get operated. So I think, as you are saying, selection of patient, both you and Pramod Pal emphasize rightly so. So selection of the patient's criteria will have to really kind of work on that. But very nice presentation by both of you. Thank you, thank you. Can we move to the third presentation and I request Dr. Suman to introduce the third speaker. Is Dr. Suman there? Dr. Suman? I think Dr. Banerjee, then you can go ahead and introduce. Uh, sure, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sethi. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Pandey, uh, he is uh, a, a, a very important uh, member of our movement disorder neurology community all uh, in India. He is working as a professor uh, uh, neurosurgery um, in um, GB Panth Hospital and with an extensive experience in movement disorder, treating movement disorder patients, a holistic treatment, including medications, uh, neuro rehab as well as uh, neuromodulation and ablative surgeries when needed. Uh, today's topic is a bit esoteric. Emergence is in movement disorders, but it's a very important topic, very rarely touched upon. And I would request Dr. Pandey to please uh, start his uh, much-awaited talk. Uh, 
ਇਕੱਠੇ ਹੋ ਪਾ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਫਾਰ ਯੂਰ ਕਾਈਂਡ ਇੰਟਰੋਡਕਸ਼ਨ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਫਸਟ ਥੈਂਕ ਡੀਐਨਏ ਕੌਨ ਫਾਰ inviting me to uh, present uh, this talk and uh, the topic which has been assigned to me is movement disorder emergencies so if you see a uh, movement disorder uh, patients uh, usually they don't require emergency managements uh, but sometime it happens that uh, they come in emergency and uh, we can broadly classify them as hypokinetic and hyperkinetic disorders and hypokinetic disorders which come in emergency are neuroleptic malignant syndrome parkinson hyperparesia syndrome and some complications of parkinsonism like dyskinesia falls and psychosis and hyperkinetic disorders coming in emergency are chorea balism tics myoclonus and dystonia So neuroleptic malignant syndrome was first described in 1960 and it's an iatrogenic disorder resulting from exposure to drugs that block uh, dopaminergic receptors and if we see the DSM-5 criteria of neuroleptic malignant syndrome exposure to dopamine antagonist or dopamine agonist withdrawal within past 72 hours are the major risk factors and hyperthermia rigidity mental status alteration and cpk elevation uh, and sympathetic nervous system liability they are the major criteria and other features are blood pressure elevation or fluctuation diaphoresis urinary incontinence the drug class which may lead to neuroleptic malignant syndrome are psychiatric drugs anti emetics and sometime anti parkinsonian drugs dopamine agonists and levodopa withdrawal may also lead to similar symptoms the treatment of neuroleptic malignant syndrome is uh, if there is a mild rigidity the patients may be given lorazepam and if there is a moderate rigidity we can give lorazepam and bromocriptine and if there is a severe rigidity and catatonia the patients may be given dantrolene also there are some important differential diagnosis of neuroleptic malignant syndrome like i said parkinsonian hyperparesia syndrome serotonin syndrome and malignant catatonia and if we compare all these four then the precipitant for neuroleptic malignant syndrome is dopamine ag- antagonist but for parkinsonism hyperparesia syndrome its withdrawal of dopaminergic drugs are responsible and in serotonin syndrome serotonergic drugs which are frequently prescribed by the secretary colleagues and even the neurologic colleagues uh they are responsible for serotonin syndrome and malignant catatonia is usually seen in psychiatric or uh, other medications and if we see compare the onset the onset is usually gradual in nms and parkinsonian hyperparesia syndrome but it's abrupt in serotonin syndrome and malignant catatonia and if we see the movement disorder the movement disorders are usually almost similar except the malignant catatonia patient who may have some stereotypy and serotonin syndrome patients may have some myoclonus and other features may include some seizures like manifestation in serotonin syndrome which is usually not seen in other conditions and the treatment of nms i as i discussed uh, just before this slide is to stop neuroleptic medications and use dopaminergic medications and dantrolene and in parkinsonian patient start dopaminergic drugs and in serotonin syndrome there have been some studies of ciprofloxacin and in malignant catatonia sometime ect is also required this is a uh, uh, 80 year old woman presented in emergency with complaints of uh, fever stiffness of all four limbs causing difficulty in walking altered sensorium and repetitive tapping movement of the right upper limb for 3 days and she had episodes of palpitation urinary incontinence respiratory distress postural dizziness suggestive of autonomic dysfunction and for the past one month she was taking a tablet of risperidone because of aggressive behavior and excessive to- uh, talking 
so on examination at the time of admission she was if uh, she was febrile and uh, uh, she was in altered sensorium and uh, dehydrated her blood pressure was labile and she had tachycardia and there was generalized rigidity and apart from that uh, she had a tapping movement of the right hand So we can see that uh, she has a uh, tapping movement of the right hand. So this type of stereotypic movements are usually described in uh, malignant catatonia. Uh, uh, but uh, this patient had uh, no features of malignant catatonia, rather she was a case of NMS. And uh, she had this tapping movement. So sometimes you may get uh, overlapping symptoms also. On hematological uh, investigations, her TLC was raised, CPK was very high. MRI was showing some atrophy, EEG and CSF were normal, and she was diagnosed as a case of uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And uh, she was, uh, uh, her uh, offending drug, Respiridone, was stopped. She was treated with a tablet of bromocriptine. Her sensorium improved over the next seven days. CPK came normal, and TLC also decreased to the normal level. And she had significant improvement by day 15 when she was discharged and uh, her event tapping movements also stopped. So uh, this was a case of stereotypy in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Now uh, acute Parkinsonism can also come in emergency and the causes of acute Parkinsonism are structural, drug-induced, toxic, infectious, metabolic and sometimes hereditary causes. And sometimes psychiatric causes may also come in emergency with acute Parkinsonism. Uh, Parkinson patients may also come in emergency because of a variety of causes like trauma and falls, motor fluctuation, dyskinesia, and psychiatric disturbances. And there are some other causes uh, like uh, non-Parkinsonian causes, which may cause uh, medical emergency in Parkinsonism patient, uh, like some infection, cardiovascular disorders, GI disorders, and metabolic disorders. Uh, falls in Parkinson's disease is very common and up to 70% of the patients may have some fall uh, and uh, uh, this type of fall is although more common in PSP patients, uh, but uh, even Parkinson patients who are advanced Parkinson disease, they may also have fall and they may land up in emergency. And sometimes patients may have a very, very malignant type of motor fluctuation or dyskinesia and uh, they may land up in emergency because of dyskinesia. And the treatment of dyskinesia should also include lowering of the levodopa dosage. And sometimes the patients have uh, associated anxiety and uh, the benzodiazepines may be useful to treat such patients. Psychosis is another cause which uh, land up the patient in emergency. And uh, it is more commonly encountered in PD with dementia occurring in around 45 to 60 per five, uh, four percent of the patient. And visual hallucinations are more common than auditory hallucination and usually consists of complex form visual images. Parkinson's disease psychosis may be precipitated by some metabolic conditions, infections, and changes in drug therapy. And dopaminergic drugs that are least potent with respect to motor functions should be reduced like anticholinergics, amantidine, dopamine agonists, MAV inhibitors, and COMT inhibitors. And the daily levodopa dosage may also be lowered if the psychosis persists. So before trying the antipsychotic medications, it's very important that you cut down the medications responsible for psychosis. And usually uh, the antipsychotics which are preferred are clozapine and cutiapine because clozapine has a good effect over levodopine dyskinesia also. But uh, there is a risk of uh, 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 bone marrow suppression and uh, agranulocytosis because of clozapine. So uh, repeated blood counts are required if the patient is given clozapine. Now coming to the hyperkinetic movement disorder, which may cause emergency. And the first one is chorea. So chorea is a uh, involuntary, irregular, purposeless movement that flow into one another in a random uh, fashion. And chorea may result from toxic, metabolic, vascular, and infectious and inflammatory disorders. And Sidenham chorea may also land up in emergency. And sometimes the onset is abrupt and uh, it follows the streptococcal pharyngitis. Uh, other etiologies of uh, uh, chorea which may cause emergency are uh, vascular, metabolic, structural, inflammatory, infectious, autoimmune, and hydrogenic conditions. 
hemichoria hemibelgium is another uh, important differential diagnosis which may lead to emergency manifestation and hemibelgium refers to a large amplitude flinging movements of one side of the body that can be violent and hemi when uh, uh, hemibelgium re resolves over days to weeks the movements often become coriform so coriform movements are usually milder movement in comparison to ballistic movement and the most common cause of hemibelgium is stroke are uh, involving the subthalamic nucleus but there are other causes like non ketotic hyperglycemia uh, where you can get hemichoria hemibelgium syndrome it occurs more in women and it may be the initial presentation of diabetes mellitus and mri t1 weighted images demonstrate hyperintensity of the putamen caudate nucleus and globus pallidus and mri finding results from ischemic injury due to hyperviscosity and regional metabolic failure Myoclonus may also uh, cause a movement disorder emergency, and uh, there are two types of emergency uh, uh, presentation seen in myoclonus. One is myoclonus status epilepticus, and one is post anoxic myoclonus. Myoclonus status epilepticus may begin in hours immediately after a cerebral anoxic event, and this occurs in approximately 30% of the patient who survive the cardiac arrest. And the presence of myoclonus status epilepticus is usually uh, it carries a very poor prognosis. and uh, the chances of recovery is very very low in comparison to this post anoxic myoclonus which is also known as nance adam syndrome usually occurs after recovery from an anoxic event and the axon myoclonus is usually seen and it is uh, supported by abnormal cortical discharges which can be demonstrated in eeg and at rest the movements are absent but with muscle activation they become very very disabling and this syndrome may improve over years so the prognosis while post anoxic myoclonus has a better prognosis uh, in comparison to myoclonic uh, status epilepticus uh, now coming to tics uh, there are two situations where uh, patients may uh, have a emergency presentation one is because of the tic exacerbation and second is neurologic compromise secondary to the tics tics exacerbation may be because of the fatigue stress and there can be infection medications and there can be dramatic increase in severity of the tics that can be very very alarming to the patients and family members one condition known as the twiddler syndrome which follows dvs and the twiddler syndrome occurs when a patient intentionally or unintentionally manipulates the implantable generator and it dislodges the placing leads causing malfunction of the device like here you can see uh, that uh, uh, the patients of a tics has a twiddler syndrome uh, following a very very malignant tics acute dystonic reaction is also uh, fairly common and it's usually happens because of uh, exposure to dopamine receptor blockers within 24 hours of the exposure and 90% of the reactions occur within 5 days and clinical manifestations are diverse and usually affect the head and neck and laryngeal dystonia of lepharos pars cervical dystonia oclogary crisis and focal limb dystonia have all been reported and they are more common in, in young men and treatment with an iv anticholinergic drugs or diphenhydramine is very very effective and because of the possibility of a recurrence a short oral course of an anticholinergic may be necessary in some of the patients status dystonicus uh, may another uh, be a presenting symptom in emergency and these patients uh, have a precipitating events like infection and medication changes in trauma and unremitting dystonic spasm may lead to hyperparesia dehydration respiratory failure and rhabdomyolysis with renal failure and the usual therapeutic approach is uh, to have a combination of agents like anticholinergic benzodiazepine catoclopramine depleting agents and dopamine receptor blocking agents and refractory conditions uh, may respond to neurosurgical intervention uh so this was the study we published last year clinical spectrum of drug induced movement disorder and what was very very surprising uh, that majority of the patients uh, were taking uh, this uh, non drba and they had this uh, uh, drug induced movement disorder including tardive dystonia uh, and uh, tardive dystonia was seen in around 42.2% of the patients so what was very very uh, interesting was that Uh, drba that is uh, dopamine receptor blocking agents they are causing mainly parkinsonism and drba plus non uh, dopaminergic receptor blocking agents 
were more likely to cause uh, tardive dystonia and non-DRBA were causing mostly postural tremor. In stroke setting also, we may get some uh, hyperkinetic movement disorder or sometime hypokinetic like Parkinsonism. Like this is the patient who presented in our uh, uh, emergency and the patient has a uh, rapid uh, tapping movement of the right hand and he has a thalamic stroke. Uh, so this type of stereotype movements are also common in a stroke setting and that should also be considered and because it's a differential diagnosis for other conditions like seizure or maybe hemiballistic conditions. Uh, autoimmune disorders may be another differential diagnosis like uh, we see in young uh, patients, uh, see a case of NMDR encephalitis and she had just presentation of a vocalization and some dystonic presentation in the left upper limb and bilateral lower limb. And most of the patients have a very, very good response uh, with the, uh, with the uh, medications. And we can see uh, that uh, following uh, uh, treatment, she had almost complete recovery. There are some movement disorder mimics which can uh, present in emergency like limb shaking TIA and also motor seizures or epilepsy or partial discontinua can also present. And sometimes pseudo dystonia can also be present. So pseudo dystonia is a condition where you can get acute torticollis because of some other conditions. And pseudo dystonia is usually uh, the mode of onset is acute, the pain is common, the posture is fixed, sensory trick is absent, tremor is uncommon, and worsening on eye closure is very, very common, and additional neurological features are also common. So just to conclude, Although the movement disorders typically have an insidious onset and gradually progressive, they may present as hypokinetic and hyperkinetic presentations and several cannot miss conditions may manifest as movement disorder emergency. And there is an expanding spectrum of antibody mediated movement disorder that present acutely, often associated with encephalitis. Although rare movement disorder emergency are associated with significant morbidity and mortality, and emphasizing the need for their accurate identification and timely management. Thank you. Dr. Pandey, very nice presentation. Dr. Very exhaustive presentation. Can, can you make a comment on functional movement disorder presenting in emergency? Functional movement disorder, you were saying? In presenting in emergency. Yes, so uh, we have just concluded a study and the findings were that uh, uh, the uh, functional movement disorder which present in emergency are mostly they have a speech problem uh, and uh, they have uh, <coughs> eight problems uh, and uh, PNES of course it's not a movement disorder but sometimes we get a combination of PNES and some uh, functional tremor but uh, functional speech disorder is fairly common and uh, many of them are uh, maybe uh, they mimic like stroke and uh, it uh, it's very important uh, like day before a study we had a patient uh, we were just uh, planning to thrombolyze the patient and the moment we are discussing with him that uh, the side effects of thrombolysis he immediately ran away from the bed and he was a functional he spoke <laughs> yes he ran away so 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 it happens uh, and uh, the speech disorders are fairly common in uh, functional setting landing up in emergency very good presentation. You covered up everything. Dr. Pandit, I have a question yes. for you. Yes. Uh, uh, your thoughts on the role of uh, pallidotomy or pallidal DBS in refractory status dystonicus? Yes. So uh, if you see the study, uh, like uh, there is a very large study from the French group, and uh, they have been demo uh, uh, demonstrating that uh, pallidotomy and uh, maybe GPI, DVS, both have a very, very good role in status dystonicus. Uh, I was listening to the talk of Dr. Paul. He extensively covered this topic. Uh, but uh, what is very important that uh, there was a recent review by Dr. Fasano group. And uh, that review was very, very clear that uh, if there are lesions in the brain, the likelihood of response is uh, very, very poor. Uh, so, so the secondary dystonia, uh, like Dr. Paul said, that tardive dystonia, uh, it's a very important condition for DBS. Uh, but secondary dystonia, like secondary to stroke or secondary to some metabolic disorders, 
still it's a just a research indication uh, it's a, uh, not a clear cut recommendation yet thank you dr pandey can i uh, comment on the emergency management dystonia periodotomy uh, yes sir please dr paul please yeah so uh, we did actually initially about 10 years back we did a child uh, very severe pcan mutation and came with a respiratory distress after keeping in the anesthesia for some time uh, after the ventilation we ultimately did a stage bilateral periodotomy still up for 7 8 years also the patient is still you know quite okay the dystonia has almost subsided but the child needs a tracheostomy and a feeding uh, to rise to so definitely it helps in situations uh, you know uh, those who are uh, very very severe status dystonicus after initial stabilization uh, periodotomy can help and our people cannot afford uh, deep vein stimulation so uh, it can help at least to improve the general condition uh, the uh, quality of life if you know the parents understand properly it definitely helps yes sir we also had a very gratifying result in uh, a patient of status dystonia we had to do bilateral uh, parietal dba and yeah. and the the rate of improvement is also quite earlier as compared to uh, yeah. a, a conventional yeah. within one month the patient was fine yes. and uh, it was very gratifying yeah uh, thank you all uh, i think i think uh, we are uh, running slightly behind the schedule so yeah. but this had been a very very informative session for all of us so i like to thank so i think i did, uh, we myself and my co chairman thank the management to give us this opportunity and thank all the three speakers for a wonderful talk thank you so much thank you thank, thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you all so uh, we'll move forward to our next session which is a uh, presidential oration and uh, earlier we had dr bhatia with us here but uh, he had to leave for some urgency uh, so i have dr pn ranjan with me who will be uh, chairing the session and uh, I'll ask uh, Omni Kiris team to please put forward the uh, Dr. Anshu Rohit's introduction slides so that Dr. Rendin can introduce him and ask him to introduce the orator. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my honor and privilege to uh, be the chairman for the session on the present oration, which is going to be delivered by a very good friend. Professor Ram Singh from Sir Ganga Ram Hospital. I would uh, request Anshu uh, to please uh, talk about the orator. There is nothing much to include about Anshu. Both we all know he is a professor of neurology, and uh, at the Ganga Sir Ganga Ram Hospital. So I'll hand over the mic directly to Anshu to please talk about the orator. so that we can get ahead with the operation thank you thank you dr ranjan for the kind words uh, yeah it's my privilege to introduce a very dear friend for last 25 years and a very very respected colleagues not only in delhi but almost all of india so who is now the president of delhi neurological association dr satnam singh so i'll be sharing uh, my slides just give me a minute Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so the uh, so our present president, uh, Dr. Satnam Singh, president of Delhi Neurological Association, is also the chairman of Department of Neurosurgery, Sir Ganga Ram Hospital, and is also the member board of management for Sir Ganga Ram Hospital. Uh, he was born and he had his early schooling in Bareilly, UP. and there after he went ahead and uh, went to king george medical college lucknow where he did his mbbs and ms surgery and subsequently in mch neurosurgery at sanjay gandhi pgi lucknow uh, uh, he joined sir gangaram hospital in 1992 and has been working uh, as a chairman department of neurosurgery since last 10 years his special interest as all of us know is an endoscopic and minimally invasive neurosurgical procedure to learn endoscopic neurosurgery he has visited some of the top endoscopic neurosurgeons professor axel in germany professor jen uh, destand in france professor joe in usa i mean kasem in usa and professor gab in germany 
And of course, he has attended a number of international endoscopic surgical workshops and conferences. And uh, this is some of his uh, uh, file photographs with Professor Excel, with Professor Amin Kassim, with Professor Destando in France, and Henri Bosch in Amsterdam. So what are his achievements? He started, he was one of the pioneers in endoscopic neurosurgery uh, in Delhi. And he started the endoscopic neurosurgery in 1999 and have, has extensively used endoscopic te techniques for both brain and spinal surgery. And his master's is his innovative technique of endoscopic disc surgery and has performed nearly 2000 such apparitions with excellent results and extremely low complication rate. And we have been a witness to all his, uh, all this. He's been invited as a guest faculty to several conferences and workshop on endoscopic skull base and endoscopic spinal surgery. And he's performed many live surgeries and cadaveric workshop across the country on the same. Probably he has performed the largest number of neuroendoscopic procedures in the country. And of course, his mind is very innovative. He had designed a new medical device known as Endospine Plus for an endoscopic disc surgery. So on the right, you can see his this device, which has been devised by Dr. Satnam, and uh, uh, his technique has been published in Acta Neuro uh, Chirurgica in 19, November 2019. And here on the right, you can see the abstract from that publication. And this device has made the technique for endoscopic disc surgery safe, simple, and economical. Uh, this device has already been marketed by ABM Surgicals, and of course. He has a very, in this distinguished career, he has had a number of awards. Uh, going back to 2004, he received the Distinguished Service Award from Delhi Medical Association, Best Scientific Program Award from Delhi Medical Association in March 2005, Nagrik Samman by J.C. Bareilly in 2012, a finalist for the BMJ Award South Asia in 2016, a Times Healthcare Achiever Award in 2018, the Chatrabhuj Agarwal Nagrik Samman in 2019 in Bareilly, and these are some of his file photographs where uh, you can see him with the Prophet uh, Abdul Kalam, with our, um, our minister, and uh, receiving the Chaturbhuj Agarwal Award. And this is his spouse, Dr. Meena Chabra, who is uh, MD medicine and a practicing diabetologist. So it's a great honor and privilege to talk about Dr. Satnam Singh, who is a very dear friend. So I will now request Dr. Satnam to uh, give his talk the presidential oration. Thank you, Dr. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Ishu, for the kind introduction. You are really a good friend. And uh, uh, good afternoon, chairpersons and uh, senior members of the association and friends. First of all, I would like to thank all the members of Delhi Neurological Association for giving me this opportunity to deliver this prestigious oration. Thank you so much. And uh, now I'll start with my oration. I am very passionate about endoscopic neurosurgery. And today I'm going to talk about my passion that is, and the topic which I've selected is neuroendoscopy, its past, present and future. First, I'll talk about what has been the evolution of uh, neurosurgery in the past, a few salient points, and what is being done in the world in this the field and what I am practicing now, and what lies in the future about this. So the history of endoscopic neuroendoscopy or rather endoscopy dates back to last two centuries and that of a neuroendoscopy last one century. Just one second. So Flip Bosini from Germany, a physician, he was the one who designed first endoscope, primitive endoscope in 1806. And he called it as a light letter. Light letter in Germany means light conductor. And uh, this was the design which he has made, the speculum of various sizes and dimensions. And he had put a candle light at the proximal end and a reflector to reflect the light inside. And he was using this device 
for examination of ear, nasal cavity, oral cavity, rectal cavity, urethral cavity. So this was very initial design. Unfortunately, he died very young at the age of 36 because he suffered typhus while he was treating patients of typhus in epidemic. And uh, so he couldn't develop it further. So then a urologist from France, Desormio, he was the one who designed a new endoscope in 1853. And uh, he is known as father of uh, cystoscopy. In fact, he is the one who designed, who coined the word. Sir, now you are muted. Yeah, it's okay now. Yeah. So he is known as father of endoscopy and he is the one who coined the word endoscope. He used a kerosene lamp at the proximal end of this endoscope and a reflector to reflect the light inside. And he had put a lens here to focus the light inside. And uh, that's all. I can't. So then another urologist from Germany, Macmillan Mise in 1879, he made another endoscope where he had put a series of lenses inside this tube to have the magnification. And another change which he made was a, he put a platinum lamp at the tip of the endoscope, which went inside. And his idea was to illuminate the room, you must carry the light inside. But the problem he was encountering was that it used to heat up and produce burn. So he had to introduce some kind of cooling system. So later on, this lamp was replaced by Edison lamp. Edison lamp was evolved by that time. So it was replaced by Edison lamp. So by the end of 19th century, that means 1890 or so, the endoscopes of various design, various sizes and dimensions were available to perform cystoscopy, bronchoscopy, and gastroscopy. And endoscopy was quite established procedure by the end of 19th century. It was in early 20th century when a urologist from Chicago, Dr. Espinasse, in 1910, he performed first neuroendoscopic procedure. He did choroid plexus resection in two infants with a cystoscope for treatment of hydrocephalus. Unfortunately, one of them died and other one survived for five years after that. Then W.J. Mixter, chief of neurosurgery at Mass General Hospital, he was the first one to perform endoscopic third ventriculostomy with a urethroscope in 1923. Then Walter Dendy, who is known as father of modern neurosurgery, he designed, uh, redefined the design of endoscope. He, in fact, he designed the ventriculoscope and coined the word ventriculoscope. And he, he used it for the treatment of hydrocephalus in infants. He used to perform choroid plexus resection through this. By, 9, by 1932, he was routinely doing it, but he was still not very happy with the procedure because it, he himself has written it that it, there are limited indications where it can be done. So these are the neurosurgeons which further refined the procedure like Wittemann, he introduced a electrocautery for fulguration of choroid plexus uh, resection in 1934, and then scarf introduced a mobile tip for the endoscopic third ventriculostomy and he published many series of endoscopic third ventriculostomy in early 90s, 90 till 1950. So, but still, by this time, endoscopic third ventriculostomy was not very popular because of the problem of the illumination was not good, magnification was not good, and there were a lot of complications. So a ventricular shunt was invented by Nelson and Spitz in 1952 uh, from University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And after this, further modifications took place in the shunt technology by Holter and Pudens and other people. So shunt became a popular procedure for the treatment of ventricular dilatation, hydrocephalus. And uh, so people lost interest in uh, endoscopy. Shunting was a simple, safe procedure with good success rate. So surgeons lost interest in endoscopic procedure. For the next two, three decades, the endoscopy went into background. And uh, simultaneously, there was development in micro neurosurgery also. So micro neurosurgery also led to a lot of good illumination, magnification. So interest in endoscopy was not there. But during this next two decades, a lot of development 
in technology took place in the field of endoscopy, like uh, uh, Harold Hopkins, a British optical physicist, he introduced a new red uh, rod lens system for the endoscope. This was the endoscope which he had designed with rod lenses and uh, small air lenses in between, which improved the resolution and magnification of the endoscope. And he sold this technology to Carl Stoes and Carl Stoes marketed these Hopkins telescope, which are still available and we are using it. And they give a very good magnification and resolution. And uh, twice he was nominated for Nobel Prize, but unfortunately he couldn't get it, but uh, he got several other awards. Then fiber optic cables were invented in 1954. Harold Hopkins and Narendra Singh Company successfully experimented transmission of image through fiber optic cables in 1954. And they published their paper in the journal Nature as a flexible fiber scope using static technique, static scanning. This invention led to development of flexible endoscopes for gastroscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, all these endoscopes, flexible endoscopes are based on this technology only. A lot of development took place. Fiber optic cables for light transmission, which we are using for during endoscopic surgery and uh, microscopic surgery, etc. So when I was doing this homework, Narendra Singh Kapni, I thought, let's see, Google it further, who is, I was not really aware of. So I Googled him further. And I found certain interesting facts. So we all Indians should be very proud of this, that he was born in India. And after initial schooling in Dehradun, he went to Agra University for graduation. And then he went to Imperial College of London for his PhD with the Harold Hopkins and finally moved to USA where he settled. He was the one who coined the word fiber optics in 1960 in scientific American where he wrote an article and uh, he used this word. And this fiber optics has become a household word around the world. We are using fiber optic internet in our homes and fiber optics in, uh, in uh, all these endoscopes and all. He is credited with inventing fiber optics and is considered to be the father of fiber optics. Fortune magazine in 1999, at the end of 20th century, named him as one of the seven unsung heroes of the 20th century for his Nobel Prize winning, for his Nobel Prize deserving invention. And uh, he has more than 100 patents to his credit. He was awarded India's second highest civilian award, the Padam Vibhushan, posthumously last year only. He died in 2020. Then CCD chip was invented in 1969. CCD chip is the brain of all digital and video cameras nowadays, which and it converts optical signal to electrical signals. So this led to further improvement and miniaturization of the camera and greatly enhanced image quality. So we are using all these digital camera during endoscopic procedures to transmit it to the TV screen and perform the surgery. So this also led to a lot of improvement. So rediscovery of neuroendoscopy. So in by the 1980s or so, people started seeing the complications of shunt surgery like shunt block, shunt infection, migration, over, over drainage. So they were looking for another option for treatment of hydrocephalus. They went back and started looking at endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So there was a rediscovery of endoscopic third ventriculostomy for treatment of hydrocephalus in the uh, late 80s and 90s. So in 1990, Jones et al. described 50% shunt-free success, shunt success rate for endoscopic third ventriculostomy in 24 patients. And by 1994, they had improved the success rate to 61% in another 130 patients. So nowadays, we are using endoscopic third ventriculostomy to treat obstructed hydrocephalus with a success rate of more than 90% except infants. So it has become a quite a standard procedure now. So the ventricular, ventricular endoscopy these days is being used for treatment of hydrocephalus. Uh, we are, the various procedures which we are doing is endoscopic third ventriculostomy, septopelisodotomy, septostomy, acuductoplasty for the treatment of intraventricular and extraventricular cysts, evacuation of hematomas, biopsies, and removal of intraventricular tumors and colloid cysts. 
So after ventricular endoscopy, the next development which took place in the field of endoscopic neurosurgery was that was endoscopic pituitary surgery. By 1980s and early 90s, ENT surgeons were routinely using endoscope for endoscopic sinus surgery. So it was natural for them to look at the uh, cella tussica and with their neurosurgeons, they wanted to go inside. So first paper on endoscopic pituitary surgery came from Jankowski. Uh, in 1992, uh, he was an ENT surgeon from France, and he published a series of three patients who were operated endoscopically for pituitary tumor, successfully operated. The next paper came from Dharam Singh, Dharamveer Singh Sethi and Prem Pillay from Singapore, and they, in uh, 1995, and they reported a series of 40 patients of endoscopic pituitary surgery, for, and uh, out of which 40 were uh, 38 for pituitary tumor and two were craniofrangioma. And they used a speculum through which, nasal speculum through which they introduced the endoscope and performed endoscopic pituitary surgery. The landmark paper on endo pure endoscopic pituitary surgery technique came from Carao and Joe. Carao from University of Pittsburgh. Carao is an ENT surgeon and Joe is a neurosurgeon. And they reported a series of 50 patients, pure endoscopic, single nostril technique, no speculum and a very successful report. We also read their article and started following them. And after endoscopy pituitary surgery, these are the pioneer, pioneer neurosurgeons who expanded the endoscopy pituitary surgery to the whole of the skull base, right from the anterior cranial fossa to middle cranial fossa to posterior cranial fossa. And uh, they further uh, improved the technique by using a binostral technique instead of a uninostral technique and two surgeon technique. One surgeon is holding the endoscope and other surgeon performs surgery with both the hands by manual technique, which improves the surgical procedure markedly. This is a Divitis and Kappa Bianca from Italy, Naples, and this is Amin Kayasam from Pittsburgh, USA. They have completely revolutionized this endoscopic Expanded, this is known as expanded endoscopic endonasal surgery. Remarkable evolution has taken place in the last two decades, and it has evolved from simple pituitary surgery to lesions from cribriform plate to CV junctions, like here, right? You can operate right from cribriform plate to cella to clivers to CV junction. And it has become almost a gold standard approach for lesions of cella, retrocellar, cella, retrocellar, and uh, clival reason. However, anterior cranial fossa lesions can also be op operated through this approach, but uh, still its role is debatable. This is just another. So Axel Perneski from Germany, I have visited him several times. He uh, described the endoscopic assisted microneurosurgery and uh, keyhole approach. He in fact visited our hospital also and con uh, conducted a workshop way back in 2001. So endoscopic neurosurgery besides ventricular surgery and uh, skull-based surgery, it is being used for other indications as well, like endoscopic surgery for craniosynostosis, endoscopic assistant microneurosurgery for aneurysms, tumors, microvascular decompressions, endoscopic surgery for orbital tumors, endoscopic surgery for carpal tunnel and other peripheral nerves, endoscopic spinal surgery, which itself is a big topic. So I'll stop. Uh, history for the time being before it becomes very boring. So I'll start with my journey with endoscopy. We acquired endoscope system in 1999 and started doing ventricular endoscopic surgery after visiting and watching Axel Perneski. And then after going through articles of Joe and Carol, we started uh, endoscopic pituitary surgery with our ENT colleagues in year 2000. And then after visiting Gene Destando, I started doing endoscopic spinal surgery in 2003. Now I'll share it with you uh, uh, my experience. So this is the first patient where we performed endoscopic third ventriculoscopy. This child came to us with obstructed hydrocephalus and blocked shunts. Eight-year-old child who was shunted outside and uh, a shunt was done on one side first, which got blocked. Then another shunt was done on the other side, which also got blocked. So we did a third ventriculostomy and uh, both shunts were removed. And six months later, you can see no hydrocephalus and no shunt and child is cured of hydrocephalus. 
I will, uh, this is video of endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I will skip this video for the time being. I'll show you later. And this is a case of intraventricular lesion. This 12 year old child came to us with acute hydrocephalus and unconscious state. MRI showed hydrocephalus and there was some lesion in the posterior third ventricle. We went inside and found there was a cysticercus in the third ventricle, which was blocking the third ventricle. This is for a man Monroe and through for a man Monroe, the cysticercus is bulging. And uh, simply by a frontal burrow, we went inside and cysticercus was removed. And the uh, child became awake and cured. There was no problem after that. So, cystic circus has come out in one piece. Similarly, uh, juxta juxtaventricular arachnoid cysts can be treated endoscopically by communicating them with the ventricle, either by doing ventriculocystostomy or ventriculocystocystonostomy. Like this is a patient who has got large supracellar arachnoid cyst, which is blocking third ventricle and causing hydrocephalus. This can be treated by endoscopically by going inside the lateral ventricle and then communicating the cyst with the lateral ventricle. And another complication can be made with the basal cisterns here. And uh, this can be treated endoscopically. This is just to show you a small video. This is foramen Monroe and this is supracellar cyst, arachnoid cyst coming out of foramen Monroe. Its wall is coagulated and then fenestrated and communicated with the lateral ventricle. And then I've gone inside and this is the Lilyquist membrane in the base and it is communicated with the basal cisterns. An opening is made and further it is inflated with Fogarty catheter. This is the basal artery pulsating here. Similarly, intraventricular tumor biopsy can be taken. Endoscopy offers a direct vision and approach to deep-seated lesions in the ventricles. And uh, we can go in and take a biopsy from them. And simultaneously, we can perform endoscopic third ventriculostomy if the tumor is causing obstructed hydrocephalus. Like this 17-year-old boy came to us with headache and hydrocephalus, and there was a lesion in the posterior third ventricle. Here, it was blocking the aqueduct. And we went in, and uh, since uh, we had to do, uh, we planned to do third ventriculostomy also and take a biopsy. So we had to take a two different trajectory for third ventriculostomy. We made a coronal burrow here and went in like this through firm and mono. And for this approach, we had to make another burrow and go in through firm and mono and go in this direction. So two burrows were made like this: coronal burrow for the third ventriculostomy, and then more frontal burrow for the biopsy from the posterior part of the third ventricle. And this is for a man choroid plexus, thermostrite vein, for a man mono. We have gone inside. This is the floor of third ventricle. And these are mammillary bodies, basilar artery. The floor of third ventricle is punctured. This is endoscopic third ventricle ostomy. So one has to be very careful about the basilar artery because that is very close to this. And then with the Fogarty catheter balloon, the hole is inflated. The hole is enlarged further. So one can go inside and see. So now I'm going in to take a biopsy from the lesion in the, this is the interthalamic adhesions. And this is the tumor there in the aqueduct. And now this biopsy has been taken. And this turned out to be neurocytoma, benign tumor. And we took a biopsy and uh, performed third ventriculostomy. And in four years now, 
child is all right under observation. The tumor has not increased in size. So similarly, colloid cysts can be treated endoscopically. This is pre-operative. This is post-operative picture. This is another case of colloid cysts, pre-operative and post-operative picture. So we started endoscopic pituitary surgery in year 2000 with the help of your ENT colleagues. But after first 20 cases, I realized that this can be done without ENT surgeons also because they used to try to dominate also. So learning became difficult because they were already expert in endoscopic sinus surgery. So we stopped calling them. And uh, in 2011, we started using binostral technique after watching Amin Kazam and forehand technique in 2013. And this is how we were operating in the beginning of 2000. Endoscope was held either with the left hand or on a holding device and instruments were used to the same nostril to perform the surgery. This is the video which I had recorded in year 2000, 2002. It's a very old video and uh, one goes inside and uh, this is how middle terminate is pushed laterally, this is nasal septum, sphenoid sinus has been opened. One gets a panoramic view of endoscope, uh, this sphenoid sinus here. And uh, so dura has been opened and one can remove the tumor with suction cautery. One can go inside after you can take the endoscope inside to visualize from inside. So the tumor has been removed completely. So I presented my early experience of endoscopic pituitary surgery in Asian Australian Congress of Neurology Skull Surgeons way back in 2003. Then we started using a binostral technique and uh, two surgeon technique. One surgeon, my associate is holding the endoscope and uh, I'm performing surgery using both my hands through both the nostrils. So it becomes a lot more easy to manipulate the instruments. You can easily do it with both hands, better 3D perception. So now coming on to the expanded approaches, you can go beyond the limits of cella, like this is craniopharyngioma, which is lying in supracellar compartment and mostly in the third ventricle, the last tumor is lying there. And uh, this is the extended approach. And uh, this is the bone of cella tusca has been removed. Now I'm drilling on the bone of uh, planum spinadale and tuberculum celli. This bone has been removed. Madura is being opened at the level of tubercum celli above uh, now this is a tumor here you can see this is optic chiasma optic nerves this tumor is within the stalk of the pituitary gland and uh, the capsule has been opened and tumor is being removed piecemeal And you can see one gets a beautiful view of inside. So, 
So this is the immediate post-operative CT scan where most of the tumor has been removed. The third ventricle is normal in size, and you can see. There's another case of tuberculum cell meningioma. You can see a large meningioma here, which is entrapping vessels also, compressing optic nerves. This was also removed endoscopically, and uh, the bone is being drilled. And uh, the great advantage of going through nose for tuberculum cell meningioma is that you encounter, you coagulate the dura first, and so blood supply of the dura of the meningioma is coagulated and tumor becomes quite avascular. If you go transcranially, you encounter the supply of the tumor, blood supply of the tumor after tumor removal. So, so here you can see inside the tumor is being removed. Uh, I'll skip most stuff. So here, after tumor removal, you can see both optic nerves, the asthma, optic uh, stock of the pituitary, both carotid, uh, the anterior cerebral artery, A1 and A2. And this is how we repair it. This is the post-operative MRI of this patient. The tuberculum cell meningioma has been completely removed. This is the contrast MRI. So there is a complete removal. I think I'll skip this. So this is a case just to show you a few examples. Giant pituitary adenoma, which has gone supracellar into the third ventricle, retrocellular compartment, and giant, really giant pituitary adenoma, which was removed endoscopically. You can see post-operative complete removal. Same patient. Another case of pituitary tumor, pre-operative, post-operative picture. Another case of pituitary tumor, pre and post. So just to show you a few examples, microadenoma, pituitary microadenoma. This is a large chordoma, pre-operative, post-operative picture. Another clival chordoma, pre-operative, post-operative picture. Another chordoma which has gone into the brainstem, into the subarachnoidal spaces, removed endoscopically, post-operative pictures. Cellular arachnoid cyst, which has been communicated with supracellular systems, post-operative picture. Transnasal odontidectomy, endoscopy odontidectomy. So I have performed nearly 440 patients endoscopically, out of which 423 were pituitary adenoma. And this is other pathologies. So coming on to endoscopic spinal surgery. So endoscopic spinal surgery can be used anterior approaches like cervical approach, thoracoscopic surgery for thoracic spine, laparoscopic surgery for lumbar spine, Posterior approaches through different kind of trocars for mostly for degenerative diseases can be used for tumors, infections also. Endoscopic surgery for this is a surgery. Two types of techniques are described: microendoscopic discectomy and postolateral endoscopic discectomy. I am using microendoscopic discectomy, so I'll describe that. Basically, microendoscopic discectomy is through a trocar, uh, micro discectomy performed under endoscopic vision through a trocar. And uh, first article on this technique came in 1997 from Foley and Smith. They designed a tube through which a three millimeter telescope was used. But unfortunately, this didn't become very popular because of a smaller dia uh, telescope, the picture quality was not very good. Then Jean Destendo from France, he described a different kind of trocar, which had multiple channels. And this is for the suction working instruments. And this is for the telescope. This tube doesn't require any fixation. So I went to Gene Destendo and learned it from him and started practicing it. So, but after first 100 cases, I realized certain limitations in the, this tube that uh, these fixed channels make the procedure a bit difficult. You couldn't manipulate or change the angle between the instruments. And so I realized why not have a empty space, hollow space, so that you can change the angulation between the instruments like a Foley Smith tube. And this time the oral diameter was also quite big. So in season size used to become around three centimeters. So I was not very up. We could work with a smaller size tube. So I made it hollow from inside and reduce the diameter of this tube. 
And uh, since 2005, 2006, I've been using it all in all my patients, more than 1800 patients have operated with this tube without any problem. This was published in 2019. And uh, this is what is modified. And uh, this uh, Olter also modified the tube recently. So indication of microdiscectomy are same as for uh, routine microdiscectomy. All kind of discs can be operated, like extruded, contained, lateral canal osmosis can be operated. This is how. I've... So this is just the outside view. The tube doesn't require any fixation. You move it freehand. Just give a small one point five centimeter at the desired level where you want to go in, that level is marked under, under X-ray. And incision is given about 1.5 centimeter size in length and one centimeter away from the midline. And uh, it's quite easy. The tip of your instrument is always under vision. So this is just endoscopic view, L5S1 disc on the left side. The fenestration is performed. And this is cranial, caudal, and uh, ligamentum flavum has been removed. The dura is exposed, the nerve root is exposed, the nerve root is retracted. Medially, if the disc is bulging in the shoulder of the root. And then the discectomy is performed. So similarly, one can perform uh, spinal decompression for canal stenosis in a minimally invasive way with the same trocar. It is introduced on one side of the spinous process and first ipsilateral decompression is done. Then and we go under the lamina, under the spinous process to the opposite side and perform contralateral decompression. The whole of spinal dura is decompressed without destabilizing the spinous process, interspinous ligament, lig uh, the lamina on the other side, interlaminal ligament. So stability of spine is maintained and you, one can achieve complete decompression. This is just to show you a small video clip. L4-5 level, this is L4-5 level. We are going from left side. This is cranial, this is caudal, this is the medial side and this is lateral side. So you can see the whole dura has been exposed. This is the opposite contralateral nerve root, which is being decompressed through a small 1.5 centimeter incision. And this is the ipsilateral nerve root, which is being decompressed. So complete bilateral decompression has been achieved. Similarly, one can remove a far lateral disc through the same approach. Uh, I think I'll skip this video because it's becoming too lengthy. This is a video of cervical disc, posterior lateral disc herniation at C67 level. So patient is position prone and uh, medial facetectomy and fenestration is done. The dura is exposed, the nerve root is, exiting nerve root is exposed. This is the dura and this is the nerve root being exposed. And these discs are generally bulging in the axilla of the nerve root. This is the nerve root and this is the bulging disc. These are generally free fragments. And the fragment has been removed. So I have operated uh, about 1962 patients in the last uh, 17, 18 years, out of which 438 were canal stenosis. Their age ranged from 14 to 82 years. 
and two levels were operated and two patients. This is the different levels that I've operated. Most of these patients just stayed overnight in the hospital. And there was no major complication in any of these patients, no nerve root injury. 93% had good to excellent results. This is just to show you a few examples. Uh, extruded disc, central disc. And uh, you can see a very tight canal osmosis, which was operated endoscopically. So this is the amount of decompression which you used, you can achieve with this technique. You can see the tight canal here, and here it has been decompressed bilaterally. Cervical disc, whose video I showed, pre-operative and post-operative picture. So advantages are minimally invasive, smaller in season, less painful, early discharge from the hospital, and quick return to work. And this is the real time in season, which you can see about 1.5 centimeter and which could easily be covered with a bandit. And this is how a patient before entering the operation theater and within six to eight hours after surgery is walking comfortably. So this was about what I am doing. I have skipped a few videos because of the lack of the time. And uh, now I'll talk briefly about, very briefly about the future of neuroendoscopy. A lot of new development is taking place. And, and in future, we are going to have many new technologies. I'm very fascinated about this technology, chip on tip technology, which I'll talk about uh, after the slide. 3D endoscopes are already available, but a lot of improvement is taking with, again, with chip and tip technology, flexible endoscopes also. The presently available endoscopes are very expensive, very delicate. And this is also changing. Robotic endoscopic surgery, endoscopic ultrasonic aspirator, and hyperspectral imaging. So imagine till now the endoscope which we are using is that this is an endoscope which contains rod length system and this is a big camera there, CCD camera, and you need a light cable to transmit the live xenon light through fiber optic cables. And imagine if we have just a, no camera outside, no light cables, just a stick, and on that stick we fix a, a, a small microchip here, camera chip. And we put a LED light here. So no camera outside, no light source outside, just a cable on a stick. A stick can be rigid, can be semi-rigid or flexible. So you can change them, mold the chip, mold the, uh, this uh, stick to change the angle. And uh, this, this is a very exciting technology. And these chips are CMOS chip based on the same technology which we are using in our mobile phones. And these chips are very cheaper than uh, CCD chips and easy to produce. So future is going to be with chip on tip technology type of endoscope. These endoscopes can be very cheap, disposable, very slim. So this is going to change or revolutionize the endoscopic techniques in future. Some of them are already available in the market like this is fiber, not fiber optic, flexible endoscope with no fiber optic inside, all electronic cables. This is laryngoscope, which is already available in the market. Robotics are being tried for endoscopic surgery, especially endoscopic skull-based surgery. It can be very useful for suturing after uh, removal of tumor, dural repair. So endoscope, the robotic is very useful in suturing in tight spaces. So that is the main problem with the endoscopic skull basis that you really can't suture it after your removal of the tumor. So CSF leak is still a significant problem. Robo can be very helpful there. Hyperspectral imaging. The fluorescence, compat uh, fluorescence compatible endoscopes can be made. ICG compatible endoscopes are already available in the market. ALA compatible endoscopes will also be available soon. So these can differentiate between normal tissue and abnormal tissue, between tumor tissue and uh, uh, normal tissue. So they are better for the surgery. Thank you so much. Thanks for the patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Satnam, for an excellent presentation.
I think you took us all around on the endoscopy. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sadnam, for the wonderful lecture. And I thank Dr. P. N. Anjan, sir, uh, for chairing the session. Uh, now, uh, taking the program forward, uh, I would like to request Dr. Sushir Pandey uh, to moderate, moderate the uh, next session uh, for demyelinating disease. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the next session is our exciting section on the demyelinating disease. Uh, this is the fifth section. And for this, uh, for a ch uh, chairperson, I would like to welcome Dr. Neera Chaudhary uh, from uh, Savdajang Hospital. Is Dr. Neera Chaudhary is there? Yeah, I'm there. Thank uh, you. And Dr. Sumit Singh from the RTMS Hospital. Dr. Sumit Singh is there. And uh, Dr. Shamsher Divedi, please confirm your presence. Yeah, I am there. I am there. Okay. I am there. And uh, um, Dr. Sumit Singh is not there, I think. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, over to chairpersons. Let's start the session. Uh, please welcome the orators. Yeah, um, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to have the pleasant task of introducing speakers and also would like to congratulate them for an excellent organization of uh, this DNACon. So um, uh, we'll go straight away to the speakers. So the first speaker is Dr. Uh, Rohit Bhatia. He is a professor Neurology, all in the Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, and he's a very passionate worker about multiple sclerosis. So today he will be talking about the consensus of the magnums, the uh, um, consortium, and the uh, North American imaging uh, criteria for imaging in multiple sclerosis. So over to Dr. Rohit Bhatia. Thank you, Dr. Neera, for the kind introduction, and I thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak on the topic. Uh, so I was asked to speak on the magnums uh, and the consortium of MS centers and the North American MS uh, group uh, recommendations, which so it is like a, a overview of the uh, consensus recommendations, uh, which were published last year in 2021. Uh, kind of a bit changed from the last magnums recommendations and we will touch upon the core things. So as we all know that we use MRI for diagnosis, differential diagnosis, prognostication, follow-up and safety in MS. And if there is one investigation which is the core in the diagnosis, I think it is an MRI scan which, which probably has revolutionized neurology in particular and neurosciences in general. So uh, when we talk about these consensus guidelines, they have touched down upon the various components uh, which comes from the diagnosis. Uh, second point being the follow-up and the third being the safety. I think as neurologists, we look into these three cardinal things when it comes to the management of patients with MS. So this is the paper and this is the position paper which was published in 2021 and I would be overviewing this paper and then, and then summarizing it in the end with a bit of my own take on this. Uh, of course, this is a large group which must have already put in a lot of effort in going for and against the different recommendations, but there could be some things which could always be tweaked and individualized to a patient care. These recommendations don't mean that you don't change them when it is required for a patient. You can always modify them as per the need of a patient. So in this background of this uh, guidelines, uh, the Magnums uh, had brought in some important uh, guidelines in 2020, uh, 2015 and they were Again, kind of modified by a consortium of MS centers consensus guidelines in 2016 and kind of adopted by some important guidelines internationally, including the Swedish Neuroradiology Society guidelines and the Menactrim Society from the Middle East and North Africa. So they had been slowly adopting to this uh, component of the guidelines, especially related to imaging and the follow up. So this time, these three, this three big groups got together and came up with suggestions and recommendations from multiple experts 
how to really bring in a more methodical way of following up these patients or diagnosing these patients using an MRI scan because of its uh, multiple facets I would say time spent on the MRI availability of the MRI cost of the MRI there are many things which will come into the play when we are when we are asking for an imaging for a patient so the focus of these recommendations were how to use the MRI for the diagnosis prognosis and treatment and the most important thing which has changed in these guidelines is an appropriate and judicious use of GAD I was I would like to reiterate that fact that GAD enhancement is routinely used by many of us in follow-up of our patients but we need to be judicious as to when to use an important component being a standardized reporting methodology what you actually want to report you can't have a random reporting of patients it needs to follow a pattern and it needs to take into the consideration the previous MRI of the patient and an important component of special situations like childhood pregnancy and the postpartum period so these guidelines cover pretty much most of the things uh, which have been which are used in clinical practice so let's go to the initial standardized brain protocol so we must have at least 1.5 tesla we all agree to that and 3 tesla for brain is always preferable if it is available so it is a preferred thing and remember we just need three core sequences we need a t2 weighted 3d flare we need an axial t2 and a t1 weighted with gadolinium these are the three core sequences if you have in your patients your diagnosis is not going to be difficult in your patients if you have a 3d flare sequence and that is routinely performed in your center that can be and that can be uh, you know uh, uh, targeted to given different planes you can actually do this by using a 3d flare and actually changing into the coronal and axial very easily the pre-contrast T1 weighted is not required it really doesn't help and diffusion weighted will not replace contrast so don't use DWI and say that we've used DWI and we don't need a contrast scan optic nerve is really not required in the diagnosis unless you are making a diagnosis of atypical optic neuritis or NMO or MOG where it may be required and the follow-up for patients like 6 to 12 months of patients is recommended if your initial diagnosis is a bit uncertain spinal cord imaging is not really required in follow-up diagnosis and GAD is not really recommended if you're initially making an MRI diagnosis by using an MRI on a close follow-up and of course special sequences like SWI or diffusion or a double inversion recovery will be limited if your differential diagnosis is way up like if you are differentially diagnosing someone with a vasculitis or a vascular phenomenon then of course SWI has to be included in the initial diagnosis so this is the pretty much the uh, the usual thing uh, uh, 2d uh, turbo spin uh, axial t2 but if you have actually a 3d flare you don't need a 2 2d don't waste your time on going t2 weighted images if your 3d weighted images flare is actually available with you because that's going to help you much more and the rest of them are of course going to be optional and important thing is that you delay and bring both of these together so you inject the gadolinium take your flare sequence and then take the patient quickly for the gadolinium scan don't inject and do the gadolinium right away it's not going to help you so that's something that is important in patients diagnosis and this is a typical example of a 3d flare sequence which which is pretty much used in practice by most of us and you would see that in this 3d flare sequence this flare sequence has been now constructed to an axial sequence this is our patient same single sequence reconstructed by using a 3d plane and you can actually see that you can see exactly what you want to see in the axial by using one 3d flare sequence which will reconstruct into all planes so that's an example of this in the spinal cord protocol you just need a t2 weighted preferably if you have it that's good enough and for the initial diagnosis you should have a combined brain and a spine contrast and that's good enough don't waste money on 3T sequences of spine. They are not recommended and they are not useful than 1.5T. If you have a 1.5D for spine, it's great and good enough. There is no role of additional 3T sequence in diagnosing MS when it comes to a spine MRI. But of course, if the patient is within the same console and you are doing spine and brain at the same time, that's of course reasonable to go ahead and do uh, with, with T2 weighted, you know, a SAT sequence and of course a post contrast at the same time and this is typically much the different uh, you know 
uh, sequences you see a proton density you see a t2 weighted you see a inversion recovery and you see a post contrast and of course if you have the axials in the first go they're going to help you by showing you discrete lesions large lesions combined discrete and large lesions which can help you differentiate between you know ms nmo and mock disorders that may help you in the beginning of the diagnosis so there are few important uh, take home points for the mri timing you should obtain a brain baseline brain MRI before starting treatment or switching treatment. That's always a good thing to do. If you are if you are making a diagnosis in the beginning and you have started treatment, it may be good to have a new baseline MRI, which is about three to six months after treatment. Uh, that will help you to avoid misinterpretation of lesions that develop before the therapeutic onset. And that's important because you may actually start interpreting them in a very different manner. Longer intervals are to be considered who are treated with DMTs that are slow acting, for example, glatimer or interferons, which are used less now because most of us are tending to use the oral formulations. Use a new uh, baseline MRI after treatment initiation without gadolinium, unless you are really suspecting a very active disease. If you are thinking that you don't have a good quality MRI at the baseline, then of course after treatment initiation on the first follow-up please include a gadolinium scan but if you already have a good quality gadolinium scan in the baseline there is no need to do that at follow-up they generally have recommended yearly brain mri but i am not someone who's very much fond of that to do constantly over a period of time i would say for the first maybe couple of years or three years it is a good idea but if you are having a stable patients start thinking of a longer treatment gap i mean longer imaging gap maybe every two years or three years or in case you are suspecting something and you're following up the patient closely for example a patient on natalizumab who may require eventually even a six monthly mri is a different subset we're talking about some people who are not on those drugs which is going to potentially increase their risk of jcv and of course uh, who show disease activity on the mri and you are concerned that these are more aggressive cases you can of course do a more closer follow-up of the MRI, but don't use gadolinium every year. That's not really recommended anymore. So if you look at this new baseline, which is three to six months, you can do a first follow-up 12 months, 24 months. And of course, every year while on treatment, gadolinium will strictly remain optional for specific patients and not for all patients in routine practice. So what do you use on follow-up? You just use an abbreviated MRI protocol. There's no point doing a large protocol for your patients and wasting time and energy. Please use an abbreviated protocol like a 3D T2 weighted flare. And let me tell you in practice, most of us would look at the flare and T2, axial and, 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 and you know, sagittals. We really don't waste times on T1. We really don't waste time on SWIs. We don't waste time on DWI for a diagnosed patient on follow-up. That's a waste of time. That's a waste of energy. And you can actually do more patients. I'm talking about especially academic centers where there's so much pressure of imaging. You can abbreviate your protocol and make it much lesser so you can accommodate more patients. And of course, an optional gadolinium, depending on a clinical need, you decide whether you need it, but it's not really recommended. Maybe I'll talk to that about it later on my take and we should minimize its use. Spinal cord MRI is not recommended for a follow-up and I will give it my take a bit on that. Optic nerve MRI is not recommended for follow-up. You should report rather active or new enlarging T2 lesions but I have a difference of opinion because I'm not sure whether they really equate to a contrast MRI but that is what is being recommended that they may really be helpful rather than putting contrast to patients every year because that's not considered safe anymore at all not considered safe anymore so abbreviated protocol and just report the enlarging t2 lesions will help you so what is the recommendation for use of uh, you know contrast agents we don't we don't recommend at a diagnosis of the baseline uh, we recommend it for diagnosis of baseline dissemination in time but they are not really recommended for the patients for a follow-up diagnosis. If you have a patient in the first year of treatment and it's a highly active disease, it is recommended. And of course, in a patient where you have considering consideration of disease modifying therapy to be changed and that too to an MRI to a disease modifying therapy, which is more aggressive, it may be prudent to do a good baseline before you convert these patients into a second line. And in a patient in whom you are screening for a PML in the presence of a suspicious lesion. 
So it is not really recommended on follow-up diagnosis for dissemination in time, not recommended for a new baseline scan and not recommended for PML screening, not recommended in pregnancy, it's contraindicated and sometimes even in lactation it is really not recommended. And we very well know that uh, in the monitoring of the safety, we should do it if we are considering an alternative diagnosis in mind and of course switching patients for a different medication. It is important that in a PML risk estimation, we must do an annual MRI and patients who have actually now going to almost two years of treatment, we should try and do it more frequently. But I guess most of us will now transition patients when they become positive to a different medication. So this may not be really relevant, but if you are for, you know, in a situation where you don't have an availability of a drug for immediate and you want to give this patient slightly more longer treatment with good monitoring, then you will require these patients to get more frequent MRIs, maybe even six months, but just do a plain MRI. And unless you already have a suspicion of PML, then you're going to go all the way around to right diagnose it. But if the suspicion is not there, you're just going to follow up. Just try to do only plain MRIs for PML risk estimation. Just your one flare and T2 is good enough every six months for the patients. And of course, where you're suspecting PML or PML iris, you will have to do a gadolinium scan. So that is something that is clearly listed. In pediatric, we have same principles. No difference in from adults. That's single liner and that's I think uh, it's pretty clear to me. In pregnancy, MRI is not contraindicated. There's a concern in the first trimester and we should be careful if we can kind of not use it. But it should be assessed by a case to case basis and use your standardized protocols. No gadolinium in pregnancy. I again reiterate, we don't use gadolinium till you have a life saving disorder which is different. I'm talking about MS specifically so don't related to other disorders but in lactation it is not contraindicated and do it if it is necessary and if a patient has completed pregnancy and is delivered uh, we should do a another baseline MRI two to three months after deliveries when you are now starting planning to start treatment use your baseline MRI as your new MRI because the patient has been off treatment maybe for almost a year or more than a year planning her pregnancy. So this is my take and this is the, the key conclusions. So we have an MRI brain sequence, which we say axial T2, sagittal, axial and 3D sequence. I fully endorse this. It is recommended and that is recommended for MS diagnosis. For assessment of disease activity, we use only 3D flare or maybe an axial T2. And of course, the, I, we, I, I agree with that plan. However, it is uh, optional contrast and I have a discussion point here that I would say that maybe the decision could be individualized in the first one or two years. Some of us may be more comfortable in the first one year to do a repeat gadolinium after starting treatment because we may be more comfortable making sure and the patient may be more comfortable that there is no disease activity. So that is something which is optional and can be individualized. In the safety monitoring, we should again minimize uh, the uh, the use of MRI and keep it very focused and of course uh, the diffusion weighted MRI is recommended if you're suspecting a, a PML syndrome so I agree to that as far as the SWI is concerned it is not recommended but I would say that if your initial diagnostic workup includes a differential diagnosis of a non MS then use SWI in your initial diagnosis it has no role to play in the follow-up diagnosis so 3D flare reconstruction seems to be one single image that can help you across all your components, whether a diagnosis, assessment or safety monitoring. As far as the optic nerve is concerned, unfortunately, it is really not recommended anymore for diagnosis. I would say that I agree in MS, but when you're making an initial diagnosis of optic neuritis in an MR, which is not compatible, you will require an MRI of your optic nerves, especially for atypical optic neuritis, NMO, and where MRI is not typical, absolutely not required for follow-up. Don't waste patient's time and money and not required at all for safety monitoring. So this is not recommended. My last slide about MRI, very simple. In the beginning, it is recommended to do plain and contrast T2 weighted for diagnosis. We all would agree to that completely. Monitoring of disease activity, I would say there could be an individualized approach because 
in specific circumstances for example if your patient is deteriorating with more, mainly paraparesis or spasticity you may require to do a follow-up cord MRI to ascertain your diagnosis and to maybe even ascertain that the disease activity is just not limited to the MRI of the spine however the brain MRI gives you a way more picture for your effectiveness rather than the spinal cord for reasons more than one. We know it is difficult to really interpret small regions of the spinal cord. So I kind of agree to that. But I would say this could be individualized in specific circumstances. For safety monitoring, no role of MRI of the spinal cord. Please don't waste patients money and, and time and I would say energy. So this is clearly not recommended and that's what I completely agree with. So in the nutshell, we have very simple imaging protocols now being, by being suggested. Uh, we have simple imaging protocols for follow-up and we have simple imaging protocols for safety. However, you will individualize your decisions depending on what patient's category is and, and how will you, you know, ascertain patient safety. I leave that best to your judgment. That's what these recommendations are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Rohit for an enlightening lecture. I think this will uh, make uh, task of neurologist easier and uh, less time consuming. I think there might be a few questions uh, at can the I, end of the session. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Mohit, uh, one small thing that in the initial evaluation of patients of MS, we have been finding these micro bleeds in these patients. And uh, I mean, I'm quite surprised the last couple of uh, uh, patients who were evaluating that on susceptible weighted images, we found that these guys had classical micro bleeds. And there was obviously a doubt in my mind whether it was all the demyelinating lesion or it's or ischemic demyelination. But what do you think? Is, is it essential to do SWI? And what do you think is the long term follow up? Of having white matter micro bleeds in patients with MS. So, so two parts of a question. Um, as far as uh, the susceptibility weighted image is concerned, they have now brought in a new. I mean, it's not really new, but we used to call it the T two star image, and now there is a flare image. So they combine the flare and the T two star, and they call it flare star sign, which brings in the what was looked at the central vein sign. So the central vein sign has been found to be quite specific than the other diagnosis. But looking at its availability of this particular sequence, like the flare star, and its interpretation, this is not recommended in the current consensus guidelines at all because it's not practical. Now, SWI in the beginning, we include as well because it's a protocol and it is just another seven to eight five minutes of sequence because you are initially diagnosing a patient and saying that you have ms for example someone presenting with a hemispheric syndrome bringing in mri which is uncertain you would include swi but let me tell you sir one thing that micro bleeds as such in these patients who are young are not a characteristic feature of demyelinating disease if you're finding them you need to look for other differential diagnosis. Maybe something happening on the venular side, like a Bechet syndrome, or something actually happening on the angitis side, or something like a Kedasil, which is mimicking your MS. So you may be actually looking at a closer mimic rather than an MS diagnosis where you know microbleeds are almost uncertain. Unless you have diagnosed someone with an additional risk factor, like and uh, someone who's had a prolonged hypertension or is a diabetic. And you are actually finding occasionally is a, a associated small vessel disease or an extreme of age group like 50. The progress. So at this one point, they recently we looked up an article because I had a couple of these patients with micro breeds that 20% uh, of patients of multiple sclerosis have micro breeds. And when they were followed up, these patients had higher chances of stroke and cognitive decline. Uh, what I'm coming down to, sir, is that in, a, in an average or in a, in a continuum of MS care or in a large majority of MS patients or demyelinating disorders, this will be something which will be an additional finding with exception than the norm. I mean, with most of the data, uh, I, I, I would have probably MRIs of hundreds of patients 
but you know we had this we had initially uh, in between i can give you an example that we we had patients who presented more with ms features they had these micro bleeds but we had to revise the diagnosis to a vasculitis so i do not know the paper you are quoting or the data you are quoting people have talked about venous disease people have talked about this venous angiopathy people have that's why I brought in the central vein sign but that's not a sign of inflammation that's probably a sign of the perivenous demyelination that's why the central vein sign was brought so i have my concerns about in a large majority of a population based how many patients with ms truly would have micro bleeds as a diagnostic marker it's ex it's extremely rare but as you rightly said that there could be such patients where micro bleeds are present and as you are saying that these patients were followed up and they were found to have increased chances of stroke now that's kind of intuitive and probably logical that these people have some underlying vascular disease so that's what i'm saying we need to understand the associated risk factors and also the validity of the data that is being quoted that these people are at a high risk of having micro bleeds i don't think that's correct because most of these young people will not have micro bleeds on their mris in my experience i mean we can have opinion from the others as well yeah i would uh, second what rohit is saying because micro bleeds is not a common uh, is not commonly seen in ms and if you have micro bleeds you would think more of vasculitis or cadacel i absolutely agree maybe uh, i think uh, one right. thing one 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 additional factor which needs to be taken into consideration if you're seeing micro bleeds these patients are also harboring other you know uh, pathologies like vascular pathologies especially patient which once we forget that the patient who's gone into progression has a greater chance of having vascular risk factors and those can very well lead to micro bleeds Yeah, small vessel disease, or even I know amyloid may not come up in those patients, but that's one factor that you need to consider of vascular risk factors, which may lead on to uh, maybe micro bleeds. And in addition, there are newer, I think, uh, surrogates which are being looked into for progression. And I hope the micro bleeds are not being confused by mineral deposition, which happens in thalamus and thalamic. Uh, uh, deposition of iron which may actually just look like uh, no 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 micro bleed so, sorry dheeraj like sorry dheeraj it was there was no confusion there was certainly micro bleed in the white batter they stick to the criterion of micro bleed so there was no doubt about that that i had two three patients of ms with micro bleed it is also mentioned in the literature that normally micro bleeds can be seen in 12% of patients in these patients of ms it is 20% i can send that article to you and which very clearly mention of the association of micro bleed with stroke and cognitive decline in ms patients so there is no confusion in my mind about that now yes when i saw these micro bleeds i had the same thing in mind is it all ischemic demyelination or is it but the lesions on Uh, of the MS or sagittal, it was so classical of MS that I had no doubt that this patient had MS. And when we worked him up, the patient had oligochromal bands in the CSF also. So there was no doubt about the diagnosis. So this was an extra finding. So I what point I was trying to make is that we must keep it in mind that they could have associated micro bleeds. So association is possible, sir, but we need a large data set to prove that they really exist in this population. It's like saying that uh, we do no, have association. Exactly, I, th I think, sir, is uh, what what is is probably the observation is right, but to pathologically link it, we need to really uh, oh, yeah. do long term long term observations. Are they pathologically linked to MS? So moving ahead, uh, it is always a pleasure to introduce uh, my dear friend, Dr. Anshu. and uh, he is a senior consultant at uh, sir gangaram hospital and he has been uh, doing lot of clinical trials and work associated with uh, demyelinating disorder so please dr anshu uh, thank you dr sitam she <clears throat> i'll be just sharing my screen
okay so good afternoon everybody and uh, i think by an excellent talk by rohit on the newer crit uh, the newer criteria from magnums uh, let's move off to a newer topic the role of anti cd20 agents for ms spotlight on newer therapies so uh, there was initially it was thought that ms is basically a t cell driven disease but as an as our knowledge about ms has increased in recent time we have seen that a lot of anti b cell therapies really cd20 therapies are making their way in the treatment of ms and they're changing the way that we look and treat ms so let's see how do uh, b cells affect so eliminate eliminating circulating cd20 b cell leads to profound reduction in the clinical and mr activity in patients of rr ms The B cell li is likely to contribute to MS uh, pathogenesis in in several ways, including the enhancement of T cell activation and proliferation. They are also critical for capturing and presenting low concentration antigens such as myelin protein to the T cells, and they contribute to MS pathogenesis by direct or indirect production of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. So we need larger studies. Of course, it is well known now that the, that MS is not only a T cell disease but also a B cell disease. so we need more more data more evidence in that respect so the b cell has not only an uh, <clears throat> inflammatory activity but also a regulatory immune function the inflammatory functions are basically what uh, they do is as i said they present an antigen to the helper t cells they also cause an activation of the complement and they also produce pro inflammatory cytokines like tnf il6 and others and they're also important in activation of complement in addition they also have a regulatory function affecting the uh, activity of the macrophage the dendrite cells producing anti inflammatory cytokines and also have produced neurotrophic factors like bdnf and nutri so uh, the bone the b cells are produced in the bone marrow and they're activated in the secondary lymphoid organs like the spleen and the lymph nodes the cns reactive b cells as you can see on the right side of the diagram they cross the blood brain barrier and after crossing the blood brain barrier they can be found in the brain tissue in the meninges and in the csf so the b cells they tend to propagate within outside the cns so there is a bidirectional exchange between the cns and periphery of the b cells the pro inflammatory b cells they exit the chronically inflamed central nervous system carrying the cns antigen and they present this cns antigen to the t cell in the during cervical lymph nodes and this subsequently causes trafficking of activated t cell in the cns so according to this hypothesis it is the b cell which are possibly triggering off the uh, uh, the demyelination in ms by bringing on the t cells activity into the central nervous system and that is possibly the way that b cell treating b cell uh, can uh, bring down the activity of multiple sclerosis in the various phases of ms you look we can look at the effect of the b cells in the pre onset phase that before ms is seen to us that is in the radiological isolated syndrome or pre onset environmental risk factors influence b cell prior to the onset of disease of course all of us know that the in patients who have a clinically isolated syndrome b cells are increased in the csf and of course in patients who got an rr ms you can have the presence of polygonal band which is a b cell marker in a large number of patients of ms in the secondary progressive ms organized b cell structures are found in the meninges space and their presence is associated with a worse outcome and in patients who have primary progressive ms you have a csf cxcl13 which is a biomarker of b cell and has a direct correlation with the total csf leukocyte count so you can see in this chart that the b cells are involved in the pathogenesis of ms right pre onset to cis rr ms spms and ppms so as i said that that we now know that ms is is also a b cell driven disease and the initial part could be a b cell effect so because of this uh, these factors uh, which i have told you that the presence of a, of the expansion of b cells presence of oligoclon igg in the brain in cf patient of ms presence of uh, follicle like structures in the meninges of brains of patient with ms and b cells are required as antigen presenting cells producing promoting autoimmune t cell response in animal models the presence of plasma cells in large number in subacute and chronic ms plaques all of these factors really put forward the fact that the b cell are also significantly involved in the pathogenesis of ms 
So why do why do we target the CD20? What is the point? The CD20 or the cluster designation 20 is highly expressed on the B cell lineage and with no known ligand. And it has the second important point is that the, this CD20 and this CD20 is has a propensity to remain on the surface of the cell without internalization after interaction with the antibody and enables a potent B cell killing by the complement complement and by the ADCC. The apparent absence of free CD20 molecules also could otherwise compete with these monoclonal antibodies and has proven to be a potent target in the treatment of MS. So all of these factors make a CD20 a very good therapeutic target for treating MS patients. So it is highly expressed, it remains on the cell surface and enables a potent B cell killing. So this is about a B cell lineage. And I think everybody in the present scenario, everybody who's treating MS should know about this lineage. You have the initially the stem stem cells, then you have the pro B cell where the CD19 where is associated. And this CD19 is there throughout the, the uh, whole life cycle of a B cell. And then you have the PB cell where you can see the CD20 and the mature naive cell, the activated, the memory cells. Then you have the plasma blast the plasma cell, which could be long lasting or short lived. So the different cluster of differentiation or CD markers differentiate which part of B cells we are treating. So the CD, the, <clears throat> the CD20 protein on the surface of, of, of the uh, B cells, they has a number of antibody binding sites. So you can look on the right side of the diagram, the cell membrane and the uh, CD20 protein site. It's a 33-37 kilodaltin-2297 amino acid uh, type 3 membrane protein expressed on the surface of B cells. There is no natural ligand which bind to the CD20. And it is one of the first B cell differentiation antigens which are identified and enables optimal B cell response against T cell independent antigens. So this is how uh, different kind of B cell therapies that target the CD20. So we have the directly uh, the three monoclonal antibodies, which has an effect on the CD20 antigen on the B cell surface. And these are rituximab, ocrelizumab, and ofotumab. And of course, we have alemtuzumab, which, which has an effect on the CD52 uh, binding site. And recent evidence suggests that cladribine also behaves as a chemical CD19 depleter. So, uh, uh, these are the three uh, anti-CD20 therapies, uh, which include the shimeric monoclonal antibodies, which is rituximab, the humanized monoclonal antibodies, which is ocrelizumab, and the total human monoclonal antibodies, which is ofatumab. And all of these are anti-CD20 therapies. So what happens is that the uh, three major mechanisms of B cell depletion by these drugs are by the antibody coated cells bind to the FC receptor and macrophages, the complement dependent attack, and a direct apoptosis. So these are three mechanisms. When a monoclonal antibody binds to the CD, CD20 uh, antigen receptor site on the surface of the cell, there are three ways that these cells are killed. One is a direct cell death, then through a complement activation, and third is by uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So these are three ways in which the B cells are knocked out. So these are some of the... Uh, the various uh, monoclonal antibodies against CD20 that we are available. Then you have the murine, murine which is no longer available because of the uh, short half-life and very high risk of adverse effect. Then you have the shimeric monoclonal antibodies, the classical example of which is rituximab. Then you have humanized, which is more than 90% human and classical example is ocrelizumab. And then you have a fully human uh, monoclonal antibody, which is ofutumab. And then you have an uh, antibody, which is called a modified APC region, which is obliquituximab. Uh, rituximab, we all have been using in multiple indications. Of course, also unlicensed used in multiple sclerosis. Ocrelizumab, which is used for both relapsing remitting MS and for primary progressive MS. And ofotumab, which has recently been approved for the treatment of an MS and for various indications. And in addition, you have an anti-CD19 monoclonal antibodies which is uh, enablizumab, which has been licensed for use in uh, neuromyelitis optical disorder, that is NMOSD. 
So this act at a much earlier level than the CD20 levels. So a summary of different mechanisms of action. So you have, first of all, the rituximab, which is basically a mouse human shimmeric antibody that targets the CD20 antigen on the B cells. And it has an effect on the B cell by directly signaling apoptosis, complement activation, and, and by the ADCC mechanism. Then you have ocrozumab, which is humanized uh, monoclonal antibody. And it, it has an effect on uh, B cell lysis by ADCC and complement mediated lysis. The ofotumab, which is a fully human monoclonal antibody, it also has an effect through the CDC and ADCC. Whereas uh, utuximab, it has an effect very similar to that of rituximab. Now, coming to the clinical trials of the various B cell therapy in uh, relapsing remitting MS. So, you have rituximab, which is a shimmeric mouse human monoclonic uh, lytic antibody, which is directed at the CD20. And uh, two early phase clinical trials uh, showed that it's a, it is a promising drug and which has been used to produce a reduction of not only contrast enhancing lesions on brain MRI after rituximab treatment. The Hermes trial was the first double-blind placebo-controlled trial which produced almost 50% reduction in the annualized relapse rate at 48 weeks compared to placebo. And the contrast-enhancing lesion remained near zero at 48 weeks. So this is again a, a trial by Barr on rituximab and MS. And when they found that when rituximab was used, it markedly reduced reduce disease activity and re-emergence of disease activity is low even after the drug effect is reduced. So these are some of the clinical trials that have been done in rituximab, and there's no dearth of clinical material on rituximab. The last was by Linden. Uh, this is about 272 patients. It was a retrospective cohort study. And I think uh, uh, they, were, they found that uh, basically that, 30, that most of these patients had no change in EDSS. The another study by Salzar in which they had 822 patients of MS, 557 with RRMS, 190 with SPMS, and 67 with PPMS. The EDSs were remained unchanged in patients of RRMS. There was slight decrease in SPMS and PPMS and lower disease activity on rituximab. So there have been a number of trials on uh, with rituximab, both in RRMS, SPMS, and PPMS. And all of these studies have shown a very good finding, especially with uh, number of decreased uh, MR lesions, decreased due to volume lesions, number of GAD enhancing lesions. However, there was not much change as far as the EDSs is concerned but there also has been a decrease in the annualized relapse rate. And all of us have been using rituximab for the last few years in India uh, for the use of uh, relapsing remitting MS with, with good effect. Now, coming to rituximab or NTCD20 therapy checklist, before we start the therapy, these are some of the investigations that one looks and especially important about this is to look for an immunocompromised state. You have to do a lower immunoglobin level test. You have to do HIV, HPS, AG, HCV. Look at the CD19 and 20 level, a varicella, zoster serology, a CMV, PCR. And we definitely need to rule out tuberculosis in the form of Montu's extra chest and quantifer on board. And you have to look out for any active urinary infection from urinalysis and culture. Contraindication to CD20 therapy means hypersensitivity to any of the agents, presence of active TB, sepsis, an immunocompromised state, hepatitis, severe heart failure, or uncontrolled cardiac disease. Uh, a very important point in COVID times, is you should ensure that these patients are vaccinated before you take up them for any CD20 therapy, and they should have received the pneumococcal vaccine, influenza, and even varicella vaccination. Uh, coming to a typical rituximab uh, infusion protocol, in rituximab, you give two doses, one gram each, separated two weeks apart as a baseline, and pre-medication includes IV methyl, prednisone, 100 milligram, paracetamol, and tabavil. A repeat dosing is done after six months or after the CD19 cell count is more than 1%. So this is a typical uh, uh, protocol that we follow that you give 1000 milligram on day one and day 15, and then you follow it up uh, after six months or, or if, whenever the CD19 cell count is more than 1%. And before the next infusion, you should do a baseline full blood count and check the immunoglobulin levels because if there is a low immunoglobulin levels, you need to be careful. So especially with rituximab, you have a lot of infusion reactions. So you have to be careful, especially some patients can have anaphylaxis, mucocutaneous reactions, uh, sometimes adverse cardiac events. And of course, predisposes to infection, especially in COVID times, you have to be very careful and can bring about a secondary antibody deficiency like a decreased IgM and a decreased IgG level. 
So coming to the next molecule that map, it's a humanized anti-CD monoclonal antibody which binds to an overlapping epitope to that of rituximab and is used intravenously. It specifically depletes B cell and was approved by FDA in 2017 for the treatment of MS and those with active PPMS. And uh, unfortunately, the, this drug is, uh, is, not, is not available in India, but we have, of course, used it in few patients uh, using it through the gray route. And uh, the, the number of trial on Ocrozumab, uh, the most important trial uh, being the OPERA 1 and the OPERA 2 trials. And uh, these were the studies with uh, about uh, 821 and 835 patients of RRMS. And both these studies showed that there was significant reduction uh, in the annualized relapse rate uh, with Ocrozumab when it was compared with interferon beta 1. There was decrease in new or expanding P2 lesions and GAD enhancing lesions with Ocrozumab. They were mild to moderate uh, infusion associated adverse event. Monplan in 2017 had 732 patients of RRMS who were followed up 120 weeks and they were uh, randomized to a placebo controlled parallel group. And there was a reduction in disability at 12 and 24 weeks with uh, ocrelizumab. So coming to the long-term efficacy of, of ocrelizumab, ocrelizumab was studied in two st uh, studies, as I said, OPERA 1 and OPERA 2, where it was compared uh, with uh, interferon beta 1 and uh, during the double blind phase. And if you can look on the left side of the chart, in the year 1 and year 2, the, there was a significant reduction in annualized relapse rate and the difference p-value was statistically significant. And when the patient was switched over in the year 3 from the interferon group to the ocrelizumab group, the annualized relapse rate difference uh, became uh, statistically non-significant. And this study was followed up over a period of 6 years. So patient who switched to ocrelizumab from interferon beta 1 had a significant decrease in annualized relapse rate and the efficacy was maintained over a period of six years. So a typical ocrelizumab infusion uh, in the baseline, you have again two infusions which are given two weeks apart. And first, the first infusion is 300 mg, we given them in 250 ml of normal saline. The second infusion, again, 300 mg ocrelizumab given over 250 ml normal saline and it is given slowly over a period of 2.5 hours. The next infusion is given after a period of six months where you give a dose of 600 mg of ocrelizumab in a similar fashion to what it is given at the baseline. But here you have to give a 600 mg dose every six months. Now coming to the newest kit on the block that is ofotomab. Ofotomab is an anti-CD human monoclonal IgG1 antibody which binds strongly to a distinct membrane, membrane epitope to which is very different from rituximab and ocrelizumab. And it's the first type of a fully humanized molecular antibody. The advantage is that it can be administered subcutaneously by the patient or a caregiver by an auto-injector pen, which is administered every four weeks interval. So in a chronic disease, the patient can take the therapy at home. It doesn't need to visit an infusion center or come to the hospital. In August 2020, the FDA approved Ofotomab for a therapy for all forms of relapsing MS, including CIS, secondary progressive MS, and, <clears throat> and uh, MS and RNMS in the form of an auto-injector pen. So uh, even now in India, the Ofotomab is also approved even for the Indian patient, and it's going, soon going to be available. It's a fully human monoclonal antibody approved for the treatment of uh, uh, MS, and uh, it has a, uh, a binding site on the uh, CD20 uh, antigen at a site much, much different from uh, rituximab and ocrelizumab. So uh, Ofotomab binds to a motif that include residue from large and small extracellular loops where rituximab and ocrelizumab bind to a, a site which overlap with each other. So <clears throat> these are some of the... Uh, the data for, for Ofotomap. And in fact, I've been fortunate enough to take part in uh, the uh, the clinical trials on uh, Ofotomap. And this uh, study was the SLOPS 1 and 2, where they had 900 patients of RRMS, where they were group put in a double blind randomized controlled trial where Ofotomap was compared to trenitronamide, and it showed an improved relapse rate and in confirmed disease improvement compared to trenitronamide. There was a decreased number of T1 and T2 gadolinium enhancing lesions. The adverse variables were equally matched in both all the groups. So this was a study from SLOPS 1 and 2, and you can see that there was a 50% relative reduction uh, in the annualized relapse rate, and the p-value was, was significant. 
And again, uh, for the SL abscess 2, there was a reduction of 58.5% in the annualized relapse rate. Uh, as looking at the GAD enhancing lesion, again, there was a 97 to 93% reduction in both these studies. So, in, uh, so the recommended dose of opetumab is 20 milligram, which is administered by a subcutaneous injection. The initial dosing is done at week zero, day seven and day 14. And then it is given once every four weeks as a subcutaneous injection. It has been approved by DCGI in March 2021 and is going to be soon available in India. So, afutamide, to summarize, afutamide is the first fully human anti CD monoclonal antibody, which can be given subcutaneous every four weeks and is highly potent and binds to a, to a very distinct region of the CD21 B cell surface and has a superior B cell lysis via, via, via the complement and the apoptosis as compared to oclizumab. Now, coming to the key difference in the anti-CD20 therapy, uh, I think I've talked a lot about it that, uh, 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 that like where ofotumab is fully human, binds to a very different uh, site on the CD20 and uh, it is even given subcutaneous, uh, dose is about 20 mg and have chicken once in four weeks. Pre-medication is not usually required and uh, B cell recovery time is also faster. That the median time is 38 weeks. Whereas with rituximab, the B cell recovery time is 11 months. So in the COVID time, it makes much more sense to use ofotumab than either of these CD20 therapies because of the recovery time that takes. With ocrozumab, the recovery time is about 72 weeks with rituximab almost a year and 38 weeks with ofotumab. And uh, the infusion-related systemic effects, which are seen with rituximab or oclizumab, are not seen with uh, ofotumab because it has to be given subcutaneous. No pre-medication is usually required. Now, coming to the last molecule, that is oblutuximab, it's a shimeric monoclonal antibody which has been glycoengineered to remove the sugar molecule, resulting in enhanced lytic potency. And in a phase two trial, uh, patients were uh, given a placebo-controlled trials. There were no contrast enhancing lesions seen at week 24 and 48. However, the further studies are going and it is potential uh, as a shimeric monoclonal antibody, there's a potential development of anti-UT6 antibodies needs to be monitored. So summarize a take home message is that anti-CD20 antibody mediated B cell depleting therapy have now established themselves in the treatment of MS and they are per perceived as a promising alternative or a complement to the current panels of DMT which are available and the recorded data worldwide confirms that, that all these agents are useful clinically as well as imaging by for the treatment of RRMS. And all three antibodies have been used. And of course, we have our, we have our experience is largest with Rituximab, a very small experience with Oculizumab, and also a, a, a good experience with Ofotumab. And thank you for a very patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Anshu, for a very lucid and exhaustive account of a very important uh, topic. Um, uh, and any time for questions? Are there any questions? We can take one or two. Madam, there is no time. Can we go on to the next lecture? Yeah. So may I uh, invite Dr. Dheeraj Khurana? He is Professor of Neurology, uh, PGI Chandigarh. He is again an ardent worker on multiple sclerosis and will be uh, talking about uh, advanced treatment, including the stem cell therapy for multiple sclerosis. Uh, may I invite Dr. Dheeraj? Thank you. Thank you, Neera. And uh, so I'll just share my slides. Now, is it visible? Are my yes, slides yes. visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I thank DNA Con for inviting me to this very interesting session. Uh, so I've been asked to talk on the newer treatment options in MS, uh, uh, a part of which was just taken, uh, was, uh, was elaborated by Anshu. And uh, so I won't overlap those segments. So as far as uh, I can uh, divide the era of MS, uh, you all would be, of course, 
having a similar experience. I, I would really like to divide it in the pre-2020 and post-2020 because there's been a long gap in uh, up, uh, getting apprised of the new changes which have happened and we have not been able to practically utilize certain of the new changes which have happened. So if I were to look at the landscape, the landscape of MS as we knew since the last few years, we've had a very progressive development and evolution of new treatments and not just treatments, even ways to diagnose, ways to uh, evaluate, monitor, as well as uh, looking at different kinds of measures, uh, which have now evolved. We've been talking of NIDA, et cetera, et cetera. So last, if we remember our last time of 2020, a lot of drugs, which some of them have already approved and some which were under uh, evaluation. I would name, name some of these, which were referred to by Dr. Anshu in the last lecture too, ocrelizumab, ofatumumab, cladribine, which was already approved, and Ozani and Siponimod, which some of them, which I'll just refer to also. So let's jump two years from 2020 and see what has happened in the last two years, I would say. So the newer developments, I would divide my talk into the newer S1P modulators, which is the congener, the participant, the uh, variants of Fingolimod, which we all know has been there since quite some time, but there have been new modifications and new developments. The newer anti-CD20, so I won't be detailing it out. They were well detailed and well elaborated in the last lecture. The BTKI inhibitors, the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, a very interesting, I would say, mechanism and a promising invest, uh, mechanism in the treatment of MS, which is coming up. And I was also asked to uh, talk on the autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in MS, which also has been there uh, in, in practice as well as in approved for use for the last few years. So coming first to the S1P receptor modulators of what we remember about the uh, Swingosin 1-phosphate receptors, they belong to the G-protein receptor family. And these are traffickers, just like natalizumab, they, they modulate the, uh, the, the lymphocytes they do not deplete them like the anti-CD20 and they keep them uh, entrapped within the lymph nodes. So preventing their entry into the CNS. So that's one of the major mechanisms. And the way it happens is internalization of the S1P receptors in the T cells. And thereafter, the cells do not transmigrate. The T cells do not transmigrate out of the lymph nodes. And this leads on to a reduction of the lymphocytes and also believed to reduce the Uh, immune responses, which probably lead on to the MS progression and relapses. <laughs> so the first two one, uh, the sphingolimod and the first two agents of S1P, they were non-specific. So fingolimod, uh, when developed, although it had a very high efficacy rate, in fact, if we remember, fingolimod has been was was uh, utilized when patients were switched from high efficacy agents like natalizumab. Uh, for various reasons, if uh, they, they were weaned off to fingolimod because it almost had comparable uh, efficacy in terms of reduction of relapse rates. Now, it being non-selective, it had certain limiting side effects, mainly the, uh, the AV node blockage, and we had to keep strict, uh, at least for the first dose monitoring of the heart for the first few hours. Uh, so QT interval prolongation and mac macular edema being uh, some of the side effects which were observed with fingolimod. Siponimod have got approved later, close to March 19, and it got approval in SPMS following the EXPAND trial. Now, this is more selective than fingolimod, and it has higher affinity for S1P1, whereas, uh, like, if we see, look into the different subtypes of receptors, it is a... P3, which causes the slowed heart rate conduction, which only fingolimod has the property of modulating. The rest of them do not reach P3. And the newer ones, which I'm going to be referring to are ozonimod, which was uh, already uh, in, in present two years back, and ponesimod. Now, these are highly, highly specific for the R1 and R5 receptors. And 
due to their specificity, they have a better profile, clinical as well as side effect profile. So Xanimode was approved for CIS, RR and SP uh, back as, as early as March, 2020. And this has a high selectivity for P1 and P5 receptors. It has it is itself an active molecule and it has a longer T half of around 11 days. Uh, so if you look at the clinical trial, uh, program. The two major trials for Xanimode were Radiance and Sunbeam, and they were uh, carried out for a period of around 24 months and 13 months. And clearly, the annualized relapse rate reduction was significant for Xanimode in both these studies. And uh, along with that, this, the more important markers like imaging markers were also sorry, imaging markers also showed reduce, reduction in the lesion load as well as GAD enhancing load, which are important surrogates to decide the efficacy of a drug. Now, an important measure to look at the efficacy of a drug after the clinical trial is an open label extension, which actually gives uh, not a real, uh, real close to a real, it is the closest to the real world evidence, I would say, because Thereafter, patients are no longer blinded and one can look clearly at the effect of the drug uh, as, as you would in a real world uh, study. And the, this something recent which has come out is the open label extension data of the Ozanimod Daybreak study, which clearly shows that following the radiance and the sunbeam trials, people who received Ozanimod at the dose of 0.92 uh, had the persistence of reduced uh, relapse rates, and not only the efficacy, but also the uh, adverse event rates or the, the, the side effects were also evaluated in the open label extension. So if we see people who were uh, transferred uh, in the open label extension from the different arms, either interferon or from a low dose as anemo to high dose, they all had a significant relapse rate reduction. And in the pooled analysis, there was clearly a, uh, a significant relapse rate reduction. And there was not only a relapse rate reduction. In addition, there was also a uh, reduction in the uh, T2 lesions and GAD enhancing lesions. Along with that, what was more important is that uh, the adverse event, uh, which was expected, which are actually expected with S1P, mainly in terms of uh, the infections were not extremely high, although one case of PML was reported. So a single case of PML with Xanimode has been reported who was a patient receiving it for four years. Importantly, the cardiac side effects and the hepatic side effects are of major concern with the S1P uh, receptor modulators. And uh, what, what, what was seen is that patients uh, did have significant cardiac adverse events. However, none of them had heart blocks. They had uh, events like MI and ischemia and angina. However, they were not significantly high, although, although they were cardiac uh, adverse events which were reported. Similarly, the patients who had high hepatic abnormalities, cross-aminitis, a small percentage of patients did demonstrate. However, none of them led on to severe disease-induced liver injuries, and they were reversed. Most of them were found to reverse. The other S1P receptor, Ponesimod, which was tested in the Optimum Phase three study, has also shown significant reduction in annualized relapse rates. And this was a study versus teriflunomide, whereas Ozanimod was versus interferon beta-1A. And again, in the recent findings in the Phase three study, which have been uh, presented last year, uh, in the ECTRIMS, uh, it shows uh, efficacy of 20 milligram panacimod, whereas there is a clear cut reduction in the relapse rates, as well as more importantly, it again demonstrates safety in terms of uh, hepatic toxicity. Although there were a significant number of patients who showed a high increase in the trans aminases, which as is of major concern with most of these drugs, they kind of reversed if the patients continued 
either after interrupting it or even without interruption, if the patients continued panacemol, the uh, transaminitis recovered mostly by in a more than 80% cases by four weeks. So this kind of uh, does show a, a more, I would say, acceptable side effect profile of the new S1P agents. Uh, and what comes to light is that does these hepatic adverse events, they probably are a class effect. And, and even if we had more patients in panacea mode study who had higher uh, transaminitis, they seem to recover if they continue taking the treatment. So likely the class effect, same for all S1P, and maybe panacea mode seems to have a uh, more safer margin for, for uh, transaminitis. However, long-term studies and of course, real world data will give us more information on this. Now, another important fact about Panesimod, which is uh, different than the previous S1P or the non-specific uh, S1P receptor uh, modulators, specifically Fingolimod. If we look at the half-life, they have a shorter half-life and the reversal of the lymphocyte count is much faster with panacea mode. Something which we're really concerned because if there is an intercurrent infection or, or even a pregnancy, then uh, there is a strict contraindication to use fingolimod. mode. However, in case of panacea mode, we might be able to stop it. And re the reversal of the lymphocyte counts is much faster up to one week uh, as, uh, as, as has been found to be the time at which panacea mode reversal, uh, the lymphocyte reversal takes place after stopping, especially also in the current times when we are facing a pandemic where vaccinations have to be given. So things like panacea mode, stopping it and then using it for using that time period to give a vaccination is also very advantageous. Uh, the other major concern for, for all these high efficacy agents is a rebound of disease activity. Again, it's just like natalizumab and fingolimod to have a high risk. There's a realistic risk that they may have a rebound. With uh, punesimod, this may be less, although uh, it is not known, considering it's more favorable uh, pharmacokinetic profile of low T half and lymphocyte count, which comes back faster. So the rebound may be lower potentially with punesimod. So coming to now, I won't talk of greater detail in any, I, I think I'll skip these because uh, Anshu very, had a, gave an excellent account of the new anti-CD20. So I will not talk of the Opera 1-2 or of Atumumab or Axiplios. Uh, the, the only one thing which I just may show is about the IgG and IgM levels. Now, this is something which has recently come up. Uh, the biggest concern with the anti-CD20 is to be bothered about IgG levels because IgG and IgM, because they pose a person, pose a risk of having a higher infection rate in the people taking anti-CD20 drugs. So in the uh, sub-analysis of the uh, Exeplios, uh, of the Ofatumumab study, the IgG and IgG, in fact, the IgG remained pretty stable over a long period of time. All, however, Compared to that, the IgM levels significantly were found to be lower. But despite the change in IgM, there was no higher chance of patients getting a serious infection in ophthalmic treated patients, which I think is a, a very uh, uh, it's, it's a favorable report considering the safety of anti CD20 since these drugs are being very very commonly used in terms of uh, similar mechanism. And there's a good potential of this self-administered anti-CD20 to come up to know that the chances of the infection are not very high. And even if we look at this report, uh, patients who had uh, lower uh, IgM or IgG did not have a higher chance of having. In fact, if you look at patients in the IgM, which is a more significantly lowered agent, the chances of infection were higher with patients who had higher IgM. Uh, the other bigger concern was patients uh, with who on ofatumumab in the COVID-19. Again, the Altheos study has shown that the only uh, most of them have mild to moderate uh, 
COVID-19. This And why this concern? Because a lot of data which came up last year did tell us that uh, patients who are on anti-CD20 have a higher chance of hospitalization or severe COVID-19. And most of the data, I think, was referable to uh, rituximab, at least where we were concerned. And that was true for multiple registry data which came up. Uh, sorry. So I won't talk of oblituximab, which has been taken up by then actually the oblituximab data has now recently uh, come up where a significant reduction, relapse rate reduction against teriflumide has been shown. Uh, again, I think this has been taken up by issues. So I'll come straight away to the BTKI, the Bruton tyrosine, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, why uh, these would be one of the most highlighted, I would say, uh, novelties in, in the recent times, because this is truly a new mechanism. And not only a true, true mechanism, but also uh, it has the potential of acting within the vicinity or the milieu of the brain. Whereas if we see all the previous drugs, for example, all the immunomodulators, the immunomodulators like natalizumab, the traffickers, they are acting at the immune cells. So the immune cells, they either uh, they get depleted or they stay outside the brain. So the effects are indirect. So BTKI has the potential of reaching inside the brain and producing its effect. And how? By acting on the microglia. So microglia have an important function. They maintain tissue homeostasis and they are responsible for clearance of debris, all the, all the damaged or the degenerating cells or the degenerating tissues are cleared by the microglia. And uh, primarily it's a pro-inflammatory T and B cells as well as uh, cells of the CNS, which lead on to an environment where the reactive phenotype of microglia with inflammatory properties is, uh, is, is upregulated. And this upregulation of the microglia needs to be basically stopped. And this is where the Bruton tyrosine kinase comes in. So Bruton tyrosine kinase, what are they? This is a pathway which involves uh, the within the B cell is involved in the production of autoantibodies and the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it basically is responsible for B cell receptor mediated activation and proliferation of the B cells. So B cells as uh, was uh, very, very, uh, wonderfully described by Anshu, that they are very, they are playing a significant role now in our understanding of how MS pathophysiology is uh, involved with B cell activations. So, so BTKI inhibition can modulate this kind of an activation, and this can lead on to reduce reduction in the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, when, whenever an auto, uh, auto induction antigen activates a B cell. Now the potential that I was talking of is BDKI have the ability to access the CNS directly and they accumulate within the CNS and where they can potentially inhibit the microglia and the microglia can basically is, are responsible for the progression that is neurodegeneration. So there is a potential of BTK inhibitors to uh, prevent neurodegeneration and the progression, which is the biggest feared uh, outcome of MS. Uh, so like I mentioned, BDKI are phagocytic microglia, which are phagocytic cells and are a fundamental part of the innate immunity. And they also express the BTKI, so BTK, sorry. So if we target the microglia with the BTKI, with the small molecule BTKI, then we have a very strong tool in our hands which may prevent disease progression. Uh, so the rationale for uh, BDKI inhibition is the same thing which I just said, disruption of the BCR signaling, the B cell receptor signaling, which can reduce the activation of B cell and elaboration of cytokines and all the damaging substances. And also it, uh, abolishes and abrogates autoantibody production, recognition of antigen, and also pro-inflammatory FCR responses by myeloid cells. So BDKI inhibition has a very, uh, I would say, potential 
uh, salutary effects on the inflammatory cells as well as the microglia, the, the damaging microglia in the CNS. So direct effects as well as B cell effects. So they're still under clinical trial. And I'm sure quite a few of us are also involved in some of these clinical trials. Evrobrutinib, fenibrutinib, olala, orela brutinib, tolibrutinib. Now these have been variously developed for uh, relapsing, progressive, as well as the SPMS trials. And this one, I, uh, we are currently involved in the Gemini, Hercules, and Persis. The rest uh, also, I think, are also in the pipeline. So these are all clinical trials which are ongoing and uh, the expected results, I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of excitement generated if we get positive results out of the BDKI inhibitors. The expected completion of these trials are ranging from somewhere in 23 up to 20, 2028. Uh, so coming down to the agent, the autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which, was, uh, <clears throat> which I was asked to also cover, so I will just take uh, in, a, in a, a short summary. I would take for the. Could you please? Uh, yeah, we're done. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sir. we're done. So for. So you are muted. Sorry. So HSCT has been uh, quite promising, but it is not something simple as taking an injection and it involves a major hospitalization and risk of infection after the first few days or weeks of the HSCT. <clears throat> so it may be a treatment where people have had a breakthrough disease activity despite having high efficacy DMTs being given or they have contraindications to high efficacy DMTs. And usually the best candidates are less than 50 years of age. So it, should, it still is, and I don't think so, will ever be considered as a first line of the therapy even though having a potential of uh, a highly aggressive treatment for aggressive MS, this will not, and I think because of its inherent uh, problems associated and the uh, cumbersome procedure involved, where, uh, where we first have to mobilize these stem cells, leukophoresis and harvesting. And there are, thereafter, we have to destroy the bone marrow. There's ablation with different regimens, and then there's a transplantation. It's actually a full bone marrow transplantation procedure and patients have to be in a good state of health to really tolerate the procedure. Uh, the other thing which I would not now uh, just skip through is newer guidelines. Uh, the only thing which uh, has been um, reiterated by the ECTRIMS or EN guideline this year has to start early treatment, which has always been there, but we should not wait for high efficacy DMTs and, and we should start high efficacy DMT very early in the course of the disease. That is one of the major uh, learnings. And uh, uh, we, we need to look at other markers, mainly in the MRI and NIDA, beyond NIDA, there are individualized markers that we need to now identify. And MRI is one of the best ways to uh, evaluate the progress of the disease and monitor the disease responses. I would skip this, only go on straight to this last piece of hot news which came up this month and this has uh, really been uh, a big report which has come in and has created waves by making us understand that Epstein-Barr virus finally has some, we have evidence which states that Epstein-Barr virus may be responsible for the genesis of multiple sclerosis. This was a study conducted in the US on US military young adults uh, who, can, who <coughs> converted to MS. And this was validated by neurofilament light chain uh, activity. So the study is uh, published in Science this month, and uh, it, makes, it, would, it makes an interesting read. So this, the reason it is more uh, very interesting is that treatments related to Epstein-Barr virus, like vaccinations for Epstein-Barr virus, may actually be a solution or a future treatment for MS in the coming times. So in 2022, like I said, treat early, treat effectively. The new data with existing mechanisms like anti-CD20 and novel S1P receptor agents are highly encouraging. And uh, the newer agents, we are still awaiting their results. Uh, they are in the developing stage. And during COVID, continue the treatment and decisions have to be individualized as we've all seen with various studies and guidelines coming up in the last one or two years. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dheeraj, for 
an excellent overview and as usual you are quite uh, elaborate on the facts uh, just one question from the or from all of you because we are using immunosuppressants uh, in the treatment and they are quite powerful in they are very powerful immunosuppressants we do come across a situation where particularly ladies who are suffering from ms they have asymptomatic significant bacteriuria where they don't have any symptoms of uti they don't have any fever and the asymptomatic bacteriuria is there so how do you take a call and that can persist for a very very long time you keep repeating the test and it comes out to be showing more uh, more than 1 lakh colony count of a particular bacteria so how to go about it because sometimes the cd 1920s count is rising and for months together asymptomatic you give a trial of antibiotic and after a few days again there is uh, asymptomatic bacteria so any any suggestion from the uh, are you only specifically referring to anti cd 20 associated uh, therapy or in general with other anti cd 20 yeah but that wherever you are using a powerful immunosuppressant the same rule would apply uh, i would suggest if uh, because usually if we are treating with mod immunomodulators most of them are not immunosuppressants yeah. the only yeah. thing that we are really bothered about is uh, swingolimod uh, sorry s1p like fingolimod which is currently available which leads on to lymphopenia or even if we are having intercurrent lymphopenia with teriflunamide or other agents they get reversed very soon and we can really find out whether that is responsible for the infection the other major thing which you can actually do is get igg and igm levels if your igg igm levels are still low with anti cd 20 then we can link the two things if your igg igm is normal and despite having low cd19 then i think we need to look for other mechanisms for uh, the treatment and maybe there are some conservative ways of treating maybe my colleagues can uh, contribute further because many a times many a times it is the bladder involvement and the stasis which is responsible But, for the uh, uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria in no, that okay. situation how okay, to okay. deal with that situation i'm talking about that so that that is a separate issue that is a separate issue when we are dealing with the bladder issues overactive bladder or underactive bladder there are two things so oab is one of the things which is a major accompaniment of most ms patients and when we start having high post viral urine volumes that at that point of time uh, uh, a major aspect is not just treating them with the uh, uh, antibiotics but also take a neuro urologist opinion yeah. so maybe we could use detrusor activating drugs ethanol and other drugs. yes yeah. so the, but that needs to be worked up using a urodynamic study extensive urodynamic studies and uh, the best screening test of course is a uh, ultrasound with post viral urine so if that is a case we deal with that Dr. i think Divedi, that's got nothing to do with the treatment. wind up the discussion please next session dr divedi there are uh, idsa guidelines on asymptomatic bacteriuria and uti and could be referred to because there are clear cut definitions of both and uh, the definitions are clearly based on symptoms and signs and presence of bacteriuria versus an underlying process which is likely to initiate a uti i endorse your concern this is a very frequent problem but i think it will require some time and we are short of time for this discussion unfortunately thank you thank you all of you <coughs> thank you chair persons and uh, thank you orators for this enlightening talk on the multiple sclerosis for our next session i would like to invite dr avinash for the role of botox in the neurology good evening everyone uh, this is the last session uh, of today uh, but it is one of the uh, interesting session botox and neurology neurology uh, for that i invite uh, the chairperson uh, colonel dr pavan dhul and colonel dr amit sarin uh, dr pavan dhul is the professor and hod neurology at army hospital and rnr delhi can next slide thank you uh...
over to uh, chairperson thank you organizers for inviting us uh, to chair the session and uh, as we all know migraine uh, and uh, spasticity and various other indications are there which are uh, where botox has a major role to play in mitigating the uh, problems related to migraine and pain and spasticity dystonia those kind of problems that are troubling patients by uh, saying botulinum toxin has played a major role now we've got two sessions lined up for this uh, one uh, two talks lined up in this session one is by dr varma and uh, one by dr puneet he's going then they would be discussing on role of botulinum toxin in chronic migraine and post stroke spasticity i think the first talk uh, is by dr mukul varma mukul dr mukul varma does not need any further introduction he is a senior consultant uh, neurologist at indraprasth hospital hospital and he has great interest in headache movement disorders and multiple sclerosis so without wasting much time i would like to invite him to please deliver his talk uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, dr dhal uh, for that kind of introduction uh, i'm just going to start my Uh, screen uh, share screening uh, i'll just let me know if it uh, is it visible yes it is visible doctor yeah it is visible I don't know how it started with the last screen. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about management of chronic migraine uh, with an em with an emphasis on Botox. Can you hear me? And uh, I hope. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You are audible. Not being able to change my screen, the slides for some reason. Wait a sec. Why is this happening? Yeah. So, uh, uh, migraine, as you all know, is a uh, has a highly prevalent condition. It's more than one billion individuals are affected by migraine globally, and it is the third most prevalent illness in the world. Uh, it is the most prevalent neurological disorders in people less than 50 years of age and by far the most common complaint encountered by a neurologist in the, in its day to day practice and approximately 90% of people with migraine have a family history of migraine and one in six adults has migraine now uh, the burden of disease it's the second leading cause of years lost due to disability worldwide across all ages and sexes and it is the number one cause of uh, years lost due to disability in people aged 15 to 49 which is the most active section of the population and migraine can negatively impact virtually all important aspects of life including work um, people have uh, have to skip work on many days the school performance of children is not good they have problems uh, in family adjustments financial issues and a, a lot of uh, problems are occurring in all aspects of life so migraine uh, is defined in the migraine definition according to the icd3 defines as more than five attacks which have which last more than 4 uh, hours to 72 hours when untreated and they should have two out of the four uh, for, uh, criteria of one sided location pulsatile quality moderate to severe pain or aggravated by physical activity or making the patient uh, want to stop physical activity and uh, either nausea or vomiting or photophobia or phonophobia so it can be divided into two categories episodic migraine and chronic migraine based on the number of attacks that are happening in a month and icd3 defines chronic migraine as headache occurring on 15 or more days per month for more than 3 months and which 8 or more days in the month 
should have features of migraine uh, headache, which we'll come to later. The impact of migraine frequency has been recently studied and they have uh, kind of categorized migraine into three category, uh, four categories. The fourth one being chronic migraine, uh, which is 15 or more headaches uh, in a month, a monthly headache days. The, but you can have um, low frequency episodic migraine, zero to three, um, moderate 4 to 7, high frequency 8 to 14. And uh, studies have shown that the respondents with higher, high frequency episodic migraine and chronic migraine were remarkably similar on a broad range of variables. And this slide shows based on the MIDAS score that there is a lot of The disability increases as the headache frequency increases, as you can see by this graph. Chronic migraine has a greater impact and burden than episodic migraine, and it has more impact on lower, it has lower socioeconomic status people. Uh, it causes a lower socioeconomic status in people. Uh, there is a, a greater headache-related disability and headache impact. It has a worth headache related quality of life and higher rates of comorbidities are there. In, there is increased healthcare resource utilization by chronic migraine patients and higher direct and indirect costs to society and increased family burden. Chronic migraine has a high global preference, uh, prevalence. Uh, as you can see, almost 1.4 to 2.2% of the general population worldwide suffer from chronic migraine. However, it still remains underdiagnosed. Patients with chronic migraine consult physicians for headache and receive headache subtype diagnosis at low rates. Only 36% of patients who meet criteria for chronic migraine and consult a headache specialist receive a diagnosis of chronic migraine. And only 16% of patients who consult a non-headache specialist receive a diagnosis of chronic migraine. So there is a need for a more accurate diagnosis. So what do you want to look for in diagnosing chronic migraine? Uh, like the patient should have headache, either tension type like or migraine like on 15 or more days a month for three months. Migraine should be, the migraine character should be present on eight or more days per month. And this may be with or without med medication overuse, which we'll come to soon. Diagnosing chronic migraine, you have to establish the frequency, which is the cri uh, main criteria. So patients should experience 15 or more headache days per month. But many times patients don't really tell the number of headache because they only talk about the severe headaches and they don't talk about the less severe headaches. So it's better to ask how many days per week are you actually headache free? And uh, how many days per month do you have migraine? And then the patient should have at least eight headache days per month, which should be classified as migraine days. These are the criteria which you will need to make a diagnosis of chronic migraine. And this is going on for three months or more. So there are differential diagnoses of chronic migraine. If you think of primary headaches, you have chronic tension type headache, New daily persistent headache, hemicrania continua. The last two are not very off, not common, but the common is co chronic tension type headache. You can have patients which have medi uh, medication overuse headache piggybacking on these primary headache disorders. But you can have secondary headaches which can mimic chronic migraine, like infections of chronic meningitis, sinusitis, neurocystic sarcosis vascular diseases like cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, AVM, giant cell arthritis, cervicogenic, cervical spondylosis, post-traumatic chronic subdural hematoma, or CSF pressure-related headaches like idiopathic intracranial hypertension or intracranial hypotension. And you have to look for warning signs of secondary headache. If the patient has short history, these are the warning signs. Onset after the age of 50, uh, if the patient has systemic signs or systemic disease, if there is a change in headache pattern, if there is a postural headache or there is a neurological symptom or abnormal physical findings like papilledema in these patients, if the headache is associated with Valsalva maneuver or exertion, if there is a thunderclap headache and if there, the features of headache are atypical, for example, a 
prolonged migraine aura lasting more than 60 minutes. So chronic migraine and chronic tension type headaches are the commonest cause of chronic daily headache and together account for more than 90% of cases. So the difference between migraine character and tension type character are listed here. Migraine is unilateral, tension type is bilateral, migraine is pulsatile, whereas the tension type is pressure sensation, migraine is moderate or severe pain, that's mild or moderate, and uh, migraine is aggravated by or causing, uh, aggravated by routine physical activity, whereas no such aggravation in tension type, and there's nausea or vomiting, but that may not be present in tension type. So chronic migraine versus chronic tension type headache. Basically in chronic migraine, there is a previous history of distinct migraine attacks, but that such history is not present in chronic tension type headache. It retains migraine character significantly in chronic migraine, whereas that those features are insignificant in tension type. Family history is more common, which is less common in tension type. Menstrual aggravation is more common in migraine, but no such menstrual aggravation in tension type. There is relief during pregnancy in migraine, no relief in tension type. Uh, it is more disabling migraine and less, the tension type is less disabling and res, uh, migraine responds to anti-migraine therapy like triptans, whereas tension type may not respond to anti-migraine therapy like triptans. So what are our treatment options? Chronic migraine is highly untreated all over the world. Chronic migraine is uh, in, in US, only 12% of patients with migraine currently receive prophylactic treatment. And in the US, 49% of patients with migraine treat acute attacks of migraine with over-the-counter medications only. And in Italy, only 4.8% of migraine patients used a preventive me migraine medication. So that's very, very untreated. So what are the treatment considerations? You have to treat the chronic head pain that is happening, obviously. You also have to treat the comorbidity that is happening with these patients and we'll talk about that soon and of course you have to treat analgesic overuse because that can lead to chronicity what are the risk factors associated with progression of migraine or patients turning into chronic migraine some are non-modifiable like frequent headache from the beginning head trauma female female gender genetic predisposition is there and low socioeconomic status but many are modifiable like obesity acute medication overuse, caffeine overuse, alcohol, uh, smoking, stressful life events, sleep disorders, psychiatric and other comorbidities. And these all have to be looked into when you want to treat a patient of chronic migraine. Medication overuse headache is a headache occurring on 15 or more days per month, develops as a consequence of regular overuse of acute or symptomatic headache medication for more than three months. And for simple analgesics and for combination analgesics, the intake must be more than 15 days per month, equal to or more than 15 days per month. For triptans and ergotamine, it should be equal to or more than 10 days per month to cause medication overuse phenomena. It usually but not invariably resolves after the overuse is stopped. And in headache centers, uh, more than 50% of patients are suffering from this medication overuse phenomena. As this slide shows that medication overuse is a frequent problem, at least in the US, where uh, a lot of patients, 35% uh, um, to are using uh, in more than 20 days of paracetamol in a month, combination OTC medications more than 16 uh, days in a month in 63% of patients and so on and so forth. Even triptans, uh, about 22% are using more than four days and ergots uh, are not so commonly used. So what are the clinical features of medication overuse headache? It has a low, the patients have a low headache threshold. Uh, they get headache at the slightest thing. Psychological symptoms are present. There is analgesic dependence. And the co drugs commonly associated with medication overuse phenomena are analgesic plus caffeine combinations, opioids, ergotamine. And, but I have shown that even triptans can cause it if used more than 10 uh, days in a month. But the main thing that has, one has to remember is that prophylactic medications are ineffective when the excessive amounts of uh, medication overuse is going on. So it has to stop if you want your prophylactics to actually work. And the study has shown that uh, uh, among 216 patients with medication overuse who stayed medication-free for two months, 45% improved. 
although 48% had no chain and 7% had more headaches but 45% of patients actually improved by withdrawing of the acute medication that was going on so comorbidities there are several comor comorbidities associated with migraine sleep disorders psychiatric disorders gastrointestinal disorders neurological disorders <clears throat> cardiovascular disorders rheumatological disorders respiratory disorders obesity thyroid disease and you can see that the comorbidities are much more with increase in headache frequency as shown in this slide so the patients with chronic migraine have much more comorbidities and many of these comorbidities have a bidirectional uh, association which means that if you treat the comorbidity then the migraine will also reduce and if you treat the migraine then the comorbidity also reduce so let's come to migraine prevention so there are some non -pharma pharmacological strategies which all, we all have to use for our uh, patients and that is therapeutic education you have to tell them about the nature of the illness that he has migraine it's, and it has to be treated in a certain way bad effects of analgesic overuse have to be explained the patient should have a regular lifestyle he should sleep on time he should eat on time he should exercise uh, daily he should drink plenty of liquids stress management should occur there are bio bio behavioral options which have now a grade a evidence like relaxation training cognitive behavioral therapy bio feedback and mindfulness based therapies like meditation acceptance and commitment therapies also have found to be very useful few clinical trials have actually focused on preventive pharmacotherapy in chronic migraine as I, as you can see uh, anti convulsants there are small uh, double blind placebo con uh, controlled trials antidepressants again very small trials beta blockers calcium blockers and ace inhibitors don't have any evidence that they are effective in chronic migraine fda has approved medication for preventive treatment of chronic migraine Uh, there are only three. One is topiramate. Second is uh, on a botulinum toxin A, which is Botox, and anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So the pathophysiology of migraine is because of activation of trigeminal sensory afferent. There is central disinhibition in these patients. This is a genetic thing, and there is stimulation of meningeal sensory nerve terminals, which causes release of pain-enhancing neuropeptides such as CGRP. and then there is a uh, this causes activation of trigeminal nucleus caudalis and causes central sens sensitization and then uh, there is activation of cortical pain centers via the thalamus which causes the pain no, sorry garmi wala kar liye so there is a the, uh, peripheral and central sensitization happening in these patients so how does on a botulinum toxin a work in patients of migraine the exact mechanism not known but animal and human studies have shown that uh, botox inhibits the release of nociceptive mediators like cgrp glutamate substance p and blocking the release of these neurotransmitters inhibits the peripheral sensitization and in in turn inhibits the central sensitization <clears throat> this was um, demonstrated uh, categorically by preempt study which was the largest clinical program on chronic migraine sufferers done about 10 years ago 3, 1384 patients in several sites in north america and europe and this was uh, in two phases the double blind phase which was a 24 week phase uh, followed by the open label phase which went on for 56 till 56 weeks and there were one to one randomization of botox versus saline uh, in these patients and as you can see that the key inclusion exclusion criteria showed that these were patients of chronic migraine they did not have any headache prophylactic medication within 4 weeks prior to start of baseline but patients overusing acute medications were not excluded and they were excluded if they had depression and they did not have any previous exposure to any botulinum toxin serotype so they were randomized one is to one to botox or placebo and <clears throat> as you can see that the patient demographics uh, are very equal in the placebo and the botox phase they were all chronic migraine uh, patients the uh, this shows the same thing that they are uh, representative of the typical chronic migraine sufferers seen in the general population uh, and uh, the study concluded at the week 24 primary time point 
that there was a significant uh, statistically significant reduction as compared to placebo in the frequency of headache days frequency of migraine days frequency of moderate to severe headache days and total cumulative headache hours on headache days and patients with the uh, reduction uh, of uh, the headache impact uh, test uh, six score also which is a uh, test to uh, test the uh, impact of headache on uh, uh, impact of migraine on these patients so as you can see approximately 70% of patients achieved more than 50% reduction in headache days at 56 weeks which is a large number of patients the patients with uh, treatment with botox average eight fewer migraine days per month compared to baseline and um, the uh, botox reduced the cumulative headache hours on headache days also as you can see in this and as you can see that uh, there was more than 50 percent decrease from baseline in headache days and migraine days and the headache impact test which was done in these patients i won't go into the details of that but basically it showed that the mean total headache uh, uh, HIT six scores uh, improved with Botox as compared to placebo, and this went on in the open label phase as well. And the number of uh, times that the patients had to take uh, acute care medication also reduced significantly in the in the uh, Botox uh, uh, cohort. But one thing to uh, see here is that patients who had, who were on medication uh, overuse headache patients, the medication overuse subgroup also showed a significantly uh, better reduction in headache frequency as compared to uh, placebo. So it was successful in the medication overuse subgroup as well. And you can see that patients who uh, withdrew the, uh, their medication overuse uh, suddenly, as compared to the ones who were also on uh, Botox therapy, the Botox therapy patients did far better than the patients who had just withdrawal uh, alone. So this was found to be effective in medication overuse phenomena as well. So the adverse events were very few. Only 3.8% uh, people discontinued uh, due to adverse events as compared to 1.2 in placebo. The adverse events were very mild like neck pain, muscular weakness, headache. Some people and my, some people of course migraine was just because it's a study so you they had migraine. My, musculoskeletal stiffness, eyelid ptosis uh, in a few percent as compared to placebo but none of these were really causing any major side effects. So to conclude, uh, so uh, even the uh, neutralizing antibodies were not formed, uh, as you can see in these studies, very few neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies were formed in these patients. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the Botox is efficacious and well tolerated in chronic migraine, which is shown in the pre and clinical trials. It resulted in highly significant improvements versus placebo for multiple headache symptom measures in chronic migraine patients. And uh, uh, the treatment was done with 155 units to 195 units of Botox every 12 weeks. And uh, Botox uh, has been studied in more than 3000 episodic and chronic migraine patients with low rates of discontinuation and safety has been uh, well established. So quickly, the injection paradigm, the, it is established a successful treatment paradigm, the, this trial. And all, uh, although muscle groups injected uh, in this trial were the same as those injected in the preceding phase two trials, there were some revisions the, and paradigm includes a fixed site, fixed dose and a modified follow the pain treatment, there are two uh, paradigms. And uh, 155 units is uh, administered as a fix at 31 fixed site, fixed dose injections across seven specific head and neck muscle areas. And up to 40 units of additional products can be administered as, as an additional at additional eight sites uh, as uh, directed by the physician's discretion and using a modified follow the pain strategy. 
the each injection the volume was 1.1 uh, ml which was equal to 5 units uh, <clears throat> so the anaerobic injection sites follow distributions and areas innervated by the trigeminal sensory system as you can see here procerus and corrugator uh, frontalis temporalis occipitalis uh, cervical, uh, paraspinal, and uh, semi uh, and uh, trapezius uh, were injected as uh, 155 uh, total fixed dose sites, and you can get, uh, add 40 units more to some other sites as shown in this uh, um, chart. So uh, uh, the new kit on the block uh, is the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. These target the CGRP receptors and uh, uh, or the ligand. They have been approved by FDA in 2018 for migraine prophylaxis, including chronic migraine with or without medication over his headache. They have low side effect profile, but long-term side effects are still not uh, understood and uh, post-market data is uh, out, uh, gradually coming out. And there, there may be some injection side reactions. Uh, constipation is one frequent uh, problem and a new, new hypertension uh, developing in some patients or patients with uh, existing hypertension may get more hypertension. But the main problem is they are prohibitively expensive and they have been approved only when oral preventives or Botox fail. So I'd like to thank you for your um, patient uh, hearing and I'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Verma for an excellent presentation and giving us an overview of the migraine and finishing off well within time also. So now I think we can take on a couple of questions now before we call upon the next speaker. If there are any questions, I think Dr. Verma would be able to take it on well within time. Mukul. Just one question, yeah. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes Sanjeev. Yeah, the question is actually, uh, the sites where you inject Botox are the same sites where when they do an Omega procedure, they put all the stimulatory implants over there. And then after that, it is in the patient's hand when to use a stimulator and get rid of the migraine. Uh. So the idea is that will a person who responds to Botox they are the kind of patients who are likely to respond to this Omega procedure also. Uh, I'm not familiar with Omega procedure. All Can right. You... right. Let, let, no, this is, this is just an implant where they implant uh, stimulatory vibrating uh, or small electrical stimuli under the frontalis muscle, the temporalis muscle and the suboccipital muscle. It's a very specific procedure done only by uh, and a patented procedure done at a very, you know, one of the centers in US. I had a chance to see it. So therefore I'm mentioning it. And uh, yeah, they I'm... found that they probably uh, also checked with Botox before using these implants. So I guess uh, the, uh, the met methodology would be the same that the, because of the stimulation, it must be uh, kind of blocking the, the central and peripheral sensitization that is happening in these patients. And uh, because uh, many times when we um, do a uh, occipital nerve block, that has a similar effect uh, in uh, yeah, these, absolutely. So, mm. so I guess uh, it's a similar thing, and of course, similar uh, thing. Yeah. Cluster, yeah, for cluster headache also, mm. there is uh, various occipital nerve stimulators and all. So, yeah. but uh, this talk was mainly focused on uh, the role of Botox. And yeah, uh, absolutely. my you job know, was that to, is, that point is well to taken. prevent uh, to present that. But yes, uh, I'm sure this uh, uh, stimulator that you're saying might be a very effective method. However, um, it might be a little cumbersome, and I guess it will it will be used in people who already failed these other uh, therapies. No, I just brought it up because I saw it several years ago, and since then I've not heard about it. 
or seen it since in india at so, least uh, so i thought maybe you'd be aware it may not have caught on i'm i'm sure it's not really taken uh, taken much popularity because i am not yeah. aware of it and i'm sure other neurologists are here who might be able to comment on that so i think studies are still lacking regarding the omega procedure because i've i've just heard in the i've just read in the literature and the in the clinical practice we are still having very minimal knowledge about that so studies are still lacking regarding the comparative uses of omega procedure versus other other uh, uh, like botox which is very commonly used or oral therapies so i think uh, that may be one of the reason so uh, hey, I, thanks my comment here was that botox uh, i've used it in a in a large number of patients and i've got uh, Uh, good results about 50% of patients respond extremely well to it and uh, the it is a little on the expensive side however the effect may last for several months therefore the per month if uh, cost really is not so much as compared to the newer um, uh, cgrp receptor uh, antagonist uh, which is a little more expensive uh so i think there is a role uh, for botox even today um but if the cost of the cgrp receptor antagonist goes down then there may be some major uh, shift in the usage yes i think uh, mukul you are right actually botox is more cost cost effective than the cgrp antagonist because uh, roughly a cost 20000 rupees a month Yeah, when the whole session of Botox would cost not more than I think forty thousand or something. No, in fact, uh, Botox uh, Allergan gives a discount, and you can uh, the whole session may cost even about just about twenty five thousand. Which sorry, would... sir, sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay. We are running short of time. Uh, uh, yeah, so continuing with our talk, I think we'll call upon the next speaker, Doctor Puneet Agarwal, who will be talking about uh, another yeah. aspect of Botox. Uh, it is post stroke spasticity so i would request dr puneet agarwal to take on with this presentation yeah uh, so uh, first i like to give can i just share my slides so first i like to give thanks to the organizers dr ranjan and his team for giving opportunity to talk on botulinum toxin in post stroke spasticity and upper limbs which i am using it for uh i think for last 7 to 8 years so uh, thanks dr mukul for a very nice lecture on botulinum toxin on botox so making that talk easy so this is a whole uh, history of botox in relation to the spasticity if you see here that in 2010 there was a first fda approval for the botulinum to botox for the upper limb spasticity in adults and at the same time the migraine this approval was also came at the time and then later on there was a approval for the upper spasticity for the lower limb in 2016 and then extended approval for the pediatric patient in the upper limb spasticity in to june 2019 and then there is a botox recently approved in october 2019 for the pediatric patient with the lower limb spasticity so now it's a whole uh, spectrum that in, in adults as well as a pediatric population is also uh is eligible for the required for the post stroke spasticity management with the botox injection so coming to basic for, first of the basic that is spasticity is a motor disorder all of you know about that is a is a very old definition given by lens in 1980 and later on uh, revised by u spaz in 2005 that is spasticity arises from the upper motor neuron related sensory motor discontrol due to any lesion in the human path upper motor neuron pathway presenting as intermittent or sustained involuntary activation of muscles the most frequent causes of spasticity are uh, is a stroke which i am maybe basically making a, a be, be, i'm concentrating in this talk is a leading cause of adult disability traumatic brain injury multiple sclerosis spinal cord injury and degenerative disorders of the upper motor neuron now regarding the stroke 80 to 85 all of you know that is a 80 to 85 percent of stroke are ischemic and rest are hemorrhagic and both ischemic and hemorrhagic can lead to spasticity the location depends on the location of damage to the upper motor neuron which decides the severity of the disability as well as the onset of disability now around 50 to 70 percent of stroke patients have long term upper limb functional limitation 
Common problems are muscle weakness, sparsity, poor coordination, and sensory disturbances. And these impairment alone or in combination can result in range of functional impairment of that patient. The quality of life is, is, most, is mostly affected in all these cases of a stroke with the sparsity due to stiffness and the muscle spasms can occur, painful contacture of the muscle and the joints occur. Many times it is very painful for the patient having a sparsity, increased sparsity after a stroke or, or a demyotin disorder or injury, head injury, craniospinal injuries, the bladder and bowel disturbances, pressure ulcers, disturbed sexual functions, osteoporosis, self-esteem issue, and psychological disorders. The basic pathophysiology behind the sparsity is that there is a denervation of the high, there is a denervation and the damage to the upper motor neuron, which is leading to the disinhibition of the alpha motor neuron leading to hypersensitivity of the alpha motor neuron. And there's also collateral sprouting occurs resulting in further loss of inhibitory input. There's also a hyper excitability of gamma motor neurons, which increases the sensitivity of neuromuscular spindle and net resulted in imbalance between the excitatory and inhibitory impulses resulting in, in disinhibition of alpha motor neuron and which results to the sparsity. Now, symptoms, common symptoms are stiffness of the limb, involuntary rapid muscle contractions, the muscle, the deformity at the joints, the weakness and poor dexterity, poor personal hygiene, muscle spasms, and the pain in the muscles. If you see the sign in those, in these cases, there will be an exerted deep tendon reflexes due to the, again, upper mountain neuron lesions. The clonus will be maybe there, the positive Babinski sign muscle weakness, simultaneous contraction of the antagonistic muscles sometimes can occur, mass movements and associated movements. Now, pain is a very important part of uh, sparsity and many patients come to the OPD because of the deformity as well as due to pain in that limb and they are not able to, sometimes it is so severe, they are not able to do the, uh, the physiotherapy or occupational therapy. So it is basically, uh, does this pain occur because of the increased muscle tone? permanent tension of the spastic muscles, muscular origins and the insertion causing inflammation of the tendons and periosteum, muscle edema, muscle spasm and clonus, and spine skin lesions and soft tissue damage. So we should remember this very important slide that not all sparsity is bad. So while treating these cases, we should not uh, aim that we have to treat the, the sparsity in total. And so because some kind, some uh, the the some sparsity is required for assistance and transfer for partial con functional motor control, maintenance of muscle control, maintenance of muscle bulk, tone effect on mobility, tone effect on ADL, improved circulation and prevention of deviant thrombosis. Sparsity requires a comprehensive treatment. Each patient is unique, and in visualized treatment should be taken. The goal of treatment is basically to maximize the function in the patient of the limbs and minimize the secondary complication like contacture, pain, as well as the maintaining the personal hygiene. So these are the common goals while treating these cases. And we have to augment the active function in those in the, all these cases, the passive function should be done. The pain has to be reduced, reducing the contacture and involuntary movement also is one of the function which we want to achieve or goal we want to achieve while treating is paucity. So these are the common patterns of sparsity. You can see here the patients coming with the proximal sparsity in the upper limb. So I'm emphasizing mainly on the upper limb sparsity in this talk. So shoulder adduction or internal rotation, which can occur due to the pectoris major, lattice one dorsi, and teres major muscles. And these, especially the pectoris major and lattice one dorsi are the culprit. And this should be injected in these cases to maintain the proper positioning of the patient easing of the, so that the dressing patient can do certain ADLs like dressing, the axillary hygiene can be maintained. And it also maintain keeping the balance while walking or standing. The elbow flexion deformity, the usual culprit muscles are the biceps, brachialis, and brachioradialis. Commonest are the biceps and brachioradialis. Brachialis is sometime involved and requiring injection in the, in few cases only. The pronation of the forearm, the commonest muscle is, is a pronator teres, which is very strong muscles, although its size is small, but is a very strong muscles requiring high doses of Botox. The pronator quadratus and other pronation, which is not done, uh, 
sometimes this pronation is associated with the flexion of the wrist or flexor distum superficial muscle involvement also in in majority of the cases the flex wrist and the clenched hand that is usually involves the flexor carpi ulnaris flexor Sorry, Puneet, carpi can hand. you please uh, make it short because we got the gbm coming up if you don't right mind. sir right thanks sir. thanks puri so it can occur because of flexor carpi ulnaris flexor distum superficial muscles and thumb and palm deformity is usually because of the opponents uh, usually because of the abductor pollicis the flexor pollicis brevis muscle so spastic management requires uh, the either the medical treatment the also the botul botox injection in many cases the rehabilitation the orthopedic devices and neurosurgical procedures so i'll not go in detail about that i'll basically emphasize on the botox injections this is a review of literature there is a very good study a meta analysis of randomized all control trials have been published recently in biomedical research international by lee chun shan and they have it has said that trials have reported that treating upper limb spasticity due to stroke with botulinum toxin injection results in measurable reduction in resistance to passive movement there is a magnitude of initial change in the muscle tone as well as a modified as well score by more than 1 point which is clinically significant and the effect last for 3 to 4 months the basic benefits were the with after botox injection is improved global patient ratings itemized passive functions improvement in the active upper limb functions botox injection the shoulder pain is also gets better so this is a landmark study which is which led to the later on approval of botox for the upper limb spasticity by bresher et al published in nagm in 2002 which has basically done in patients who are more than 21 year of age more than having a six months or more than of a stroke with a focal spasticity involving the wrist and the finger flexion deformity and with the ashworth score ranging from 2 to 4 and the patient was given only single set of botox injection of 200 to 240 unit it has been seen that key results were there is a greater reduction in the wrist and the finger flexion and deformity in these cases as compared to placebo and there was no significant adverse effect was noted so you can see here in the graph very well that botox group has a very significant improvement in the wrist and the finger flexion deformity and there's no the 62% patient they reported improvement in their principal functional goal at 6 weeks and there was no major side effect adverse effect was noted There's another study by Cousin et al. published in Clinical Rehab in 2010 about the low dose botulinum toxin injection in patients who are having arm spasticity after the stroke. And the patients who are basically having a stroke within uh, six weeks, they were included in this trial, and they were given botulinum toxin botox in the biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis, FDS, and FDP. And it has been seen that patients has significant improvement in the upper limb spasticity even with the low dose. Uh, as compared to the placebo and that there was no serious adverse effect was noted there is another study by the garden et al published in neurology in 2004 to assess the long term efficacy and safety of botox in patient completing 12 weeks to 12 weeks placebo control study and it is carried up to the 54 weeks it's a long term study it has shown that the significant sustained improvement was observed in the disability assessment score and hfs score in patients who were treated with the botox as compared to placebo and the effect was sustained for even up to one year so this was a very important study to show the sustainability of the botox injection i show you some common patterns for clinical practice like patient having adducted adduction in the shoulder the commonest muscle is the pectoris major and latissimus medial dorsi side and these are the sites of sites of injection in the pectoris major this is basically a lower fibers which are basically sternocostal fibers and these are the basically a clavicular fibers and a manubrio manubrial fibers of the pectoris major muscle where the injection can be given in patients of pectoris major for latissimus medial dorsi we have to give the injection in the posterior axillary fold after asking the patient to to do the adduction against the resistance and the importance is that the, the most commonly required treatment of shoulder adduction and internal rotation most commonly required treatment but external rotation very rarely involved flexion at elbow the commonest muscles are biceps and brachioradialis which are very easy to see and you can give the injection here in these cases you can see biceps brachial biceps and the brachioradialis rarely the brachialis can be involved in severe cases and these are the site of injection 
Apart from the biceps brachii, the flexor sparsity of the cubital joint also involves many times the brachioradialis, as well as uh, you can see here in this patient, the brachioradialis muscle involvement with the flexion deformity at the elbow and the injection can be given. In rare cases, the extensor muscles are involved. You can see here this photograph showing an extension deformity of the at the elbow, at the wrist, and there's a flexion deformity at the hand also involving the flexor distal superficialis and FDP muscles. And there's an ulnar deviation also. So also in these patients in, in involving the flexor carpi and nailis. So these are the muscles like triceps, extensor distorum, and the flexor group of muscles of forearm should be injected in these cases. Now, coming to the pronation, supination of the forearm, like pronation and supination, the usually pronation is most commonly seen in these cases of after post-stroke sparsity. And in the pronation, the commonest muscle is pronator teres, which is a very powerful muscle, as I told you. And commonly, the flexor carpa radialis is also involved in many cases. And we should inject both of these muscles. The biceps is usually involved in the supination deformity, which we have to remember. It's a more strong supinator than the supinator muscle in isolation. So the, this is a pronator teres muscle requiring around 50 units of muscle injection to be given just two finger breadth between the, at the elbow, below the elbow joint medially. This is a site where the pronator teres injection can be given. Now with the pronator teres, as I told you, sometimes the FCR is also involved in requiring the injection to be given in associations which, to give a better response. Supinator, if it involved, it requires a 50 unit of injection on the back. You have to go through from the back between the extensor distorum and the extensor carpi radialis muscle deep inside for the EMG. In the pronation, if it is there with the forearm flexion is sub involved, then you have to give injection the flexor carpi radialis and anal nares. These are the sides. Now, thumb and palm deformity. These are just three, four slides more remaining. So, thumb and palm deformity, the flexor pollicis longus, adductor pollicis, and flexor pollicis brevis are commonly involved muscles. Flexor pollicis longus is a deep seated muscles in the distal forearm. In distal one third, you have to give, you can give the EMG, you can use the EMG guided. Uh, in these muscles and for the flexor pollicis brevis and also the adductor pollicis you can give through the EMG guidance. In the finger flexion, you can give the FDS and FDP muscles. If the distal flexion, if the distal interphalangeal joint is involved, you have to give the FDP. So these are the common sites for the FDP, this for the FDS. You can give very easily these muscles either through the EMG or by the palpating method also. Patient having intrinsic plus hand syndrome, Usually common in the known as thalamic hand, lumbricus and troshia, the commonly involved muscles, so you can give the injection. So the patient came to me with the thumb and palm deformity. And you can see here that after giving injection, the patient hand is fully open. And after three months, she's able to hold a glass of water for herself, which was a attainment, goal of attainment for us at that time. This is a patient having a flexion deformity again in the Finger flexion deformity, FDS and FDP are common, is involved in this patient. And after the giving botulinum toxin, Botox injection, you can see here that this is, this is a state after four months and the patient is very well, okay now, I even driving also, patient is able to drive right now after six months of aggressive rehabilitation as well as a Botox injection therapy. This is another patient having a finger flexion deformity after the injury and you can see here, there is a flag, there is an adduction of the shoulder also in this patient. And this patient is able to walk after two months uh, with a better, with a better positioning of the hand and the leg. So this patient was given injection in the leg also. The chart in certain cases require a low doses, like patients who are having a low weight, patient requiring having a Ashworth's, low Ashworth's score or result of the previous treatment is leading weakness, you may require a lower doses than the earlier one. So now key points of my talk are like meaningful assessment of the treatment outcome depends on the careful definition of the objectives. We should have a goal attainment score, what you want to achieve. And accordingly, we should give the injection in the muscles. We should not inject all the muscles having sparsity. We should, we want to achieve a goal that and functionally improve the functionality of the patient and improving the hygiene. Some patient may feel therapeutic response usually after three days to five days after injection and peak response come after one to four weeks. Reassessment at three months, three to six weeks is recommended and decision to retreat is not a foregone conclusion and should be revised 
with each treatment strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puneet. And uh, I thank Dr. Mukul also for an excellent talk. I think the one question, we can still take it or else we'll all join the GDM. There are no questions, please. Chairpersons, can we uh, wind up the session, please? Yes, sir, we can wind up. Sir. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, holding the Thank session you. and excellent Thank talks. So we move on to JVM. Sir. Thank you very much, yeah. Colonel Dhul, Colonel Amit Sarin, Bukul and uh, Unit for the wonderful talks. Now, the next part of the, is the general body meeting, and I will hand over the further proceedings to the President and the Secretary of the DNA to please carry on the further proceedings. For the general body meeting, um, we'll have to log in through the link that's been mailed to all the DNA members by the DNA office. So uh, as far as DNA Con is concerned, we had a really uh, eventful day and we'll be back again 8 a.m. tomorrow morning with the same links for all the halls. And we hope to see you all again at 8 a.m. in the morning to start the program tomorrow. Thank you. So, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan. And, uh, Thank you, Dr. Will, Thank, you, Dr. Now, Thank you. Now you can do uh, take your link for the general body meeting. Thank you very much and good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks Thank you, sir.